All right, welcome everyone to the annual INL Moose Workshop. We're excited to be back here and and teaching everyone about Moose again this year. So we haven't had a live in-person audience for quite a while, so this is this is exciting for us, at least in person at INL. So a couple of logistics. So we've we have a very large registration crowd this time. I don't know if we'll get all of our numbers, but we had over around 250 people register for this workshop. Something like 45 of them in person. It looks like we have like close to 30 here. That's to be expected. We'll probably have a few filtering in late and other people that just weren't able to come, but it's exciting to see a full classroom in here. Um, we do have a Slack discussions board available that's in your Teams chat. And if you want to ask questions, that's the place to do it. However, Let's keep the questions in um, Slack to things that are relevant to the presentation. So if you have general support questions on getting Moose started and you know how do you how do you get up and running, or maybe just kind of like questions about your physics that we're not talking about in the workshop, please use our Moose discussions board, which you'll find on the GitHub link. Okay, that's a better place to support those general questions. Moose workshop specific questions, please use Slack. Okay. We'll try to keep everybody up to date. We do have several Moose team members in here that will be monitoring both so we can best support you. Any other announcements, logistics? OK, a couple other things I can think of. So again, for those of you in person, the lobby in here and this auditorium is in general access mode today. So you do not need to wear your INL badge. That's why you have these name tags. So um, if you're wearing an INL badge, you, you can take it off. You don't need it. You can get in and out of this door freely. There are restrooms right here behind the auditorium if you need to use those. Um, so you should have access to everything you need to do to get going today. I think many of you are probably aware there's free goodies out there this morning to get you kind of amped for the presentations today. And we will also be providing lunch with a working um, with a presentation, special guest presentation. Okay. With that, I think we'll go ahead and go. Any questions from anybody? Hopefully you're posting those online. There's a lot of people here to talk to, so. But if anybody here wants to talk, I can repeat your questions. Okay, let's get going. So hopefully you're here to, you know, let's see we go. Okay, so before we start talking about Moose, we have a couple of brief slides here about the laboratory, if, if you haven't learned about it. Um, probably several people online who may not be super familiar, but um, this laboratory under the current name, Idaho National Laboratory, was established in 2005, okay? And it's the lead nuclear energy research and development laboratory for the Department of Energy, okay? Um, and we do lots of things here. We try to build reactors, we try to model, model and simulate them, um, but our goal is to try to advance energy for the nation. It is one of our, Idaho's largest employers, um, over 5,500 employees, and we do take several hundred interns. It says 478 here. I wouldn't be surprised if that number goes up quite a bit more before um, the summer's out. I think these are recent numbers. And the INL budget is about $1.6 billion. A little bit of history. So INL has been here for quite a while since um, the mid 40s and 50s when we and we started actually building reactors out here on the desert. So a little bit about the geography. You guys are in Idaho Falls. If you travel about a half hour um, by car out to the west, very barren, dry desert out there. And it's the site where a lot of the country's first reactors were built. Over 52 nuclear reactors were designed and constructed there. Many of them were kind of like smaller experiments where we like, you know, built a small reactor and then turned it on and let it blow up and that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, there was a lot of like pioneering work done out there on the desert, you know, more than 50 years ago. A um, couple of historic sites too. It's also the home of the experimental breeder reactor, EBR-1, where the first electricity was supplied to a city, okay, Arco, in the middle of the night, but it's not worry too much about that. It's also the site of the advanced test reactor, which was built in the late 60s and is still in operation today. Um, the world's most powerful test reactor um, 
couple of other statistics here that I won't repeat. And then we also recently, a couple of years ago, restarted our transient reactor test facility. So this is for um, pulsing materials, pulsing fuels, like with really high bursts and seeing what happens to them. So it's a really good reactor for testing transient scenarios. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about modern happenings. So we established the National Reactor Innovation Center within the last few years. And this, this center is designed to try to aid industry in building the next generation of reactors. As part of that Reactor Innovation Center, we have two prototype test beds out there, which we are reusing existing facilities, old facilities, to start building some of these new reactors. So we have the dome, facility out there, which, out there is, which is EBR2 EBR facility. facility. Oh, from, oh, again, again, 40, 50, 40, 50 years, years ago when ago, we built EBR2, EBR2. that facility has been sitting out there unused since then. Um, so we are going to be able to build um, certain reactor concepts in there up to 10 megawatts thermal in the next few years. And we also have the Lotus Lab, which is the former zipper cell. Okay, so we'll start seeing some new reactor concepts going out there in this decade, which is very exciting. The other really important piece about NRIC, which is more relevant to us, is it also is the funding or the sponsor for our virtual test bed. And I want to talk about that a little bit. There's a link down here on the bottom that you can click on if you visit these slides. By the way, these slides are available to you if you go to Moose Framework. .inl.gov and navigate to the getting started and the tutorials, you'll find these slides so you can follow along. And I do recommend you do that. This virtual test bed is a place where we publish um, models that you can run if you have the right codes. Okay, so they are open source, well documented models that you can run. Now, the caveat is that you, the codes required to run those models, are not open source, okay? So you can see all of the input files, you can read all about what those models do, but if you want to run them, you do have to apply for a license from our laboratory, okay? But it is possible. Okay, so that's a little bit about the lab. Let's get into the introduction to Moose. Okay, so what is Moose? This picture sums it up, okay? So you. We have a framework here that you can take partial differential equations, hopefully drop them into this uh, framework and have it solved for you. Okay. Now, clearly there's a lot more detail there and that's why you're here for two and a half more days to learn about that. Okay. So Moose was started 15 years ago. This is our 15th year and we open sourced it in 2014. So not quite a decade ago. The whole point of Moose was to designed to solve computational engineering problems and reduce the expense and time spent by scientists and engineers who may not have a computational background for actually building this software and using it effectively. I think we're doing fairly well on that front. We have a lot of engineers in here that are using the software to do um, very cutting edge research. It's easy to extend and maintain it does work well on laptops all the way up to supercomputers. If you didn't get a chance to, you might during one of the breaks, our supercomputer is right across the lobby there. You can see it right through the windows on the other side of this lobby. Um, and it is an object oriented extensible system, which we'll go over and over for the next two and a half days about all of these pluggable systems. A little bit more, we have over 200 people that have contributed to Moose. I think some of the other things that are kind of interesting is just how many, num the number of commits, okay? So Moose is a very rapid, uh, rapidly developed application or a framework, and people are contributing to it on a daily basis. So we do merge um, several, what we call pull requests every single day. And over the last 15 years, that's added up to tens of thousands of commits. So it's quite, quite large. We do have a web page that gets quite a bit of activity. We have discussion boards, which I'm encouraging you all to go out to and see. And then we are getting a lot of publications and inviting the community to publish as well. So uh, I, at least a few months ago, the and I think it's probably still the case, our 
our recent moose papers are considered the most cited paper on software x so a general publication for that particular journal and we have hundreds of publications using moose not by us but by the community by you guys one more statistic here that might seem a little out of place but again is really important is that we do have a very large testing system that we call civet it sits over in the data center and its job is to run tests for Moose and all of the applications. And that thing stays busy. We run over 30 million tests every single week for people that are just proposing changes to the codes. OK, so it gets a lot of views. Here's another view of Moose. OK, what does it look like? What's the architecture of Moose? Well, like a lot of other computer science projects or computational projects, it's got this layered look to it. So at the very bottom, you have solver interfaces. So we typically use um, the PETSI package that was originally developed at Argonne National Laboratory as our workhorse solver package. What happened there? Stop sharing. Well, now we're not. Sorry, technical difficulties. Hopefully we don't have too many of those. Yes, question. Yes, so question is, where are the slides? If you go to mooseframework.inl.gov, there's a getting started link there on the top, and then you'll find tutorials and example. And if you scroll down, you'll find, I think it says Moose tutorial, is that correct? Yes, training Moose training workshop. Okay. So let me see if I can reshare my slides here. Okay, hey, sorry about that. Okay, so we were talking about the solver interface and Petsy. Okay, so Petsy is our nonlinear and linear solvers that come out of Argonne. They're massively parallel, been developed for getting close to 30 years now, maybe, maybe over 30 years. Above that, we have the LibMesh Finite Element Library, which was developed at University of Texas in Austin more than 20 years ago now. So LibMesh is starting to get there in age. And LibMesh is a is a is a general purpose object oriented library for building finite element codes. Okay, it handles lots of things for us. It handles the mesh, handles the I/O, handles all of the parallelism, the discrete the discrete splitting of all of that. The equation systems it's it's got lots and lots of utilities for actually building what libmesh lacks though is it is if you download libmesh you do have to kind of construct your application it, it doesn't come by default with like input file parsers or or an easy interface if you look at libmesh it's it's a toolkit for building your own simulators so that's where moose comes in so we developed moose to kind of Close the gap on that last on that last um, you know that last piece. So it's kind of everything you need. So you can download Moose. Moose is an application that you can just run. You can pass it an input file and it will run it for you. Okay, and handle and handle everything. Okay. Now on top of Moose, it doesn't end there. The community has built a set of physics modules, which we'll talk a little bit about in here, and you'll get to see over the over the course of the next few days for building up more and more complex domain-specific physics. So if you want to run a heat conduction problem, you'll find a physics module for doing that. If you want to run a neutronic simulation, you'll find several modules that you can use to aid you in building a neutronic simulation. Okay, contact, we'll go over those here briefly in a moment. Okay, general capabilities. Okay, it's finite element soup. So if you've used a finite element code before, hopefully Moose can do it. Kind of a bold claim, but I think we're pretty close. Okay, it does it does do multi-dimension. It does do automatic differentiation. I've already mentioned that it's massively parallel. We can even do threads. Um, most of the code that we write is agnostic of dimension. That's a big one. So it doesn't matter if you write a kernel or or you know, you, you code up a term from a partial differential equation. You can supply a 1D mesh, 2D mesh, or a 3D mesh, and you don't have to change your code for that. Okay, it works on all of them. 
And we do run on all the operating systems. Although I will say that our Windows support is a little bit less first class. Okay, so we can only run under the Windows subsystem for Linux. And Docker, yes, and Docker, thank you. Okay, so let's dive in, let's look at Moose. So what is Moose? Moose is, is a framework, and as a framework, it's got a set of interfaces into it, well-defined interfaces that users and developers alike can extend to solve their physics. So this is an illustration of several of those pluggable systems, which we'll talk about uh, over and over again, and some of the things that you can plug in. So like, for instance, you'll see up here on the top, like materials, okay? So we do have what we call a material class. And by the way, I, people are gonna use some of these C++ terms. They kind of mix in a little bit of jargon. You'll hear the term object and class, okay? I wanna start telling you a little bit about that if you're less familiar. So a class is basically a chunk of code which defines an interface and data that you can use in a program, okay? It's the basis of object-oriented programming. So when you hear somebody say, oh, you have a materials class, just think of like an object-oriented building block, okay? Now, object is sometimes used interchangeably with class, but an object is like one particular, what we call an instance of it, okay? So like, um, if we use like, if we use like um, class to talk about like cookie cutters, then the objects themselves would be the cookies. Okay, so you take a template, that's the class, and then you cut out things and you make objects or instances of them. Okay, so I wanna get that jargon out of the way right now, because you're gonna hear it quite a bit. So what does Moose look like? So let's take, um, let's go from our actual math problem. So at the top here, we have the strong form of, does anybody know what that equation is? Anybody want a heat conduction? Okay, so that's the strong form of our heat conduction equation, partial differential equation. We can do some manipulation to it, some algebraic manipulation, and then do some um, a couple of transform operators for putting it into what's called a weak form, and we'll go into that a little bit later today. And then once we have it into a weak form, it's ready to code up inside of our framework. So on this slide, you can see that we have one of these terms circled. If you look below it, it says kernel. So what we what we do with our equations is we take each one of the operators in them, and then we code them up into what we call a kernel class. There's some of that jargon already, okay? So right there we have, you know, k times the gradient of t, um, and then the divergence of the the gradient of some test function there, okay? And that translates to actual code, and you can see that one-to-one -one correspondent. There's our K, there's our gradient right there, and then we have our test function over here. And then the indexing should make sense as well. So our test function here, it says test function I. Again, we'll go over some of this when we get into discretization here in the next few hours. So you can see our gradient test function I. And then you see this QP thing that hangs out here on every one of these terms. Okay, and that's our numerical integration part, it stands for quadrature point. So we take all of this, put it into a class, patient, and then run it on our laptop, or if we need to, and we have a lot of degrees of freedom on a really big mesh, we can kick it over and run it on our supercomputer, and this line of code does not change. Hey, we're building code for nuclear reactors in here, okay? So a lot of the people in this building are building codes for fuels, for neutronics, for uh, chemistry of advanced reactors, for cooling systems and reactors, and so forth. We have to have, we have to be really careful about that, okay? This code, even if it's not being used for like the actual operation of the reactors, even the analysis itself, we have to take care on. Okay, so that we understand the bounds of our answers and how well we're doing. Part of doing that is making sure that we have a very good software quality process. Okay, in fact, we as the INL are contractually obligated to follow a software quality practice. So what does that mean? 
It means that everybody that's actually responsible for developing and more importantly, merging in that code into our production environment goes through, I would say rigorous training, but we've actually made it so that it's fairly accessible training, okay? Some of us have to do the rigorous part to make it accessible to everybody else. But at the end of the day, we have to follow a very strict set of steps to get code written and then merged in. And those, the, the, there's a process behind that. There's several defined touch points behind that. And then in, very importantly, what we have to keep it all straight is that continuous integration system I alluded to a little bit earlier, Civit. Those 30 million tests that we run a week, those are critical to our software quality program. Boost does meet the requirements for software quality assurance, nuclear quality assurance. So anybody that's in here that's from, you know, from a vendor company that wants to use Moose, you're in luck. You can pick Moose up. You can do a relatively lightweight, what they call commercial grade dedication and use it for a nuclear purpose. So that's pretty cool. What does the development process look like? This is a smaller slide, okay? Really messy. The takeaway on this slide is that as developers, if you're actually building the code, you really are only responsible for one, two, or maybe three things, depending on where you sit in our organization. If you're an intern that's only here for the summer, your job might be just to create code, create tests, and create documentations, and then actually push that up in what we call a pull request and hand it off to somebody else. Then one of our qualified change control members will actually be responsible for reviewing that, and making sure that it follows our guidelines, okay? Making sure that the tests are passing, that things are adequately covered, the documentation is, is reasonably complete and so forth. And then those people get to click merge. Now under the hood, we run lots and lots of combination of testing to make sure that you're not breaking the application that you're merging into or the framework. You're not breaking things that are downstream from you that are building off from you um, and so forth. Okay, so there's lots and lots of these combinations that, that take place in the development process. And all that's under the hood. You don't have to worry about it. We've built a fairly large community that you can find at this URL on GitHub. And again, this is the right place to go for general support questions. So if you're um, an intern or a university researcher and you have questions about your application, ranging everything from I can't get it to compile to I'm running into a problem when I hit 10,000 processors on Sawtooth, this is the place to go. Okay. We have a very active developer community that can look at your questions and provide the responses that you need to keep moving forward. We have a couple of fun graphs here just to kind of visualize the project in a few different ways. So like here's the here's the the total contributions as a function of time going all the way back to 2008. And you can see that we've had this you know, greater than linear growth kind of continuing for a very long time now, which is kind of exciting. Um, so this is in terms of the sheer number of contributions, but also the contributors. So clearly the project is still in a very strong growth state. This is not a fun graph. This looks like garbage to me. I don't know what this is. Now this is like number of lines touched essentially. So as we add lines and as we change lines, it creates this plot. I, I'd love to see somebody tell me what this really means here, but. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. OK, the software license, OK? I think all of you hopefully know at this point that Moose is an open source project. We have the LGPL 2.1 license which is very permissible in terms of open source licenses. You can do pretty much whatever you want with Moose with this license. You can go and form your own company and use Moose to profit. Okay, you can use it as part of other projects. 
which is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to enable industry to build reactors. We're not doing that by keeping a bunch of proprietary expensive code around. Okay, so it's a very open, very permissive license that you can use here. All right. Um, so what is the differentiating factor of Moose? Okay, why why would you use Moose? Why wouldn't you use ANSYS or COMSOL or some of the other open source alternatives like MFEM and Phoenix? Multiphysics, okay? This is what we believe kind of makes us stand out. So how do you do this, okay? We have a framework which is which enables scientists and engineers to build codes and do that effectively. But how do you get them to write multiphysics code? Scientists might be pretty good at creating code for the thing that they went to school for, okay? So somebody comes out of one of these nuclear universities and they are a fluids expert. They can come in here and they can write fluids codes really well. But do they know how to tie that in with a reactor neutronics code or a fuels performance code? They may not have the experience with either one of those other domains, and they probably really don't have all of the computer science exper experience to do all of the complex linking and memory management, and process management to get everything to tie together. It's a tough problem. Okay, so what have we have been doing? We've been trying to figure out ways to enable the scientists and engineers to solve those problems so they don't have to do that. Okay, modularity is one of the keys. We It allows us to decouple our codes and we'll see that. There'll be specific examples here as we get into the problem where you can actually like break it up into separate pieces and solve simpler problems that kind of look like the problem you're trying to solve. That's really important, okay? Because if you try to code everything up and, and build a really complex simulation and hit go, and it doesn't converge on your first try, you may not even know where to start. So this is important that we can actually decouple things. Okay, Modularity is also a normal um, computer science concept where you can create codes that you can build on one another. Most of our machines that we're using here, our Macs and our Windows boxes are built on modular concepts whether it's the toolkits that you use to build web pages or GUIs or a complex multi-physics application. Okay, so there's lots of really challenging pieces to building a finite element code that I guess I would hope that a, ho a whole bunch of really smart people that are really good at that are focusing on that part, which leaves you know, the, the main specific physics to you guys. Okay, so there's some examples here. So we're trying to make it easier. Again, just trying to make it easier. So we have a set of pluggable systems. We're talking about that. We've talked about that quite a bit. Those systems break apart responsibility. Each one is digestible, and we're going to cover them one by one in this course so you get an idea of how they're laid out. In general, we try not to have the systems overlap or communicate too much with one another, except for where needed. Okay. Everything flows through a set of well find interfaces or APIs. You might hear that jargon. API just stands for Application Program Interface. It's the well-designed interface. You want, you want um, an object that you code up to do a specific job. It better be well laid out in the application programmer's interface, what that job is. So then we build all those up, and then our objects can be mixed and matched because we're following those APIs. You can just change out uh, a really simple object for one that's really, really complicated, and it should just work if we've done our job correctly. And that's, again, that's an object-oriented design principle. It's not something that we invented. We're just using software, normal software practices to build up this framework. So what are our, what are our pluggable systems? We talked about this already earlier. We have a lot of them. I think we have more than 30 of them. So here are well, this is more than 30 right here on this slide. And we are going to go over several of these. I'm not going to play this movie. I don't think it's super useful. Here are the list of physics modules that we have. I already mentioned earlier that you could you know, download heat conduction to solve this, and you don't have to actually code up the heat conduction kernels or you know, the thermal conductivity properties or anything. You can just turn it on and go. 
So we have several physics modules, including these ones that are labeled as numerics. So again, tools for building other tools. And this slide, although a little bit small and hard to read, kind of encompasses that last thing I just said. So Moose is modular. The systems inside of it are modular, but even the applications that you build themselves are modular. And this is where we get that multi-physics. Okay, so this graph here, these are, for the most part, well, the bottom three rows there, the, the pinks and oranges and whatever other colors those are, those are the applications that we have built on top of Moose. When I say we, I mean the community again. Some of them are built here. Some of them are built completely outside of this laboratory. Okay, and there's all these lines going to other boxes. Each one of these boxes has a well-defined interface, which means I can exchange it or plug it in or combine it with other boxes, and it all just works. So towards the end of this tutorial, we will show you an example of creating a what we call a multi-app simulation multiple application simulation where we'll take several of these boxes we'll code them up so that they link to each other in the input file not in c plus plus and then we can hit go and then you know box a will run for a little bit it'll exchange information with box b box b will run for a little bit and it's say exchange information back with box a and then if we want to add complexity to that we can we can build an entire tree or hierarchy of boxes talking to one another to build up an entire reactor simulator, for instance. That is, in my opinion, a killer feature. And that's what differentiates Moose from a lot of other packages, Okay, that multi-physics concept. Um, I think I'm doing really well on time. So I want to hit home one other feature that just went into the framework in the last couple of weeks. So for years, we've had this ability to, um, so if people want to compile applications together, the one the one downside to this picture was that up until recently, you had to have access to all of these applications in a source format. So Sockeye, Sam, Griffin, Isopod, if you wanted to link those four applications together, you had to obtain all four of them in source format you had to code them up into a make file. If you don't know what a make file is, consider yourself lucky. Okay. And then compile the whole thing into a big monolithic application that you could run. Okay. Now it does work, but you had to do that first step. So in, in the last couple of weeks, we have a new feature that has just gone in where if you have access to these things, you can compile them completely separate and completely unaware of each other. Theoretically, you can even take the binaries built on Sawtooth, although we're not quite there yet. A whole bunch of binaries that you have access to, put them in your input file and run a multi-app simulation without doing that compilation step first. So that's pretty exciting. Looking forward to seeing what people can do now. So now you don't have to have all of the applications a priori to build up a complex simulation. OK, um, I think this is oh, no, I'll go I'll go through this last piece. So in just a moment, I'm going to hand off um, to Logan Harbor, who's going to walk you through some of the first steps of this tutorial. And we're actually going to get you guys in there to using visual um, visual studio code if you want to follow along. If you don't want to use visual studio code and you just want to watch, that's fine as well. But we need a problem to solve, OK? So what we what we have here is let's start down here on the bottom. There's a reference down here that that we actually took this problem from. So you can go and pull this um, from the literature if you want to actually see the paper here. But it's it's a relatively simple problem where we're just solving for um, temperatures and pressures in a in a Darcy flow like simulation. So the problem set up is we have two different pressure vessels at two different temperatures. And then there's a pipe connecting them with a porous media inside. Okay, here it says we have um, a filter of close packed steel spheres. But just think of it as like a sponge or something else. It's just porous media. 
Okay. And there's physical properties here. The pipe is so long and you know, so many inches in diameter, so many meters in diameter, excuse me. Governing equations for that. Conservation of mass, conservations of energy. Okay. Pretty straightforward. A lot of fluid problems work that way. And then we have this Darcy law here that we can apply because we're using a porous media as that filter. So um, you can see here that we have this conservation of mass. A couple of things about this equation is we have this um, divergence operator on U here, and then the conservation, we have divergence operator on U here. Um, and we'll we'll get into to how the mapping of these variable names. I mean, you have full control over this stuff. You can name things what you want in your input files, even if it doesn't match up with like some other developer that came before you's convention. We'll talk a little bit about that. Anyway, this is a the way that we set this up is we we build it up over the next few days. We solve pieces of this and we solve like very simplified versions of this. And then we start adding more and more complexity and we start adding, um, you know, dependence on our variables that we're solving for in some of these coefficients so that we get nonlinear terms. And you'll see that piece by piece over the next few days. We can do a little bit of um, manipulation on this, make some assumptions. Gravity doesn't exist, divergence free conditions, do some algebraic manipulations and get down to just these two equations. So these are the ones that we're actually solving here, okay? And then there's several material properties that we'll solve for as well. And the cool thing about these is, again, we'll start off really simple. We'll start off with just constants for a lot of these properties. What's the density? Oh, it's, it's two. I'm a computer scientist, I like one. Density is one. What's the heat capacity? One. What's the thermal conductivity? One. Okay, so we'll start off easy. And then we'll actually start to make these, then we can, we'll get a physicist involved or whatever, and we'll say, oh, let's actually use a real constant there. And then we'll do more interesting things like, oh, this is actually a temperature dependent property. Let's actually feed temperature back into this and calculate this on the fly so that it varies over the whole domain. And maybe even gives us some nonlinear feedback, and then we can try solving our problem again and again and get closer and closer to the real solution here. So, yeah, we're going to be dealing a lot with density, heat capacity, and thermal conductivity as part of this as well. And then these are numbers. I don't know why they're not one, but a bunch of material properties. Okay, because I'm a because I'm a computer scientist. So, okay, so overview, um, tutorial steps, and I. I've tried to lay this out on the agenda as best I can. We will be off the agenda. It always happens, but and I, I know that matters more for the remote people, but we will try to stick to it as much as possible. But if we get a little bit off, should be within like a half an hour or an hour of what it says on the agenda. But yeah, we'll start off really simple. We'll just start off saying, hey, a lot of this stuff exists in Moose. Let's talk about how you set up the mesh or and um, how you use existing objects and just run something that looks kind of like this problem okay it's not going to be exact because the building blocks aren't aren't entirely available in moose for this and then we'll say okay now we need to actually start adding some complexity so we'll start building up our kernels which are just our operators from our partial differential equations and then we'll say oh yeah but now we need material properties because people don't like one for some reason and then we'll get into, oh, we need to do extra calculations. And we'll talk about our extra calculation system, our auxiliary calculation system, okay? And so on and so forth until you have all of the tools you need to solve the problem exactly like it's specified in the paper. Okay, um, I will hand this off to Logan at this point. So thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoy your next two and a half days here. Well, I don't know if you need to clap. But...
Does that all look correct? Okay, good morning, everyone. Hopefully I can be heard. Cody, there you go. Yeah. Morning, everyone. My name is Logan Harbor. Um, I'm on the Moose team. I've been here for about three or four years. Um, my background is radiation transport and nuclear engineering. I've kind of picked up a little bit more of a computational scientist role in uh, recent history. I do a lot of development on the framework itself, which is what supports all of this work, um, and also work in integration. So getting new code into Moose and supporting people doing that. So I have the privilege of kind of giving you guys a general introduction to the very first step, which is how we actually use Moose. We're not going to talk about numerics yet. We're not going to talk about specific physics. We just kind of want to give you a good idea of what the bread and butter of Moose is, which one of the wonderful things about it is that if you understand how Moose input syntax works, um, you're already set up to work with other Moose applications. Um, and that's kind of one of the wonderful things about multi-physics with Moose is that um, once you understand the framework and its basic objects, you can translate that really well with some documentation into writing input files for other applications. So with that, what I'm going to start with is we're going to focus in our little model on this little um, pipe in the bottom of it. Um, we're, we're not going to model the actual physics yet as to what's going on in there. But we're going to model a very simple diffusion problem with some prescribed conditions on the side. And of course, diffusion is just um, the, the transport of something from high concentration to low concentration. In general, diffusion is kind of like the go to first problem for anyone to do with any kind of finite element framework because um, it's very simple to understand and it's intuitive for most people. So with that. Oh yeah, by the way, really quickly, um, this slide format is awesome. It's an open source format. If you hit escape, you can quickly jump through all the slides and figure out where we are. Um, there's an identifier in the corner that kind of gives you numbering, which is nice as well. But um, I would recommend if you want to kind of jump through, it's easy to figure out, you know, jump ahead, look around as, as you see fit. So with that, like I said, we're going to focus on that little pipe. Um, we're going to use the diffusion operator. We're going to prescribe a value of 4,000 on the left of the pipe and zero on the right of the pipe. Um, and this is going to be in 2D, but we're going to use 2D RZ such that it's symmetric about, um, you know, as you'd expect for RZ. Now we described the weak form here, um, really not important for what I'm doing, just for those of you that are knowledgeable in finite element, this is what we're starting with. So with that, I'm actually going to send a link to the VS Code setup on the website. Actually, if someone wants to do that for me, I'd appreciate it. But in general, you go to documentation, zoom in some too, documentation, infrastructure, and go to VS Code. Hopefully some of you have had this set up so far, but I can show you a really easy way to do it regardless. So with that, I'm going to go into my Moose directory. So for those of you that have cloned Moose, um, the wonderful thing about VS Code is that once you install the command line extension, you can open up a directory in VS Code very easily. So the simple VS Code setup for the Moose extension is to just go to the extensions tab on the side and type in Moose language. And you will see a time. An extension like this, which is the extension that we link to. So what this enables is a ton of awesome autocomplete functionality for you for writing Moose input files. Um, it'll show you what parameters for objects are required, what parameters are optional, what their default values are, and all of that. So in, in general, we recommend some sort of autocomplete extension um, because when you're getting started with Moose, it helps you a lot uh, without having to search all the time for documentation. So the first thing that we're going to do that's very important is that we have a pipe. Now, we're running a finite element code, so we need finite elements. We need a geometry. We need a, a discrete mesh by which to define that. So that is what I'm going to start with. So all of the steps that we're working on in this tutorial, if you go into the tutorials directory and Darcy Thermomec in the repository, I'll make that even bigger, actually. I know it is the dark too much or is it OK? They're fine. Okay. Okay. About as big as I can get. So in the tutorials Darcy Thermomec directory, 
um, there are a ton of steps here. And these are applications with inputs and tests for every single step that we're going to go through in the tutorial. So we're going to go in tutorials, Darcy Thermomec, step 01 diffusion because we are on step one. Now, the actual input file, if you want to cheat and look ahead, I, will, I would recommend that you not do it because it's nice to kind of work through it. Um, if you go into problems, there is a step one.i input file. Now, I'm going to kind of develop this in chunks instead so we can work through it together because I find that to be a little bit easier as to like how a general thought process would be for developing one of these input files. So with that, I'm going to make a step one logan.i file and open it up in VS Code. So now, VS Code, which I'm going to hopefully make huge, we have a simple input file. Now, before you do any of this, if you want autocomplete to work, you need to have a Moose executable by which to fill the autocomplete syntax. So basically what that means in Moose terminology is you need to compile your application. So like I said, all of these steps are individual applications in Moose, which means that when you go into the. When you go into the directory, you just need to run make. If you have the environment working and everything. Now, of course, if you have any issues with making um, Anything there's a I think a setup help channel in Slack. Please forward all questions like compiling and test failing and all of that in there. Now, after we have built something in Moose, the first thing that we typically do, which we also recommend doing in the getting started page, is running the test for that object or that that application. And that's typically done by a, an executable that we call run underscore tests in the root of the application. I haven't actually ran this, so I'm hoping that it works for the sake of presentations. Hey, look, OK. Oh, yeah, actually, it may go away. How about that? Oh. Oh, yeah, the bar. Yeah, here, I'll just do this for now. Right, so we ran the tests. We had two different tests that passed. OK, so that means my application is working. That's a good start. Um, in general, Testing in Moose is a lot more than just two tests. It's like thousands upon thousands upon thousands. But this is just our introduction as to how you can see if something's working as we would hope that it works as we have prescribed it to work. And when we made the application, we also generated a Darcy Thermomec executable, which is what is used to run everything. Hopefully this works. Yep. So with that, I will return back to VS Code and we can work on actually developing an input. So like I said, the first thing that we need to do is create a finite element mesh. So Moose uses what we call the hierarchical input text format. And with that, everything is defined in a block and then is and after that nested blocks are considered to be a part of the block before them. So the most common block. Is that autocomplete? Hopefully it is. OK, it is. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a mesh block. Now within mesh block go mesh objects. Now as Cody described earlier, classes and classes and objects, all of the classes or a lot of the object classes that we have in Moose prescribe directly to objects that you would see in input files. Now the way that works is that this is me creating an object that I am personally calling GMG. Actually, I'll do something a little more simple. Let's call it mesh. So I'm going to call it GMG. So I'm sorry, mesh. So that is my name for it. That's just for me later on in the future to be able to reference it somewhere else if I want to. Oh no, I don't have autocomplete on. That's the worst. Who's? Mm. Does it just not work for? Uh oh. Now it's not working. Of course. There we go. Okay, we're good. I'll have to generate. Okay. So, like I said, um, the name, the lowercase mesh is my name for the object, but that needs to correlate to an actual object in Moose. So, the most common sort of way that we generate a mesh in Moose for testing and really simple problems is what we call a generated mesh generator. And all that is, is that's a Cartesian brick mesh with uniform spacing and with with widths in the X, Y, Z dimension with some dimension that you give it. Now, the other thing that I would like to describe here is that when you're going to look for an object, so this is within the mesh system in Moose, 
So how do you know what the mesh objects are in Moose or on your application? So if we go to the website, there's a wonderful thing here under the documentation tab called syntax index. Now what that is, is that is a listing of all of the things under that syntax. So for example, I might need to go to light mode in the future, sorry. We're looking for mesh objects. So we're going to go down to the mesh section. Now I already cheated and told you that I want to use a generated mesh generator. But you can see this large collection of ways to generate a mesh. We'll go into that later on in the future, but um, I'm going to cheat. And like we said, go ahead down to generated mesh generator, which creates a line square cube mesh with uniformly spaced or biased elements. So within that, with any object description on the website, we'll see a general overview. And more importantly, we'll see the parameters by which that you can supply as a user to describe how to define this object. You see a required parameter, which is the dimension, because we need to know is it one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. And you see a ton of optional parameters. Now, the ones that I'm going to focus on that we care about are NX, NY, and NZ, which are the number of elements in a certain dimension. And then X max, X min, Y max, Y min, which are the, the actual lengths of the mesh itself. And you can go down and see further parameters, but even better, if you scroll down, we, we show all of the input files in the repository that use this object and where they are. So for example, let's hope I can find an easy one. Nope, I'm not even gonna try, I'm just gonna click on one, I don't know, okay. Nope. So here's an example input file that creates a generated mesh generator of dimension one. Now, dimension is the only required parameter, which means that the optional parameters use their defaults which means that if we have just dim equals one, then we have one element in the X direction and that is it. And the, what's up? No, and, and, and this by default, if it's one dimensional, it's X. That's what you get with this generator. X, Y. Yeah, so we had a question asking if it was possible for this to be in the Z dimension, one dimension. But the way this generator generates a mesh, it's always going to be one dimensional in the X direction. You, but you can rotate it later, but this generator itself will generate one that is either in the X dimension, the XY, or the XYZ. Now, like I said, I knew that we were only going to get one element because this NX parameter defaults to one. Now, that's not very fun when it comes to running an actual problem, so we'll, of course, change that. So I'm going to return to VS Code and go ahead. We want a two-dimensional mesh. Now, awesome things about this with the autocomplete is that you get information about the parameters <clears throat> as you type them. You also get autofill. So if I type in, I see all the different parameters that start with N, NX. I forget what the actual problem has, so I'm just going to pick some random ones. So we have 100 elements in the X direction and 10 elements in the Y direction. Now we also want to give it some level of dimension, which I'll change the actual thing whenever we get to the real input file. So right now I'm going to say you want 100 elements in the X direction with a length of 10 arbitrary units. You define the units and 10 elements in the Y direction with a length of 20. Now there's some other important things here that I'll describe in a moment, and that is we're also going to use RZ um, geometry, which that uh, sets a symmetric axis, which in this case is the x-axis, but that's not important for what I'm doing right here. We'll get into that in a second. So now we have a really, really simple mesh block. Now, the easy way now here to make sure that what you did actually worked, when you're working with just a mesh and just a geometry, is to go to your executable. I'm going to go into the problems directory because that's where I made step one logan.i. I'm going to run that executable. The command line options for Moose to provide an input file is dash i in the path to the input file, which in this case is in the same directory that I'm in. And I'm going to pass the extra command line argument that is mesh dash dash mesh dash only. And what that does is it just builds the mesh, gives you some on-screen output, and then outputs the mesh in a common output file um, sent or a comp ah, 
common output type called Exodus, which we use for most general output in Moose. So we get this big dump of information. If I scroll up to the top of it, um, we'll see that the mesh goes from 0, 0, 0 to 10, 20, which is kind of the grid that we were expecting. I can also open that input file in Paraview, which if you go to the getting started, uh, the getting started slide before step one, there's listing for installing Paraview and all of that. So I'm going to go open this in Paraview. And we see a very boring grid that we expected, grid that we made. <clears throat> OK, so now we have a mesh. What else do we need? Well, we're solving a problem with one variable and we want to call that we're give, going to give that variable or that that variable a name called pressure because it's going to represent a pressure. So, OK, variables, that means that we're working in the variable system moose. So that means we have a top level variables block. Now, like I said, I'm going to name that variable pressure. Now this name. You can think of it as the name for your equation for this thing, or general equation for this thing. So we're going to do a pressure equation here. Even though we're, we're really just doing diffusion on this, I'm still going to call it the pressure equation. Now, note I didn't include any parameters for the pressure variable, so I'm using defaults. So what that means is that I am, to show the default, yep. So I'm using a Lagrange variable of it should fill in for me but i'm using a first order lagrange variable by default for variable and i'm not going to specify that we'll get into variable types and everything later but it's it's a linear variable i'll say that much okay what else so we now have a variable but now we need some physics um the way that we represent physics and moose in a modular form is by what we call kernels and kernels represent um the action of a particular physics physic or a chunk of physic in your problem. So of course, kernels, well, that's part of the kernel system in Moose. So naturally, we're going to create a kernels block. And what physics do we have right now? We have diffusion. So I'm going to give this kernel a name called diffusion. Again, this is what I want to call it. Now, similarly to how we created the generated mesh generator above, we need an object type for diffusion. Now I know because I use Moose a lot that we're going to use an AD diffusion object, which of course is auto completed for us. Now that is a diffusion kernel that supports automatic differentiation, which for the purposes of what we're doing right now is not super important. Um, we'll focus more on AD later and describe its benefits. Lastly, if we look at other variables for kernels, so I will actually go back to our website, go back to syntax index so we can look at this AD diffusion kernel that's doing something. I'm going to go to the kernel syntax, and I'm going to go to AD diffusion. Now, we see we have one required parameter. And that is the variable. So that is the equation essentially that this kernel operates on, which if you remember cor correctly, or if you remember carefully, the variable that we described was pressure. So we want to apply this to the pressure equation. So with that, variable equals pressure. Any questions so far? Yeah, I'll go back. You can call it whatever you want here. If we really want, we can call it this. Oh, yeah, sorry. OK, yeah, so th this top level block, is this what you mean here? Yeah. yeah, so that is just a syntactual thing where the systems themselves are capitalized. That is just how it is described in Moose, right? But this name. That's why that's why these names don't matter because these are your prescribed names and what all, all that matters for like correct like punctuation. So the question was why you know why do we not call it like you know this? 
These are user described names. Now, the objects themselves are specific objects that are case sensitive. And the syntax, like the variables block, is case sensitive. So those are your case sensitive things where they actually represent something in specific and not just something you name. So I'm going to go back to our problem definition really quick. So with our diffusion kernel, we satisfy this operator right here. Now what we have left is we have to deal with the boundary condition, which are prescribed values on the boundary. As we say here, a value of 4,000 on the left and zero on the right. So we'll describe more what boundary conditions are in the finite element since later on. But what's important to note is that they are called boundary conditions. And what that matters in Moose is that they are in the BC system, that is boundary condition system. So we need to prescribe two different boundary conditions. I'm going to plan ahead and say that we're going to prescribe one on the left and one on the right, and I'm going to call them right and left just for my sake. Now the left boundary condition is in finite element world, these are Dirichlet boundary conditions. That doesn't matter right now. What matters is, again, that we're just going to tell you they're called Dirichlet boundary conditions if you're not familiar with finite elements. So naturally, we're going to add an AD Dirichlet boundary condition for both of these. Now, similarly to kernels, boundary conditions apply to a variable. They apply to an equation. And in the same sense, we need to specify specify a variable that they apply to. So in this case, I'm going to apply it to the pressure variable, both of them. Uh oh, oh yeah, see, I, I uppercase that pressure and it's, it changed it for me. Cool, autocomplete's great. Makes you make many fewer mistakes. Now this one's gonna error out for sure. Now, the last thing we need to do is actually apply the value. So as I did before, I'm going to go back to the syntax listing just so you can kind of get used to the process of I need to go find an object to achieve what I'm trying to do. How do I look for it? And how do I learn about it? We're going to go to BCs. We're going to go to the AD Dirichlet boundary condition. Oh, no. Yay. Well, I'm getting rebooted. Is there a way to kill it? <laughs> uh, well, we'll see how long this lasts. I'll be quick. Required parameters. <laughs> boundary. OK, so boundary boundary conditions, as they would imply by their name, apply to boundaries, right? So what boundary do we want to apply ours to? We said we have a value of 4,000 on the left and 0 on the right. So boundaries in Moose for a lot of the common mesh generators are named for you in intuitive ways. That is for a generated mesh generator, the left boundary is conveniently called left. Now you can describe those however you want, um, but the simple ones are left, right, top, bottom, back, front, depending on what dimensions you're in. The value, well, of course, the value in the left boundary is 4,000. The value on the right is zero. And variable, we know it variable, it's the pressure variable. So. We're going to say, we're going to apply this guy to the left boundary, value of 4,000. And we're going to apply this guy to the right, the value of zero. Now, here's the bulk of our really simple problem. Now that we've built a lot of it, I'm going to switch over to the actual input file that comes with the problem, because there's some comments in there that might help make it a little bit easier to understand. So in the same folder, we're going to go to step one dot I. So what's different about this one? Well, we have actual dimensions for the problem. So X max and Y max represent the physical dimensions in the problem statement. We're doing axisymmetric RZ, which is basically um, a pipe. And we're symmetric about the X axis. Now, if we scroll down a little more, Looks like we named our inlet and outlet boundary conditions differently. I, I called them left and right, but inlet and outlet make it a little bit easier to understand what they represent. Again, these names are just for you. 
And if you reference these objects in other places, like variables, for example, that's when those names come become important. The problem block, the problem in Moose is the main executor of everything. The FE problem is the most common type, so this is what you will usually use unless you're running things like finite volume. Which in case you'll still use FE problem. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> and the executioner. Um, Peter, who's coming after me, will kind of get into executioner parameters a little bit more, but the executioner is what actually solves the problem. So that's where you put a lot of the solver parameters, linear, nonlinear, GM res, Newton iteration, and so on. Um, but the object type itself is steady. This is important. Um, it's a steady state problem. We're just running one time step. You can, for example, here use transient to run a transient problem where you're, you're stepping forward in time. Lastly, the outputs block. Now, <clears throat> in Moose, there are a few ways to define syntax. If you look up for BCs and kernels, for example, you have an object name and then type. This is very common for prescribing specific objects. But if you look down in the outputs block, there's no type equals anything. Well, there's also a lot of shortcut syntax, which can be found on the website as well. But in this case, this ex exodus equals true shortcut syntax actually creates an object for you that looks like this. Uh, if I could type. So there's shortcut syntax for all kinds of things. This is just such a common one that we leave it like this. OK, so let's actually go run our problem. So like I said, take our executable, which is called Darcy from a Mac up, dash I for an input file, and we're going to run step one dot I. OK. So we, we get some extra information up here at the top, which is always good to have around. So we're running with one processor. We'll talk about parallelism later. We're running two dimensions. There's a thousand elements in our mesh with 1,111 nodes. We have one variable called pressure that is of type first Lagrange, which is, which is a linear variable. We're running a steady state problem with Newton, and we're using a very simple uh, a preconditioner that's on the diagonal, but doesn't matter. We'll get to that later. Now we ran it. So what now? Well, now we should probably look at the result to see if it makes any sense. So we have a diffusion problem with some prescribed boundary conditions. So if, if you are familiar with that sort of problem, we'd expect a linear solution. So we ran step one dot I, the de default output base in Moose is the same name as the input file with an underscore out at the end of it. So if you look, we produced a step one underscore out input or exodus file which is, like I said, the common file format we use for outputting solutions. What? Oh, yeah. Hold on. There we go. I don't know how to get that thing to go away. It's annoying. So we're going to open that output file. Delete this guy. Actually, I'm just going to reopen pair of you because it's going to be difficult. we're going to look at our pressure variable. We'll take away surface. Zoom in, oh, no, surface, surface. Zoom in a bit. So we're at time step zero, which is the initial condition. Well, hopefully we have an initial condition of zero, which is what we would expect. I don't know why it's centering it over there. Oh, is it? Oh, that's better. There we go. Now, if we go to the first time step, of course, we only have one time step because we're running a steady state problem. Now I'm going to rescale. Value of 4,000 on the left, value of zero on the right. Equivalently, I can draw a line. Now it's like diagonal, which is not great, but I don't care to change it. So linear solution that we would expect. So this is kind of the general setting up of running anything in Moose. Create an input file, run it, look at the output. And like I said, the power in Moose is that that input syntax, if you understand all of the systems in Moose, know how to look for the objects, and later on know how to use all the shortcuts, which we also describe in documentation for specific kinds of physics, 
you can work in most Moose applications very, very comfortably. And if you can write an input file for one application and then write one for another, well, you can then couple those together also very, very easily. So this is the power of Moose in its most general form. <clears throat> like I said here, we described the basic building blocks of Moose application, which use these systems. There's a lot more as Cody listed earlier on. Here's the input file that we ran. Anything that is included in um, the slides has a direct path to where it is in the repository. And we ran the problem. To make an input file. Now we're going to continue on to some more, um, <laughs> some more lower level important concepts in Moose, and that is what is the finite element method? How do we solve problems? And all of that jazz. So with that, I'm going to hand that off to Peter. All right. So in the next, uh, for the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, we'll discuss uh, a simplified version of. Uh, the finite uh, element theory that we use uh, in Moose, just uh, enough material to make sure that you can, you, you have everything to code your own application. So if you, uh, if, if some of you are um, from, from um, uh, a, a field of uh, mathematics, this might not, this will lack the uh, some of the mathematical rigor and uh, my apologies for that. So before we jump into finite elements, we will start with uh, a, a sim similar concept, which is polynomial fitting. This uh, will introduce uh, the, prox uh, the concept of uh, function appro approximation. So when we have a polynomial fitting uh, example, somebody uh, gives us a couple of uh, data points and says, hey, I would, like, um, I would like to create an approximate function that uh, I think uh, was used to create these data points, and I would like it to look. Uh, I would like it to be a polynomial. So then we we come and say, all right. So I think my polynomial uh, will have a form uh, like this. Uh, it has a constant term, a linear term. Uh, so it's a sum of uh, monomials. In this expression, you see that we have basis functions. So the basis functions we have are one x x squared and so on depending on the degree of polynomial the maximum degree of polynomial we want to uh, use and these basis functions are summed up or are are summed up using um, uh, coefficients these expansion coefficients and our job here is to determine these coefficients knowing uh, some some data and um, or using the data that was provided. Um, we can also write this uh, polynomial in a, a little bit uh, a shorter form using the, the summation. In this case, we ha only have these uh, coefficients and you see that the basis functions can be uh, also expre expressed like that. And um, um, the, the thing that we have to emphasize here is that our, our, we, are deter we are trying to come up with a, a function, that's the solution of our uh, problem, but the way we obtain this function is uh, by determining the co its coefficients. And uh, it turns out that if we have um, d, um, d uh, so if the degree of polynomial we want to fit is d, and we have d plus one points, then this is a well-posed problem, which will give us a unique uh, solution. Um, and we will solve, we will have an example, a short example where we provide three points. So if you can think about this as, as measurements um, over a line or over a very long rod, you measure let's, uh, some sort of a temperature, like diamond, you can think about this uh, values as dimensionless uh, temperatures. So what we say here is that at one on this rod, at the distance one of, the, of this rod, uh, this value, this quantity of interest uh, is uh, 
has a value of four, at three it has a value of one, at four it has a value of two. And I would like to uh, fit a polynomial. Well, if we if we um, use the expression, oops, if we use the expression here, then um, we have and we say, hey, we have three points. Then this means that if I wanted to fit a quadratic polynomial on this, I would have a, a well-posed problem. And that's exactly what we are going to do here. Uh, we will plug in the, the positions into our uh, quadratic uh, polynomial for all three um, uh, data entries. And, uh, and uh, we will also plug back, uh, plug the, um, and, and make them equal the expressions that we get from that, make them equal to the actual measurements. And we have, we will have three equations from this, and we have three unknowns, which are the expansion coefficients, uh, A, B, and C. So if you carry out all of these uh, steps, you will get uh, this linear system that you can solve for the expansion coefficients. Um, I'm not gonna make you do the math. Um, here are the values for the expansion coefficients, and then you can plug them back to the to, to the polynomial expression and get a, a continuous function as uh, as the solution of the fit, fitting sample. Um, and this this is very similar to the finite element theory, where we are looking for a solution function, not necessarily just po point values. Um, so what you can see here is that you, you have this quadratic polynomial and it, it has values at uh, one, three, and four. It, it crosses the value uh, the, it, the values that we used um, to, to construct it. But you can also in, uh, evaluate this polynomial everywhere else in the in the domain. So the solution is the function. It's not the it's not the, the coefficients. And so the co this also means that the coefficients themselves are meaningless. Um, without the corresponding basis functions, and um, I, um, I already covered my, uh, most of this. Uh, this just emphasizes again that uh, you can evaluate this function anywhere. So the solution is the function; it's not the co coefficient. We, we, coefficients. We focus more on the the function, and um, uh, I think this gives us uh, enough background to actually start uh, touching some of the finite or simplified versions of the finite uh, uh, element method. Because in, uh, when we solve a, a problem using the finite element method, we use a very similar uh, approximation uh, to uh, somehow a, a, a very similar approximation for the solution of a partial differential equation. So we have a partial differential equation with a specific solution, and we say, well, I'm going to approximate this solution using the linear combination of certain basis functions. And my job will be to determine the expansion coefficients in this uh, linear combination. Um, in finite element theory, these basis functions are often called uh, shape functions. I'm going to mostly call them uh, shape functions, but sometimes uh, a basis function might might uh, slip in um, he, here and there. Also, the expansion coefficients are often referred to as um, uh, degrees of uh, freedom. Uh, you will hear that term a lot uh, throughout the next couple of uh, days. And um, today I'm just going to switch between degrees of freedom, unknowns, or expansion uh, coefficients. But those uh, will mean exactly the same thing. And um, there are a couple of good things about the finite element method. Um, it has a very robust theory, mathematical theory behind it. It has been applied to a wide variety of um, PDEs on, on different domains. And um, we have very, very good um, uh, theory to describe um, uh, accuracy, stability, and, and co convergence uh, 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 behavior for uh, different PDs and different uh, uh, sets of basis functions and domains. So it is uh, mathematically very robust. There is a, a 
a term here that uh, I haven't, uh, I, I skipped it on uh, almost on purpose. Um, it's, it's called Galerkin finite element. I'm not going to go into the details here. Most of most of the uh, most of the machinery in Moose uh, uses uh, Galerkin finite element. However, there are other options uh, as well. Uh, we will get into this when we um, dive a little bit in how you you compute uh, uh, the things that you actually need to com uh, code in in Moose. Um, but one advantage of the finite element method over the finite volume or um, let's say finite difference methods is that it will give you at least Galerkin finite element, continuous Galerkin finite element. It will give you um, a piecewise continuous uh, function instead of just point values or cell average values. Um, so one one crucial one crucial term in the finite element method is the weak form. Depending on what kind of background you have, you might have heard about this. Uh, um, or you might have used a different name for this, like a, a weighted residual or variational statement. But the gist uh, gist is the same. So why do we why do we call this weak form? Well, we we actually have a strong form too. Uh, I think Cody, Cody already mentioned, or at least one of Cody's slides had a strong form um, on it, and uh, he said it out loud, but it's not necessarily, unless you have a math, math background or a very solid um, math uh, uh, foundation, you might not know that it, why it's called strong form or why it's called big form. And it's called strong form because uh, it has very strong constraints on uh, differentiability. Uh, on 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 some of your uh, solutions or, or on your solutions, which means that uh, uh, for some PDs, even simple problems cannot necessarily be solved uh, analytically. Uh, and here is where the mathematicians uh, um, came in, saying that hey, I I think I can uh, transform this strong form, which has like you not know, all of the differential operators, into uh, an integral equation and alleviate some of these con constraints to get rid of uh, some of these constraints. And this is also a very useful tool, uh, a very natural step to build something uh, that can be solved numerically on a computer. So these are these are um, uh, these are the motivations of, of using uh, weak form, the weak form. Um, and here's a, a five point or five bullet recipe for you um to be able to derive the big form that you can put in moose moose uh the original concept in moose requires you to supply your strong form derive your big form and then uh, put some information about your big form into the code if you have a very specific partial differential equation you might have to derive a big form yourself and then, or just maybe somebody somebody out there already derived it, and you just have to do a literature review, and then put the um, different terms in the big form into Moose. That that was the original concept. Uh, since then, a lot of people implemented a lot of things in Moose, so there's a very good chance that you will already find what what you need. Uh, anyway, so here's the five uh, five bullet recipe. For you to derive your uh, your big form, first you will need to supply your strong form. We will have a very simple example uh, for for this recipe, um, but first we'll just go through the the bullets. So first you give give uh, the strong form, then you rearrange everything in your strong form um, to make sure that you have a residual function on the left hand side and the zero or a, a big zero on the right hand side. Then you weight this residual using a weight function or test function. We will call it a test function, but you can think about this as a as a as a weighting function. That's where the weighted residual um, uh, term comes from. And then you use this product. You integrate this product uh, over a, a specific domain. We will denote uh, the domain 
by omega. And usually we will use uh, psi for um, the test function. And as a last step, to make sure that you can, um, to, to give you an easy way to apply boundary conditions and to alleviate some further uh, differentiability uh, uh, requirements, you can use integration by parts combined with the divergence uh, theorem um, to reshuffle a little bit uh, your terms. But we'll, we'll see a, a good example for that. So be before we jump into the example, I'm just going to really fast go through what integration by parts is, especially if you combine it with the divergence theorem. It all comes from the, um, the product uh, uh, product rule, um, meaning that the divergence of a scalar function times a vector function uh, is nothing else but or you know, can be expressed or expanded as the scalar function times the divergence of the vector function plus the vector function times or dotted with the gradient of the scalar function. Now we can integrate this uh, uh, this guy over a, a domain and um, uh, reshuffle. We, we will put this on the left hand side and the, uh, we will send this to the right hand side. This is exactly what you can uh, see here. And at this point, you may realize that, oh, I have a volumetric integral here uh, with a of a divergence term. And here uh, you pull the divergence theorem, which states that uh, the integral, the volumetric integral of this divergence term can be expressed as a surface integral. The surface is the, the bounding surface of the of this domain um, of your vector field dotted with the um, or vector function dotted with the surface normal. And here we take this guy and plug it back to equation four to to the first term in the uh, right hand side and we will arrive to the to this expression here that we will, to equation six uh, here that we will frequently use uh, and we will uh, i will show you exactly how so here is the little here comes the the short example uh it's an advection it's an advection diffusion problem you see when you supply the the strong form which is the first step uh, in our recipe, um, you we have an, uh, the first one is a diffusion term, or the first term on the left hand side is a diffusion term. We have a, a let's say k, which is a diffusivity. We denote um, the solution by u. Uh, we have a a vector field which which can be considered like maybe this is the advecting velocity in our case, and uh, we also have a forcing function on the right hand side. Uh, then the next step, the, ne the next step is to rearrange this whole uh, equation in a way that we have zero on the right hand side and the residual function uh, on the left hand side. This will be called uh, the residual function here. And uh, the third, and then we can move on to the third, this, the, the third uh, step, which is uh, uh, the weighting of this uh, residual. So we just multiply it with the test function. Uh, psi. All right, then we go on and in integrate this over uh, our domain. Uh, there is nothing uh, surprising in in this term. And then we move, uh, we bring in the integration by parts combined with the divergence theorem to uh, kind of expand the the diffusion term. So what you can see here is that I have I actually have the um, uh, scalar function times the the divergence of a vector function. So k times a grad u is a vector function. And if you go back two slides, you see that that's exactly what I have on the left hand side here. So I can just plug in this surface integral and this uh, um, volumetric integral uh, right right here. So what we'll have, we'll have the gradient of the test function dotted with the, the gradient of the solution times uh, this diffusivity minus a surface integral. And why is the why is the surface integral uh, good for for us? Some of you might say, hey, I, I just made my my life more complicated. I 
I don't really think that we, we need this. Well, it turns out that if you have a Neumann boundary condition, then you immediately supply this. So this is an easy way to uh, apply Neumann boundary conditions. Um, yes, and uh, sometimes, uh, depending on where you are in this tutorial, you might see uh, the integrals or these integrals in an inner product uh, using an inner product notation. In an, for the for this notation, we'll use regular parentheses for um, volumetric integrals and uh, angled brackets for surface integrals. And you you might notice at this point that hey, uh, somebody put a kernel here and the boundary condition here. Yes, so. We are getting really close to connecting with the Moose input, input file syntax. The volumetric integrals in this term will be actually kernels in a Moose input file. And this, the, the boundary integral, will be a boundary condition. So if we uh, ju just to do, uh, just to go into uh, some some specific uh, kernels, uh, it turns out that uh, these terms have already been coded by somebody and openly available in Moose. If you want to do uh, the the integral of this diffusion, the volumetric integral coming from this diffusion term, then you can simply use a diffusion kernel or an AD diffusion kernel. Um, we have automatic differentiation uh, right now. Uh, this boundary integral here can be uh, used uh, by, or it is used uh, in the Neumann boundary condition. It's also already there in Moose. Um, the advection term will be in the conservative advection, and then we have a, a, a body force. So you can assemble this system uh, using Moose already uh, computed Moose objects. But what's important to note is that volumetric objects usually go to uh, kernels and uh, surface integral surface integrals will uh, will go to boundary conditions. Okay. Yes. Yes. So be better. Yes, so the question the question was where can we define uh, the K, so diffusivity and um, beta here. So bet you can add, so in this case, beta is an input parameter that you can see here. It's uh, one, it's a velocity uh, of uh, magnitude one in the X direction and zero in every other directions. And K in this case is, one <laughs> uh, probably Cody co uh, co uh, co coded this kernel, I assume. Um, but you can define it as an input parameter on the kernels, or you can use a, a material property for this if you want it to be a more complicated function. Um, so it's usually these parameters can be defined or um, on on the kernel themselves as an input parameter or linked to a more complicated stru structure. Um, okay, so uh, do we have any more questions regarding this part? Yes. Just make sure these are the only integrals and the angled bracket or for the surface. Correct. Okay. All right. Also, we denote the surface of our boundary by uh, this. Uh, uh, the, the boundary. Okay, so let's see what kind of uh, let, let's see as in, uh, let's see what kind of um, uh, shape functions or basis functions we usually use in the finite element theory. Oh, um, one difference between the polynomial fitting and uh, the finite element method is that in a finite element method we like to use uh, local basis functions. What do I mean by local? Well, that it means that my basis function are all, uh, basis functions um, are defined on a on a few elements only. So, um, 
So what this uh, what this means, or they live on a few on few elements uh, only. Um, so what you see here is that I have a one dimensional domain and I split it into four cells, uh, omega one, omega two, omega three and omega four. And these four cells will be um, will be ac accompanied by uh, five nodes. The nodes will be between the cells and on the boundaries. And what you see here is that we have these uh, hat functions here, and every single node will have uh, one hat function uh, associated with uh, one corresponding hat function. And um, uh, what you see here is that node node one only has um, this this part. We don't have the other part. It's outside. It's cut cut down by the edge of the uh, edge of the domain. Node two has a full head function, node three full head function, and, and so on. So, and and these local functions, so um, this is uh, phi two, uh, form the basis. Uh, so these will be the basis functions of our approx for our approximation of the solution field of a partial differential equation. So why is it good? to have local basis functions? Well, if we have these local basis functions, we can derive a, a sparse system. So when everything is settled and we have a only a uh, linear field, no, a linear uh, system with a matrix on the right-hand side, then local, if we do the uh, local basis functions, we have very sparse matrix, which, is uh, much simpler to handle with an iterative solver. Uh, obviously, you can do the same. Um, you can do the same um, in multiple dimensions. In this case, uh, we have a tri the triangulation of this a triangulation of this whole domain, and we'll have a tenth a tenth function uh, for every single node in this uh, domain. Uh, these. Uh, are usually called uh, Lagrange um, uh, basis functions because they take the value of one at at a node and zero at every other node. Um, Lagrange yeah, mo Lagrange uh, basis functions are used uh, uh, a lot. These are linear Lagrange basis functions. Um, actually, we will meet them uh, multiple times. These are the default for any moose. Uh, simulation. So unless you specify in the Moose input file, uh, you will be using these guys. Okay, so just to uh, repeat again, we will use these basis functions with um, correct with the, the we will sum up these basis functions with the uh, corresponding coefficients, and we will approximate the solution of our PDE using this this sum here um, and uh, we often call um, we, we often call the the approximate solution uh, a, a, a trial function uh, in this case you see that we have uh, n basis functions in uh, in or, or general uh, for for a large pd on a large domain with a lot of cells and can be a very large number. And I, our job here, or our job for for today and tomorrow, will be to define the um, coefficients, the expansion coefficients that we use to sum up these uh, basis functions. One good thing about uh, this definition here is that when you hit the, um, the approximate solution with a uh, linear operator, we can just a uh, linear spatial operator, we can just carry out the, this um, this process on the basis functions themselves, and then multiply them uh, with the with the expansion coefficients. So, for example, computing the um, uh, for example computing the uh, the gradient of uh, the approximate solution is very simple. We just compute the gradient of the basis functions and then sum them up uh, using the expansion coefficients. So here is where the name Galerkin comes back in the picture again. Um, most of the simulations in Moose or 
right now um, is uh, use uh, Geller, the Galerik infinite element method, which means that we use the same uh, we use uh, test functions from the same basis as we as we use to approximate our solution. And what does this mean? Well, that means that this uh, psi uh, basis function uh, will actually it's enough to use the the basis functions, the same basis functions that we use to approximate our solution to uh, weight our are uh, 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 to wait in our weak form for waiting in our weak form. So what you see here, but for because of that, we will need to check for every single basis vector. So what you uh, will end up at the at the very end is um, just an equation or n equation. So one equation for every single waiting waiting function. Or basis function in the in the test space, and <clears throat> uh, so you will have n n equations, and you also have n non unknowns. The unknowns in this case, or the degrees of freedom, will be the expansion coefficients uh, in U H. U H is just a linear combination of the basis functions, and uh, with certain expansion coefficients. So this integral here, or this line here. Uh, is going to be is usually called as the ith entry or the ith component of your residual vector. Um, so this this is called the the residual the ith component of the residual vector, and you will use this residual in certain ways. We will find it out in in about an hour to compute uh, the coefficients in in U H. So again. Third time or fourth time, just uh, emphasizing that the coefficients themselves might not mean anything. They only help us form the function, which will be the solution um, or the approximate solution to the partial differential equation. And um, uh, there a very common strategy is to construct these uh, local uh, shape functions by restricting uh, global basis functions like polynomials onto a few or or onto individual uh, elements it's a very it's a very it's it's a similar concept uh, compared to polynomial fitting um, just the fact that the, the way we approximate the solution uh, by a linear combination of uh, basis functions we have a lot of different uh, basis function types in 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 moose um, we call them uh, basis function or shape function families they have uh, Lagrange, Hermit, hierarchic, monomial, and 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 so on. Uh, we will see a, a couple of examples uh, of that. Um, in most of the cases, and the default in Moose are Lagrange basis functions. And the good, um, a good um, a property of this is that the expansion coefficient for the Lagrange uh, shape functions will actually be the value of your approximate solution at the nodes. So it has a, a little bit of a, a meaning in this case, uh, even though I said that the expansion coefficients might mean nothing. For Lagrange uh, shape functions, they actually mean the value of your approximate solution at, uh, at the node. Uh, OK, so. Here is how. Uh, here is a slide on how this all connects to a Moose input file. You can use the variables block in a Moose input file to, um, or different parameters in the variables uh, input block uh, to define what kind of shape function you want to use, what kind of order you want to use for that shape function, and uh, so so on. So in this case, we define two variables, u and v, and both of them will be the same. Uh, uh, we'll use the same shape function. Um, it will come from the Lagrange family and it's going to be first order. So these guys actually define shape functions like this exactly. But if you wanted a hermit, then you can just replace this with hermit. Um, and you, you will have to modify the order too, I think, depending on your equation. 
Uh, all right, so here uh, we, we plotted, yes. Oh, that's a very good question. So when you create, hmm? so the, the question was uh, what the block param, uh, why we need the block parameter here. Uh, technically, we don't need it here, but I think it's a very good point to discuss what a block is in Moose. Uh, let's say you have a mesh and you have one material on, uh, uh, on this mesh, like on the left side and a different material on the right side. Uh, you can split in, into in th this mesh into two domains, and we call uh, these domains blocks in MOOCs. Um, so, and you can define different variables on blocks, different material properties, um, a per, uh, like uh, different uh, variables with, with different uh, finite, um, different kernels that might only act on one, one block or not. Uh, and, and so on. And um, obviously, you can uh, define different uh, finite element shape functions on different blocks too. Okay, so here are some. Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. There is a, there is, I think, an associated number as well, but you can give it a name too. So uh, when you create your mesh, in Moose or in, in Gmesh, you can assign a name like let's say left block, right block, and in that case you don't put zero and one here. You put the name of the block. So you can use numbers, but you can also name uh, use a string to define block I, block ID. Yes. Uh, so sorry, I couldn't hear it uh, entirely. C could you repeat your question? I think if I got the question uh, right, uh, it was about the generality of, of the usage of block. You can use almost every Moose object we have uh, on an input file is uh, block restrictable, meaning that you can use uh, this block restrictable property for practically anything anything you want. Um, so, oh, okay, yes, yeah, so, but it's important to note that uh, blocks are non-overlapping. Okay. Um, okay, any more questions regarding blocks? Okay, then I just move on. So the last thing that we will cover is um, just a couple of examples of shape functions. This is all in 1D, uh, but you can see here that uh, uh, this is uh, this is over one element. We have we we see that we have two uh, basis functions on one element. Uh, one corresponds or uh, they correspond to the two nodes that uh, are adjacent to this this element. And you see that it's uh, this element. So the coordinate system is kind of weird. Uh, it goes from one, uh, minus one to one. Well, uh, in the next section, we will discuss uh, um, the utilization of uh, reference elements. So what you can see is uh, the are the plots of the different shape functions on reference elements. So this is a 1D element. This is a linear Lagrange shape function. Uh, functions I already showed you. Um, no, nothing special here. Uh, we can obviously push uh, to higher higher degree polynomials. So if we have um, a quadratic, uh, uh, if you, if you want to use quadratic basis functions, then we also have uh, something called the quadratic Lagrange uh, shape functions. In this case, however, you introduce an additional node in the middle of the in the middle of the element. So what you see here 
it's it, it's still true that ev uh, every basis function will take the value of one at the corresponding node and the va value zero at um, at the uh, the the remaining nodes. Um, so psi one uh, psi zero here takes uh, value one on the left and then zero in this new node at, at this new node and zero at the other side. It's, it's the same for uh, the other basis functions, but these are in internal nodes. Um, so this is an internal node. And of, obviously we can push this a little bit further. Uh, we can go to cubic uh, polynomials. Um, in this case, you introduce two additional nodes intern uh, internal to the element, but you see that it's still the same. We have a uh, value of one at the left hand side or on, on the left boundary and then zero at the internal nodes and zero at the at the right uh, boundary. And it's the same for the basis functions. We have another uh, or there is another uh, basis uh, fun or shape function uh, family that uh, needs to be mentioned here, which is the hermit. Uh, these are very good for ver uh, high, very high order um, uh, derivatives because they not only guarantee the continuity of the solution, but they all also guarantee the continuity of the derivative of the solution. Uh, what do I mean by this? Yes. So what what I um, what I mean here is that we have two shape functions that guarantee the continuity of the solution. These be, these will be the red and the blue. They will take the value of one at one node and the value of zero at the other one. But you also see that the, the derivatives of these shape functions are zero at at, at these points. Uh, and we have two uh, two more uh, shape functions, two additional shape functions, which have a derivative of one at uh, one node and derivative of zero at the other point and vice versa for the, for the, for the black shape function here. Um, but they take the value of zero at, uh, at, at both nodes. Um, that's more or less it. And obviously you can push it to uh, multiple dimensions too. Uh, here are the uh, biquadratic basis functions um, on a quad, quad element. Uh, we will have nine nodes uh, on this element. That's that's where the nine comes from, I believe. And uh, we'll have one at uh, the, the corners, uh, uh, or we will have nodes at the corners. We will have uh, nodes at the middle points of each edge and one node in the very middle of the of the element. And uh, with that, I think we finished off that that part. And I believe we should be close to our break. Let's continue with the numerical, the details of the numerical implementation. But before that, I just realized I forgot to introduce myself at the very beginning. So I'm I'm uh, Peter German. I joined the Moose team a little bit more than one and a half years ago. I mainly work on the Navier Stokes two physics modules, the Navier Stokes module, and the Stochastic Tools module. My background is in nuclear engineering too. Uh, that's all about me. All right, so details of the numerical implementation. So in this section, we will cover how we get from the definition of the, um, how, we, how we actually compute the expansion coefficients for our approximate solution. How we get from those integrals in the weak form uh, to a linear system where we can, which we can use to determine the um, the expansion uh, coefficients. Uh, for that, we will have to cover a few things about uh, numerical integration. And the first step here is that uh, we split our integrals over the whole domains into uh, integrals over over elements. And then we sum up the element element wise contributions to get to the integral over the whole domain. So this is exactly what this first uh, expression says. Uh, we sum over element E is going to be something element related. Uh, and omega E is the domain which is covered by uh, that, that corresponding element. 
And at this point, we can pull out another trick uh, from the finite element book, which is the integ which is uh, the integration on the reference element. I already hinted. Uh, I already uh, hinted a little bit about uh, the this reference element, but um, to understand uh, this, maybe you can think about a, uh, a complicated mesh with uh, with quad elements. So you have four nodes connected by uh, straight edges, but this is distorted, a little bit rotated. Um, so uh, in a physical space, it's not necessarily obvious, or it's it can be a little bit. Um, Okay, it's 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 not, it's not super hard, but it can be a little bit challenging to do this uh, element by element. So what we do here is that we define a reference element, define a coordinate transformation between the reference element and our physical element, and then do the integration on the reference element and use the determinant of the of the Jacobian, which is built with um, uh, fr from this coordinate transformation, to actually uh, transform our value back to uh, the the actual physical space. Um, so this is what you can see here. When we get when we get to um, when we get to um, a reference element, we we will use um, uh, still omega to show the domain of the reference, or so the the domain where the reference element is defined, but we'll uh, use this little hat uh, there to to show, hey, this is a reference element. We'll also introduce, yes. I will, I will, okay, I, I can answer that right now. We will get there in a little bit. Uh, these Jacobians, or this is actually, we only need the determinant of the Jacobian. You can think about this in a very simplified term, uh, like sort of a little bit of a, a volume term there. But the, 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 term, the determinant of the Jacobian is provided by Moose. You don't have to worry about that. It's actually provided by LibMesh, but you don't have to, to worry about that. It's out of the scope. Um, for you, but it's still important to know that something is down there uh, in the integration um, that uh, that uh, connects a reference element and, and our, our physical element. The F function in this case, um, I is your res residual function, I would say that that's the closest at this point, but we will we will get get there too. But uh, yeah, obviously, if you want to integrate um, a basis function or any any function over an element, uh, you can do this trick. But you, in a sense, you are right because we have the linear combination of the basis functions and the coefficients themselves don't uh, depend on on space so yes this 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 is this can be close to um uh the integration of of the basis functions i can hear a little bit of an echo from there is that possible okay thanks okay so we integrate in a reference element here is an example uh, of a reference element uh, for a quad quad nine element. You can see here that uh, when you create a mesh, it might not be perfect. It might be so the the it might be a little bit rotated compared to the coordinate the the principal coordinates uh, in, of the physical of the physical space. Uh, you might have some uh, um, bends in the edges and, and so on. So instead of integrating on this ugly element, you see that we define this reference element very nice, edges nicely aligned with the principal coordinates, um, and very this is it's very easy to do the integration on this. Um, this was just an example. Uh, the next uh, key concept uh, for the integration is the usage of uh, a quadrature rule. What's a quadrature rule? Well, it turns out that you can approximate uh, an analytic integral 
by evaluating the, uh, the function that you want to uh, integrate uh, at certain points in the domain and uh, create the weighted sum of these evaluations um, to approximate your um, uh, to, to approximate your integral. And these points on, in the domain combined with uh, the weights form the quadrature rule. So these will be the quadrature weights and these will be the quadrature points and they correspond to each other. So using this, you can very easily approximate integrals. And it turns out that we have very accurate quadrature rules um, which give us very good approximations for these integrals. In certain cases, they are actually exact. It turns out that if you wanted to integrate polynomials, let's say you have polynomials in your shape functions. So if you just wanted to integrate your shape functions, uh, you could use a, a Gaussian quadrature set, which uh, can integrate uh, if you have one quadrature point, it can integrate a linear function. If you have two quadrature points, it can integrate uh, a quadratic and a cubic function and so on. So it can integrate 2n minus um, a polynomial of degree 2n minus 1 with n points, which is pretty cool. Um, and this also enables uh, very fast uh, the very fast evaluations um, in the finite element method, which is uh, necessary to make it computationally efficient. Um, yes, so let's go and check what our integral, if we plug every, uh, all of these tricks, uh, by tricks I mean the integration over, the integration over reference element and uh, uh, the utilization of quadrature rule into our integral, we see that we have these nested sum here. Uh, so first we are sum over whole elements. We split our integral um, into element-wise integrals. Uh, then we will sum over quadrature rules. We multiply with the quadrature weight and uh, uh, corresponding Jaco uh, the determinant of the Jacobian and evaluate our function that we actually want to integrate at the quadrature point. So at this point, I think uh, um, at, at this point we can uh, just connect these these concepts with what we have in Moose. In Moose, all you need to supply is the evaluation of your um, function, which will be the weak form <coughs> of your function at quadrature points. So yes. Yes. Um, OK, so. <clears throat> um, yes, so here we. Um, so what you need to supply for a Moose simulation, if you want to write your own physics in there, is the in, in a kernel is just the contribution of that kernel or the to the weak form of the residual. That's all. So that's going to be uh, F here. Yes. So you have the element. Oh yes, so I will repeat the question. The, the question was about the difference between a, a quadrature and an element. So what you can see on the screen is an element and you want to inter this is a reference element and you want to integrate on this reference element. So what you will do uh, is that you will have specific locations on this element. Those will be the quadrature locations. Let's say we'll have one here, we'll have one here, we'll have one here, we'll have one there. And depending on your quadrature rule, the points of the quadratures might might change on your element. So quadrature points are only used for the numerical integration. Wherever whereas an element also describes sort of a like something connected to the geometry, the way you split the geometry. Uh, into smaller pieces. 
So yeah, so quadrature rule is used for integration. Uh, and within the element, you have multiple quadrature points. Within each element, you have multiple quadrature points. That, did that clear that up? Okay. Yeah, so you don't have to. Yes. Oh, you have some sort of a control, a control over the quadratures that you use. But uh, it's mostly you can control it through an input file. So you don't have to, when you put your physics into moves or into moves kernels, you don't have to worry about, hey, what if I use a Gaussian quadrature rule? What if I use, I don't know, Chebyshev um, quadra qu quadrature rule? You don't have to worry about any of that. That's taken uh, care of. You can just control it through the input file. More questions? Okay. So I think I stopped somewhere here. Yes, yeah, so it, it it connects to the exact same thing. So you don't have to worry about the the Jacobian of the mapping. You don't have to worry about the weights of the quadrature. You have some control over the weights uh, and the quadrature points, but we definitely don't have to worry about mapping things from a reference line and then mapping them back. The only thing that you need to supply is the, the evaluation of this function at uh, a quadrature point. So now we take our um, simple example of an advection diffusion problem. And we apply everything we learn uh, to this. Um, one thing that uh, we will check, we will make sure that everybody is familiar with before we move on is uh, just um, just the, the evaluation of uh, the solution of different, uh, uh, like for example, gradient of solution and quadrature points. Well, considering that the, the expansion coefficients don't depend on these, we can just evaluate the basis functions of the quadrature points. So the evaluation of the approximate solution will be very simple. We just evaluate the shape functions at the quadrature rules during the integration. So if you use all of that, not necessarily on this slide, but uh, uh, what, the way the way we express the way we can express the ith component of the residual vector, which was nothing else, just if you if you recall, it's everything we put on the left hand side, multiplied it with the weighting function, and we integrated it, and <clears throat> we needed to create one for every single basis function in our test test space. So this i here is just uh, the index of the test the test function. So the ith component of the residual vector can be expressed uh, with this uh, ugly term here. Um, so again, we have a volumetric term. We grouped uh, everything together in a volumetric um, uh, volumetric uh, uh, integral. By everything, I mean the volumetric terms in the weak form. <clears throat> so we go through the quadrature points, we go through the elements, go through the quadrature points of the elements, we uh, use the weight and the determinant of this uh, uh, Jacobian as a multiplier. This is taken care of, you don't have to worry about it. And then we evaluate this part here at every single quadrature point. So all you need to do in a moose kernel is to create a function that evaluates this guy here. And you will have access we, we, we grant you access to the test functions at quadrature point, uh, to the uh, solution at quadrature points, uh, and all of these parameters. So you will have access to everything as it has been streamlined uh, for you guys. Uh, all you need to do is to code this, the evaluation of this um, at the quadrature point. It's very similar in boundary for boundary conditions. Yes. It depends, yes. Um, so uh, depending on your quadrature rule, the number of quadrature points uh, might change. Depending on your application, if you, like there are quadrature rules where you have quadratures on the edges. Um, you have quadrature rules where you don't. We have multiple quadrature rules, but 
most of them, depending on the order of accuracy you want to integrate up to the, the number of quadrature point changes. The more quadrature points you use, the higher accuracy you will get for the integration. Yes? Is it fair to say Uh, yes, I, yes. Yeah, so, so the, if I understand, I couldn't hear entirely. So I'll try to repeat the question and you can tell me if I, if it was correct or not. Um, so your question was if the quadrature rule is automatically defined based on what kind of basis functions we have in the variables plot. Yes. What kind of family? And I would say we default based on that. We de default to uh, something which we think will work, but you guys have the power to override it. But uh, um, if I'm wrong here, we have two other experts, hopefully online, which uh, is Roy, Roy Stogner and Alex Lindsay. If I'm wrong here, uh, you can definitely correct me. All right, all right then. But in general, if I'm wrong in something, feel free to correct me. We don't want to give false information to you guys. Um, all right, but anyways, you can do the same trick on, on surfaces or on boundary surfaces. You will have boundary integrals. You split into multiple faces, onto the faces of the boundary. Then you will have a quadrature rule on the face. And then you have the corresponding weights and the determinant of the Jacobian. But again, in a boundary condition, all you need to do is to define this term, the, the thing that you want to integrate um, at specific quadrature points. But you will see plenty of examples uh, on, on, on how, to, how to actually do this. Um, this is just uh, an intro or like a spoiler. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the residual, okay, considering that your mesh um, does not depend on your solution itself, I would say that it's only the residual uh, in component I is only. No, it is the same in that case. So your residual in, in that case as well. Your residual only de uh, depends on your solution, which is defined by the expansion coefficient. The basis functions are, or the basis functions don't change anything. So actually, uh, on a, you can cache a lot of uh, basis function evaluations uh, on the fly, a a gradient basis function evaluations, and and so on um, on on reference elements. That's so. I would not. Obviously, your basis functions show up here. So in that sense, uh, it does depend on the basis functions, but that's not something that would change. Uh, during the solution process, whereas your solution will change on during the solution process. Uh, did that did that uh, clear that up? Okay. Okay. Um, I think we can move on. So the next uh, concept that we need to know and that uh, is heavily utilized in Moose is the Newton's is Newton's method. Uh, we have, or most of you probably already heard about this, and this is just a one-dimensional representation. This this is a very efficient root finding algorithm that you can derive using uh, simply a simple ta Taylor expansion. So it will use some sort of gra uh, it, it will use a gradient uh, uh, information to uh, have very good convergence properties. What do I mean by very good convergence properties? Is that when it converges, it converges fast. Um, unfortunately, um, insert if you are very far from the solution, 
uh, you might have convergence uh, problems. But there are obviously remedies uh, to those too. Uh, anyways, but what Newton's uh, what Newton's method says that if we are close enough to the solution, then we converge quadratically. What does quadratic convergence mean? That the number of correct digits in your solution will double every iteration. Very fast convergence. So that's that's why it's uh, that's why it's liked. Uh, that, that's why we like it. Um, and what the, the iteration is uh, goes the following. Let's say that I have a function like this, and I start out at x n, and I would like to find the roots of function f. What does what does it mean to find the root? Well, I would like to find an x where f x is zero. So let's say I start out somewhere. It's an iterative process, so we'll have to start out start somewhere. Let's let's say I start here. Is this a good guess? Well, we'll see. Um, we evaluate our function at this point. We evaluate the derivative of that function at that point. So we have these two guys and use the two together to somehow shoot back onto the x-axis and where it intersects, that's going to be our next uh, um, next guess. All right, so now, now we are here. Now we have to repeat the same thing. We'll compute the function value at this point. We'll compute the derivative of the function at that point and then shoot back at, at, at the x-axis again. And we will get to, we will get to this, um, new intersection and you see that well x n plus one is much closer to the actual root where the blue line uh, intersects with the um, x axis is, is much closer to uh, the x n plus one is much closer to uh, x n and x n plus two is much much closer than x uh, uh, n plus one but um, <clears throat> So this is what I say that when it converges, it, it converges uh, very fast. But uh, um, in Newton's method, we use the derivative information and, um, and the function evaluation to compute not the next guess immediately, but an update, an update for our, our, uh, our solution. And we can use this update to add to the previous iterate to get to the new uh, to the new guess to the, to the new iterate. So this is a two-step process. We solve for the update and then we update. And uh, uh, yes, when it converges, converges it converges very fast. But uh, for example, you can see that hey, what if I if I put my starting guess here, then my uh, derivative will shoot out to somewhere very far, and then I might somehow converge to this this root here. Well, um, th those are some uh, danger dangers. Uh, those are some dangerous territories for the Newton method. But uh, uh, some some um, methods to remedy this problem, uh, you can actually relax or kind of damp the the update, meaning that instead of adding the you you still compute the update here, but instead of adding all of it, you say, hey, how about I multiply this with a number between zero and one, and I only add a part of part of the update. Then instead of this big update here, you will only get to this point. Let's say 0 0.25, you multiply it with 0 0.25, which makes it a little bit uh, more, ro uh, this process more uh, robust. You also have line search methods that I'm not 100% uh, uh, familiar with, but we will not co cover those uh, either. So there are very useful tools to remedy the uh, some the the convergence, some of the convergence issues that you see with the the Newton's method. So how do we use Newton's method in Moose? Well, it turns out that we want to find the roots or one root, the physical root of our residual function. What does it mean? Well, if we have the solution, if we have the solution to our problem, then our residual is actually zero. So that's why we want to find, want to use Newton's method to find the, the roots or the root of our uh, residual function. 
So again, we have n unknowns in uh. Uh is constructed using the basis functions multiplied with uh, by, by the expansion coefficients or the degrees of uh, freedom. And um, we have n equations, which are the n components of our residual vector. Um, and at this point, um, we have to adjust to the new mindset of, of having um, the derivative of a, a vector with respect to multiple uh, multiple um, arguments. So <clears throat> this actually, you can think about this guy having n arguments and we have an n-dimensional n vector. So in this case, the evaluation of the derivative, the first derivative, will be a little bit more complicated. We will actually need a, a Jacobian. Uh, what, does a, what are the entries in this Jacobian? Uh, it's relatively simple. We differentiate the i, i or i j entry of this Jacobian is nothing else but the derivative of uh, the ith component of the of the residual with respect to uh, uj uj expansion coefficient. So this is a parameter or this is a degree of freedom in your approximate solution that you use. This is something that you use to sum up, to multiply the j uh, basic shape function. Um, and other than that, it's, it's uh, more or less the same. We just added a vector uh, notation onto the, the solution. So this is, okay, this is, this vector actually describes the degree, vector of the degrees of freedom. By degrees of freedom, I mean the expansion coefficients in your approximate solution. And you solve for those. So in this case, you already have uh, a linear problem. Uh, th this is already a linear problem. And in this linear problem, um, so these, the, the equations you have in this, or the, the rows that uh, you have in this linear problem are coupled. Why are they coupled? Well, it's because the derivative of the ith term, um, or the ith row, um, so the ith row of um, of the residual uh, will have non-zero derivatives with respect to multiple uh, degrees of freedom, considering that the shape functions, your shape functions, uh, cover more than one element at a time. And so it's it's going to be a coupled system, and um, but luckily since we use a um, if, since we use local shape functions, so localized shape functions, uh, the Jacobian is usually very sparse. So we can use iterative efficient iterative solvers to solve for the update in the degrees of uh, freedom. And once we have uh, an update for the degrees of freedom, we can just uh, check our previous guess. Add the update and get get the new guess and do it until we convert. Yes. Sorry, I have to. Equation ten. Oops. Uh, equation ten. Okay, so we have equation ten. Okay, so the thing that makes this uh, nonlinear is that, okay, in this. In this, it might not be obvious, but let's say K or material properties uh, depend on actual, uh, on the solution. Let's say we have a uh, heat conduction equation where the heat, uh, the thermal conductivity depends on the temperature. That's a very common, that's a very common thing. So in this case, K might depend on UH. Uh, the velocity, or the directing velocity might depend on the solution itself. Uh, we have we might have a source term or a forcing function that might depend on uh, and then uh, this will be nonlinear. If they are not, if they don't depend on, uh, if they don't depend on on the 
solution itself, then uh, it's actually a linear equation. So you don't have to, don't necessarily have to go through the Jacobian steps. You can just use a linear solver directly. It will converge after one iteration. We will, I will walk, I will show you an example. We, we have different solver options and Logan already ran uh, step one. I will take step one at the very end of this session and show you how how the linear and nonlinear iterations behave depending um, on what kind of solvers we use. And at that point, you will see that um, for a linear problem, if we do Newton Newton's method, then it and we do a full update, it should converge in one iteration, one nonlinear iteration. You might still have multiple linear iterations which come in uh, at the solution of this system of the Jacobian when, when we want to update, when we want to get the new update for our, our guess. That's a linear system. So what you will typically see is that we have a nonlinear residual and then we will um, start to solve this problem. So you will see, okay, my my linear solver goes down, 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 my linear solver gives me residuals. It's solving, solving, solving. I have 25 linear iterations and then I convert my linear system. All right, I have my update. So I update my previous guess and I have a new nonlinear iteration. So in every nonlinear iteration, I will have a linear iteration and that's how it will go. But I, I will show you what that looks, uh, what that uh, looks like. Uh, uh, in, in in practice in a, in a little bit. But you're right. If uh, if it's a linear problem, it should converge. That's a very good sanity check. <laughs> uh, it should converge in one iteration. Okay, true. Okay. Okay, Cody pointed out that depending on your um, tolerances, you might not converge in one iteration. So if you set, for example, the linear tolerance to, to something that does not converge to the prescribed nonlinear uh, residual uh, tolerance, then you will have multiple iterations. Yes. Moose supports Move, you can set uh, an option, so you can select uh, Newton, we will some matrix free Newton, and then you can also select linear, which will only do one iteration for you, I think, but it still builds the Jacobian and the residual, so you don't build um, an A and uh, uh, system matrix and uh, right hand side in a conventional sense, you still build the Jacobian and the um, and the residual vector. But for the linear solver, they're direct solver machines. Oh, you mean direct solver by non non like LU? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. For the linear solver. Yeah, I mean if you have yes. Oh yes. Oh, sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question. Yes, we have I most likely misunderstood the question. We do, we do for smaller problems, we have direct solvers, uh, which don't require uh, linear iteration. It will converge in, in one linear iteration. Uh, for example, uh, an LU decomposition based in if you are on one, one core. Um, it, it may not. If it's not distributed, then uh, it will converge in, uh, in one iteration. It might not. In one linear iteration. Anyone so, for me? example, if you have a linear system, completely linear system, and you want to use a direct direct solver for that, you will have one nonlinear iteration and one linear iteration, and that's it. Okay. Uh, we covered this this part. Oh, okay. All right, I will mute myself in a second. Can you even hear me? Hello.
I can hear you. Okay, I can't. Yeah. Okay, people can hear me. All right. Um, it might not converge in one linear iteration if you're doing PGFNK. Because the, yeah, GFNK often is, I mean, it's a finite difference approximation of the Jacobian action. And if the function is sufficiently noisy, then it's not a linear approximation. And so the exact matrix may not actually correspond to the same action that you're getting out of PGFNK. So you could see multiple GM residurations if you're doing LU for PGFNK. Okay, thank, thanks, Alex. Uh, this also gives you a very uh, gives us a very good uh, uh, stepping stone uh, for our next uh, topic, which is the different solvers in uh, in Moose. So what you can see here is that um, some which is something called PJ FNK. So Alex was talking about this. This is a preconditioned Jacobian free uh, Newton crill. The real, um, th this is a, a matrix free. This is a matrix free uh, solver. We also have a non preconditioned version. I don't know if anybody uses this at, at, at this point, but we will see the differences. Uh, we will uh, go through every single option here and uh, check uh, how or what this what the solve um, looks like. And um, we also have a, a Newton's method. In this case, we need uh, the Jacobian, the exact Jacobian. Um, and then we just solve uh, this, this problem here entirely. Um, and FD, if you define FD, you can define all of these options in the executioner block, like solve type, and then you put one of these acronyms there, and then you will get uh, the the defined behavior. FD is a fi um, finite difference uh, uh, approximation for the Jacobian, but the only issue, th there is a big issue um, with this, which is it does, it does not scale very well with the size of the system. So more degrees of freedom you have, the slower it will get. So in most of the cases, this is only used for small systems and for uh, debugging. <clears throat> what this means is that um, you can actually, uh, so one advantage of this though, especially when you debug, is that you can use it to check if you coded, if you hand coded your Jacobian properly based on the coding of your uh, residual. I'm not gonna go into the details of this. It's it's mostly used for debugging. We will only, we will most likely, or, or almost only touch PGFNK and and use them. I think those are the mo most common options here. Okay, so what's uh, Jacobian free uh, Newton Kilov? There, when you have a sparse, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Hmm? Oh, so Vasily, Vasily asked if these these options. Yeah, I always forget to repeat the question. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, so Vasily asked <clears throat> if these options refer to the linear the solution of the linear system, and the answer was yes. Um, so Jacobian free Newton curve method. Um, so when you solve a large linear system, which is sparse, uh, you can use a subspace, subspace uh, based uh, solver and you can build these subspaces differently. So in this case, we use uh, the, the curve subspace, which builds, uh, which needs only the action of the Jacobian to build basis vectors. Um, what you can see here is that uh, the Krilov subspace is actually spanned by uh, vectors that were generated by repeatedly applying uh, or multiplying with the, the Jacobian matrix. 
And it turns out that you don't necessarily need to build the Jacobian matrix itself. It might, it might take a very long time to build the, the Jacobian matrix. You have to allocate memory um, to build it. And for humongous problems, uh, it, it might be a disadvantage. Uh, and you can actually, it turns out that you can actually approximate the action of the Jacobian on a vector. And this is how you approximate it. You can, you can do two residual evaluations with two different vectors. Take the difference of those residual vectors and then divide it by a, a, a number. So this number, so this is a very similar to the to the uh, limit uh, definition of um, of a derivative. Uh, but how we, how can we define this epsilon number here? In in practice, what are the what is this epsilon number? Well, that's uh, handled by Petsy, uh, they have multiple. They have they have a, a couple of ways to determine this this uh, uh, number. So this part, so the the linear solves in Moose are handled by the bottom layer, which is which is Petsy. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, Cody mentioned that uh, they had been they have been working on it for a couple of de decades. Um, yeah, so the every single linear option here uh, is a linear solve here is handled by Petsy. Yes. So just curious on um, the epsilon. Yeah. Do you happen to know if the inside equation for the Julie numbers were, I guess, action approximations or plus they are in one? That's a good question, and I won't be able to answer that. Um, but we have uh, Alex and Roy here. So the question was from uh, Patrick, if Patsy internally uses some sort of a perturbation uh, to determine epsilon based on and, and check what the error is in the estimation of the action. They use a benchmark. So if, if epsilon is in the imaginary model, Oh, if they do imaginary numbers for epsilon, um, that's something I I don't know. I haven't checked Patsy, but can we get Alex in there? I see he unmuted himself. So I've seen other. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I wait. Uh, so Peter, can you hear me? Can the room hear me? Okay. I am getting a thumbs up. Okay. So. We've definitely had other LibMesh applications use that trick of doing a complex perturbation to get uh, a Jacobian action. I don't think you can do it, though, unless you've got a residual that can be evaluated with complex numbers. And LibMesh can do that if it's specially built with like a complex Petsy and uh, complex uh, uh, complex values like standard complex of double instead of double for our uh, number type def, but I don't think there's any way to do that via Moose. Uh, the closest we can do is to do the uh, AD uh, metaphysical dual number at the Moose level, and that's not a complex perturbation. That's using uh, dual numbers, uh, if you've heard of them. As far as uh, selecting the epsilon parameter, uh, Petsy has two methods for selecting epsilon um, and I put it in the slack chat but the the page where you can go to and see what those two options are uh, essentially there's a WP option and a DS option um, but usually the value for epsilon comes out to being or actually the value of epsilon is almost by default is always like 1e to the minus 8 um, but you can also modify that parameter, uh, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Uh, I typically find that for multi-physics simulations, uh, a value closer to like 1e to the minus 5 is better, because typically in multi-physics you don't have very good scaling, uh, and so just perturbing with a factor um, like 1e to the minus 8 is typically too small, because uh, the function can be not scaled very well and um, 
function can be noisy. And so if you just difference by a very small amount, you may not get a good estimate of the derivative. So sometimes you have to bump that factor up. Thank, thanks, Roy, and th thanks, Alex. That was very, that was a very nice explanation. <clears throat> Is there a specific uh, reason why uh, you asked uh, about imaginary perturbation? Not particularly. I've just seen it before, and then oh, okay. doing it that way results in less error and uh, I might get some prosecution. Oh, okay, cool. So, so yeah, if you do the imaginary I learned something new today too. If you do the imaginary um, perturbation, right. you get like so, quadratic uh, convergence there the, instead of um, linear. One of the disadvantages, and I will show it to you guys, is that if if we don't you uh, we need to to make sure that we we scale, we can scale uh, well, we need a preconditioner on a subspace method. Uh, otherwise, the number of linear iterations might might get uh, 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 too large for us to to afford. Um, so that's why we use we, the default in Moose is the preconditioned version of this, where you can approximate the the action of the preconditioned uh, uh, Jacobian like this, uh, or the Jacobian on. Uh, on a, a vector multiplied with a, a preconditioner matrix like that. And uh, if, if you use this, um, you end up with uh, uh, slight, with, with uh, much fewer uh, linear iterations. Um, I forgot to say here with the Jacobian free Newton curve uh, for the Jacobian free Newton curve method that when you want to you then you know that you only want to use this option the only uh, function you need to override in a kernel is uh, the compute QP re residual function. So what does compute QP residual mean? Well, it will compute the, that uh, this term here. Different kernels might have different uh, parts in this, but at, at a quadrature point. So QP is quadrature point. So that's the only function that you have to override in a kernel. And then you, you will be able to use uh, the J, JFNK method. Uh, for the PGFNK method, you have uh, two, more, two more functions in, in the kernel to override to provide uh, a good guess for, um, so a, a good preconditioner. Um, you can use compute QP, uh, Jacobian QP, compute uh, QP of diagonal Jacobian. Uh, this will construct whatever you put in there, the code will use to construct uh, a Jacobian. If you did not define your Jacobian perfectly, it will compute a, an approximate Jacobian, and we will use that for the preconditioning. Um, so that's, that's not, if, uh, that's uh, but if you know your Jacobian entirely, then you can just do uh, that. Then, then uh, you that's that's the best solution. But uh, you don't have to have your precise exact Jacobian for this method. And uh, for the Newton method, you have to compute traditionally, you have to compute, uh, you have to provide uh, the ex the exact expression for the Jacobian as well to make sure that we can compute the exact Jacobian for the new, for Newton's method. And the, the functions that you have to override in kernels uh, are exactly the same. It's compute QP Jacobian and Q, compute QP of diagonal Jacobian. Uh, the of diagonal for the Jacobian is uh, for, for coupling uh, purposes. I, um, so here's a little summary. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This just uh, recaps what we've been trying to do. We, we have been trying to approximate our solution uh, function in our partial different for our partial differential equation. We uh, approximated by uh, a, a, linear, a linear combination 
of uh, basic or shape functions, and we will try to uh, try to compute the expansion coefficient in this linear uh, com expansion coefficients in this linear com combination. And uh, to do this, we have to evaluate. Uh, we have to create our weak form, and we have to evaluate the integrals in our uh, weak form. And for that, we use uh, uh, numerical quadrature rules. Once we have our discretized system, uh, we can use uh, a Newton's method to get if it's a nonlinear system, uh, which in most of the cases, most real world applications are nonlinear. Um, and Moose uses Newton's method to resolve this nonlinearity. And uh, within every single nonlinear iteration, we need to solve a linear system. And for that, uh, we use either uh, Newton's method directly or some matrix free method like uh, the Jacobian free New Newton Krillup. And uh, there, I think five or six years ago, um, there was a, a breakthrough in terms of um, you how, how to say this in use of uh, uh, application the decrease in application uh, development time with which came uh, on the back of the introduction of um, an automatic differentiation system uh, in Moose. Uh, Moose uses the metaphysical uh, package to libmesh um, to do the automatic differentiation. And in this case, you only have to provide in, in an AD kernel, which is AD stands for automatic differentiation. In an AD kernel, you only need to provide the um, uh, evaluate or compute QP uh, residual function. Based on the residual, it will be auto, it will be able to compute the Jacobian automatically, which is a very, a very big step, considering that as far as I know before that, most of the user errors or mo most of the issues came from the wrong definition of Jacobians. And def defining Jacobians manually it, for very complex problems is not 100% obvious and can be really challenging. And some things are not even possible without the automatic differentiation. Yes. Yes, for for if you have the perfect Jacobian, well, depending on if you are memory constrained or not, you might still elect to do matrix free, but AD will give you a perfect Jacobian, so a, a simple Newton iteration or a Newton iteration is the most efficient, I think, in that case. Mm. But a little bit of a warning, AD, for certain applications might come with a little bit of an overhead, but because of the perfect definition of the Jacobian, it might also uh, result in computational time savings. It, it depends on your, your application. Um, this is covered here. So I think the new strategy here, or the thing that's uh, emphasized on this slide is that uh, at the moment we recommend everybody um, write um, write AD kernels. It's much easier, much shorter on development time. It's a much shorter development time, and uh, it's much more fail safe. If you see too much of an overhead, then you might you can start thinking about uh, writing your own Jacobians. But manually computing Jacobians can be uh, pain painful. And I will show you, I will show you why. So <clears throat> we will get back to the same uh, advection diffusion problem in a minute, but we have uh, just a few things here to that we will need for the manual computation of our for our Jacobian for that case, which is the derivative of my approximate function with respect to a degree of freedom. Uh, at a specific location is nothing else but the value of the corresponding basis function at that at that location. 
and it's the same for the gradient. Um, it's a linear operator, so I I just take the gradient of my uh, basis function at that uh, the corresponding basis function at that uh, location. Okay, so back to the um, advection diffusion uh, problem. Uh, we've all seen these plenty of times. Uh, we have already seen the the definition of the height component of the Jacobian multiple times. Nothing new there. But here comes the definition of the Jacobian for this problem. So we can use the product rule to expand. We assume here, we assume that um, the diffusivity uh, is a function of our solution. We also assume that um, the velocity is a function of our solution. And for the sake of generality, we say that the, um, that the uh, forcing function is uh, is a function of our solution as well. So in this case, you can expand um, your um, uh, you can use the product rule to create uh, um, your uh, derivative in 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 the material properties uh, times the the gradient of the uh, function, and vice versa. We will have the derivative of our our solution here within this. With respect to the degree of freedom, so uh, in this case, we this will simplify to the, the evaluation of just the shape function or the gradient of the shape corresponding shape function, and it's the same, and is this is the exact same thing here. We just uh, split this into two uh, two terms using the the product rule, and you see that. Even though our problem is relatively simple, we already have set seven terms in, in this Jacobian. And if the functions for K, the, the function that describes the solution dependence of K is, uh, is not obvious, then compute, computing its derivative might not be uh, obvious at all. So building the Jacobian, hand coding the Jacobian can be a serious, uh, a serious issue. And the, we, we've seen a lot of user errors regarding that before automatic differentiation. And you don't have to worry about any of this if you use automatic differentiation. What automatic differentiation does is it uses the chain rule. It computes the, the residual, but it also stores the, the derivatives of that residual with respect to the degree to degrees of uh, uh, freedom. And then at the end, it just combines this information and plugs it back into the uh, Jacobian. Um, okay, so that was uh, more or less uh, it for the theory part. Do you guys have any questions? So AD builds the Jacobian. So AD does not use the functions that you need to override to supply the hand coded Jacobians. AD only uses the compute QP residual and propagates the derivatives and will compute the exact, exact Jacobian. So it does not use finite difference either. Mm. Did, did that answer your question? So it, it, it's not based on finite differencing. There, Alex published a paper on the AD implementation in Moose. Uh, maybe somebody can link that into the chat. It's a very, it's a very nice description. I think the details, uh, the details of automatic differentiation in Moose, are very well uh, described in there. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but it's an interesting concept. Surprisingly, automatic differentiation, well, not surprisingly, but uh, another big application for automatic differentiation is um, in uh, neural networks, where you have to propagate uh, derivatives of errors. OK. Um, so the next step, how much time do I have left? 50. 
15. Oh, okay, 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 okay. No, I think 15 is perfect. So what we are going to do, we will go to the same example, uh, what Logan showed us. That was the question. Oh, quick question, yes. Yeah, so when, when you have, let's say you have two different variables and the material properties depend on the other variable in the first first equation. Then you have to that that coupling will come in in an off diagonal block of the Jacobian, and you will have to put those terms into the off diagonal uh, entries, or you have to code those in the off diagonal Jacobian entries. Whereas if it only depends on the on the solution itself, then you, it can go into the the, the diagonal part. Okay, so what we will do now, do we have any uh, other questions? Okay, so what we will do now is uh, go into Logan's problem, that simple 2D problem, uh, and try different solver options there, just to show you how uh, the code behaves if you define different uh, solver options there. And you can suggest different options, and then I will plug them in, and we'll see if that's what we expected. If we get something that we expected or not. Uh, sometimes during these presentations, uh, we get things that you know kind of surprise us. Uh, hopefully not today. <clears throat> Oops. All right, so I will have to stop sharing for a mo moment and share my whole screen instead of just uh, the window. All right. Okay. I uh, will probably have to increase the size. Oops. It's just not too big. Is this uh, big enough? Yeah, I think there. Okay. Please. So how about that? Looks good, or a bit more? Okay. So I'm in the same uh, directory where Logan Logan was uh, one and a half hours ago. So you can this is Moose tutorials, uh, Darcy, Thermomac, Thermomac, and Step One Diffusion. I already compiled this problem. I already compiled this problem. So I should have uh, the executable. You guys, you guys can follow along, but um, I think it's enough if you just uh, look at my screen at, at this point. So I'm going to open a VS Code here, uh, a window of VS Code here, and then this is exactly the input file that Logan showed us. Um, and the part that we will edit now is the executioner uh, block. How about that? All right, so we will edit the executioner block right now. What you can see is that the default is uh, steady. We have a soft type of Newton. Uh, that means that we actually form uh, the, J the Jacobian matrix. It's not matrix free in this case. And there are two options here that you have the freedom to tune. Uh, these describe the the preconditioning that we use for the for the linear uh, problem. These parameters are actually passed to Patsy and uh, to, to set the right uh, uh, solvers and um, or sol solver parameters. And so what you can see here is that we will use a uh, algebraic multigrid uh, preconditioning. For diffusion problems, it's uh, very, that's a very efficient uh, preconditioning type. But we will play the, with this a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna go to my, Okay, I'm going to go to my little terminal here and try to um, execute this file. Step. 
step one, probably. Step one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. The, then I'm going to navigate to the problems folder. Thank you. I completely forgot. Um, <clears throat> I, I navigate to the problems folder, and then I will hopefully have my input file here if I can uh, spell it properly. And uh, let's say I execute this. Okay, we don't see a lot of things because how about that? Okay, so what this shows you that we needed two nonlinear iterations to converge uh, this problem, which is not nonlinear at this point. Um, so why, why do we see this? Well, Cody already mentioned that our tolerances, our linear tolerances might be uh, too, too uh, high, uh, so we don't converge in one iteration. So what we expect from a linear problem in a nonlinear solve is to converge in one iteration. And we don't see that, so we have to set, we have to make sure that the linear and nonlinear iterations are set in a way that um, that gives us this result. What what do I mean by? I'm I'm not going to tune parameters here. I'm just going to say that I would like to iterate my uh, linear solve to a low enough tolerance or, or low enough error. To make sure that the nonlinear iteration doesn't want to go one more one more step. So the way you can set this is, I think it's a linear linear tool, and it's set to one e minus five right now. Uh, and I claim if I set this to one e minus ten, it will auto format. It will call. It will do only one iteration. And let's hope I'm right. So you can tune the nonlinear tolerances and the linear tolerances in the executioner block as well. Um, if you have the autocomplete and you spread and you press control space, you will have a full list of available parameters that you can set. You see that we have lots of them. Uh, some of them touch the nonlinear uh, tolerance. Some of them touch the linear tolerance. Some of them are at the uh, uh, fixed point, you will hear a little bit more about fixed point iteration, but you can set fixed point tolerances there too. Anyways, but uh, this is everything we needed. Uh, hopefully it will give us the result that we were looking for. Oh, all right. So we have, um, now that we converged the, um, convert our solution, the, our linear uh, problem to a low enough uh, tolerance, we only, we only see uh, one nonlinear iteration. Okay, so one more thing that we have here is that we have um, eight linear iterations. So we are using a, a sub, subspace method to solve the linear uh, problem. Can we do or subspace method with um, the AMG preconditioning, which is pretty good. Eight linear iterations are not very bad, but Let's say we have a small problem. Can we do better than this? And the answer is yes. We need to use. We can use a, a direct solver for preconditioning, and for that you will have to adjust these two parameters. So a direct solver, which is commonly used in Moose, is based on the LU precondition, uh, LU decomposition used for preconditioning. So if you have this, oh, that was a bad idea. I can save these for later. How about I save these for later? And then, oh, yeah, yeah. And then just um, rewrite these guys. Uh, so, for that, to define that um, direct solver, I can just do this. And I probably have to, I think it was like that. OK, so what do we expect at this point? I think we expect to have only one uh, linear iteration. Let's check uh, instead of eight. There we go. Um, so this is as low as we can get uh, in terms of uh, nonlinear and uh, for, for, a, for a linear problem, a small enough linear problem in terms of linear and nonlinear uh, iterations. All right, one thing that I want to show you is the, I'm not going to use LU, I'm just going to restore the original 
well, if I can hit the buttons properly. Um, I'm just going to reuse the uh, original options. And instead of Newton, I'm going to use a matrix free version. So PJFNK. Uh, oh, wait. First, I'm going to use JFNK. So I'm not going to use any precondition. So the, this might not mean anything at this point. So I expect a lot of linear iterations, subspace solvers without preconditionings, preconditioning are, are not that great. Uh, it converges, good news, but uh, it takes us a very long time, like uh, eight, 750, 749 iterations, which is not, not the greatest. Yeah, I know, but uh, I mean, the I'm I'm not going to move my basis of comparison uh, at this point. That's okay. Yeah, that's true. But if you need to have a lot of linear iterations to actually get to a certain tolerance, then it it costs a lot more computational time, right? So you want to keep the number of linear iterations as low as you can. And that for a subspace solver, you can do that uh, by using an efficient preconditioner. And I'm just going to add uh, P there uh, to do uh, P, J, F, and K instead of J, F, and K. And okay, let's, let's say we got 400 and uh, 749, I clear this. Let's let's see what it does with the preconditioner. Well, it does pretty well with the preconditioner, so we only have eight uh, for the same tolerances, for the same tolerance. So, I think this is a this can be a lesson learned that always always use a good, good preconditioner when it's available. It can simplify your life a lot. Uh, what else do we have? I'm going to go back to the one. Uh, do I have maybe like two, three more minutes? Okay, so I'm going to go back to the one one iteration problem here. So it was Newton. Um, okay, so I have the one iteration problem here. And what I want to show you is that it's one iteration if I use the full Newton update. However, in certain cases, uh, taking the full Newton update might take us to uh, a completely different, uh, like, a completely different place, completely unphysical place of the domain. So, new and then which might result reside in convergence issues with uh, Newton's method. Uh, besides, besides doing the line, besides doing line search for these, you can actually uh, damp. We have okay, there are damp the Newton update. There are two ways to do this. We have a damping dedicated damping system in Moose. I'm not going to go into those details, but you can also damp it through Petsy. Uh, the way you do this is, uh, oops. By using uh, SNES uh, line search damping, and then you can give a value between, which should be uh, between, or I'm not 100% sure if they check the parameter errors, at least for parameter errors, but I think it should be between uh, zero and one. Uh, so let's do half, half of the Newton update every single step. Um, this will result if everything is what we expect. It will re result uh, many many Newton uh, steps. So it um, it is twenty seven. It gave us twenty seven uh, nonlinear iterations, and the the closer this guy gets to uh, one, the lower the iteration number uh, is. Um, so. It, the closer this is to one, the faster you will converge, but the more susceptible um, your iteration is to convergence problems. So by decreasing this number, you increase robustness. 
And that's more or less uh, everything I wanted to say about this topic. We have a question there. Uh, what do you mean by all these methods like uh, them if you need them? I mean, so you're asking which one should be faster? Yes. Okay. Well, it's a very it's it's hard to compare, right? Because PGFNK needs only two residual evaluations, which is not bad, but at the same time, it might not give you a good enough estimation of the Jacobian, so you might need to do it multiple times. So I think it's it's it can be problem dependent. Uh, which, which one is which one is better? And it also depends on your available uh, resources. If you don't have enough memory, you might not want to store the Jacobian. So I think it's a, a multi multi factor multi factor um, optimization depending on your resources and how accurately and also de depends on how accurately you can precondition your your uh, Jacobian. Like if you provided Okay, there, there. Somebody, somebody raised uh, a hand. Alex. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. Um, I would say that if you have the memory for it, um, I'd pretty much always use Newton instead of PGFNK. Uh, and if you have an accurate matrix, um, GM Res will require. I mean, PGFNK will require a function evaluation. Uh, for every linear iteration, uh, whereas Newton, you don't have any of those callbacks. Um, and then also using Newton, for example, um, you don't have any issues with a, essentially if the function is noisy, um, if you have like a multi physics problem and you're finding a difference in a noisy function, you may not get a good uh, Newton step from PGFNK. Um, so if you use Newton, you erase that concern. Uh, and then finally, um, if you do want to explore um, GPU preconditioning and solving, uh, Newton is better disposed for that in a lot of ways than PGF and K. Um, from my understanding, that's uh, a lot of the PETC development has been focused more on uh, pure Newton. Um, so I have been graced with the privilege of talking about C++ for a little while. Which I know for some people can be kind of annoying and concerning. So for that, I'm sorry. Sorry for everyone if that was sounded awful for a second. Like I said, yeah. So I, I've I've been graced with talking about C for a little while. So historically, most of this training has been, or it's been reasonably developer centric, um, but in the last few years. We've gotten a lot better at documentation that doesn't pertain directly with code about input parameters and input syntax and all of that, almost to the point where we include so many so so many objects in the framework and the physics modules that you could almost get away with using Moose for a lot of things without ever touching any code. But it's still important to kind of talk about the basing building blocks of Moose because the intention is still for it to be a framework that makes it easy for you to develop and create your own physics modules or materials or kernels or outputs or everything like that. So we still have to touch on C++ a little bit. Um, I'm just kind of going to talk about why we use C++, static typing, templating in C++, because it's kind of important in Moose. So really just the basic building blocks and what we use in Moose for C++ so that later when we talk about some basic Moose objects, you can have some context as to how they work without knowing how to write a ton of C++. Again, the hope is for the average developer that needs to contribute to Moose, creating their own application, is to not have to write that much code. A lot of it is boilerplate, fill in a few lines here to represent your mod models, couple in a variable, couple in an extra material with a few other lines of code. 
But with that, you need some basic understanding. So with that, I'm going to continue on to talking about C++. Let's go away. All right. So for starters, data types in C++. So C++ is a static typed language, which means that you as a user must specify what kind of data you want to represent. And here, these are the very basic types in C++. And if you look around in the Moose documentation for parameters for objects, you'll see things like a vector of float or a vector of double. That is just a vector of numbers. These are types that need to be known about to some extent, even if you're not a developer, because you'll see them in parameters. And lastly, void is the anti-data type. If you develop a function or a method in C++, it, every, every function must have a return type. Um, void simply specifies nothing. Operators. You have the standard operators that you would see in most languages like MATLAB or Python. You have some things like plus equals, which imply adding a value to something. You have the standard comparison operators, rocket ship, less than, greater than, equals. Um, assignment is done with the equals operator. Very important one is member access. If you have an object and you want to call a method on that object, whether or not it is an object, a reference, or a pointer, which we'll get into a little while, you access those with the arrow or the dot operator. Curly braces. Curly braces are used to group things together. Um, that could be defining a new scope, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It could be defining um, a method or a function. It could be defining a class. But in general, curly braces are used to enclose something somehow. You could, of course, generate lots of composite mathematical expressions in different ways. Like in the example, the first example, um, D++ will increment the value of D by one. So you're dividing by D, additional value of one. Um, standard order of operations, operate parentheses first, all of that fun mumbo jumbo. Um, you can also generate all kinds of com crazy composite Boolean expressions. Now, it's important to note that short circuiting does exist in C++, which means that if, for example, in the case where you have, if A and B and the result of F, um, if A does not evaluate to true, you could short circuit and immediately exit that if statement. Scope resolution operator. So we also have namespaces within C++. C++. So in the first case, um, std colon colon. std is the standard algorithms library in C++. So that is calling the method or the function within the namespace of std called pow which happens to be the method for um, taking the value of r and squaring it in this case, so r to the power of two. Same thing with square root as you see below that. Now dot and point, pointer operators. Um, this is incredibly important. Whether or not you understand or fully follow the difference between pointers and references and objects in C++, what's important to note here is that you have an object or a pointer to an object the dot and the star operator star operator will call a method on that object. So for example, the first case t equals my obj dot some function is calling the function or method on my object. Below it is equivalent, but we're calling it on a pointer, which I've kind of decided for the most part, I'm not going to discuss too much in this presentation because as I looked further on to a lot of our source content, um, What's important to know here is that we're calling a method on something. In Moose, we really want to make it where you don't have to deal with memory management too much, because that's typically one of the biggest burdens in C++, although they made it a lot better. So what's to carry away from this is that we are simply calling a function on an object in some way or another. Typecasting. So as we said previously, C++ is statically typed, which means that you as a user or developer must define how you want something to be represented. So in the first example, a float, which is a floating point number, 
we're calling the, the variable pi and we're setting it equal to 3.14. Now that is creating a floating point number with the value 3.14 dot 3.140000, maybe not necessarily, but it's a floating point number. Now on the bottom, we have a static cast. Now that is actually doing a type conversion on a floating point number. So however the C++ standard defines how to convert a floating point number to an integer, that is the guarantee that you get there. So this will actually get you a value called approx pi that should be three. Hopefully. That's pretty well guaranteed by the standard. So limits to typecasting. So if you're familiar with working in Python, you know you can kind of get away with like making some weird equals operators and things. Now, the top example here, what the parentheses float does, the second parentheses float, is that it's trying to cast the string of 3.14 to a floating point number. That just won't work. That is not a valid casting in C++. Now there's ways you can get around this. You can try to convert it in other ways, but that directly is not supported. Now, in the second case, where we say be careful with your assumptions. So uns uns unsigned integer has a valid range. It is an unsigned integer, which means it doesn't have a sign, so it's always positive, and it has a value from zero to what, like, like eight, e to the 16, e to the 14. Anyway, there is a fixed, there's a fixed, um, there's a fixed number of bytes that you can use to store a, a value. So if you think about it, the range of unsigned integer is zero to some value. The range of integer is half of that unsigned integer value, but with a sign on it, so negative to positive. So trying to cast a really, really big number to an integer might not work. What we're trying to get at here is that typing in C++ is very powerful and explicit, but when you try to do, you could still do very dirty things with explicit definitions that you don't really, don't make assumptions is what we're getting at here. Control statements, you have the standard for loops that you would see in most languages. Um, while loops keep continuing doing something until the Boolean expression evaluates to false. Do is very similar in that case. If, else, if, else, all the standard statements that you would see in a lot of languages. Keep in mind there, though, the scope. You have break or brackets around everything, the curly braces. Um, brackets are weirdly not required for one-line statements for most things, but for multi-line statements, they are required. Um, Let's see. Yeah. So down to kind of something that's a little bit higher level that will hopefully help with how we start defining all of our objects. So in C++ in general, you split code into headers and bodies. And generally speaking, what you define in a header is the signature of methods. That is, I have a function called this that takes these arguments and returns a value but you don't actually define what that function does in the header. You can, but generally speaking, we do not do that. There's reasons why you should and why you should not, but in general, you declare how methods and functions and classes work in headers, and then in the source files, which end in .c, you actually define what the contents of the classes and the functions and the meat of the function, what it actually does. So here's a few examples on how we declare functions in C++. So a free function is a function that doesn't belong to a class, doesn't belong to an object. It, it's not, not considered a method. We consider methods to be functions on classes in C++. So the first example is a function called function name that takes two parameters, one of type type one, one of type type two, and returns something called of type return type. Those are the same types that we talked about. Now, they could be the very basic types in C++ that we talked about, like bools or integers or unsigned integers or strings. Or they can also be more complex types, like classes or like kernels and moose. Um, but it's generally 
classes or basic types. Now, the second example is a declaration that belongs to a class. Now, we haven't really talked about classes yet in Moose, so it'll get a little more important as time comes on. But in general, the majority of objects that you see in Moose when you create an input file where you say type equals something, that something is a class in C++. There's a direct relationship between it. So in this case, we have a class that's called class name. And we have a method on that class called method name that does something. Now, the distinction between, as we said earlier, declarations and definitions. Declarations describe the signature of the method, as we called it. Definitions actually describe what they do. So in this case, if you look back in the declaration, we don't have a scope after the function itself or the method. It just says what the signature of the function is. And this typically goes, as we said, in the header file. Now in the source file or the body, which is the file that ends in .c, is typically where we specify the definitions. So statements here would be the meat of the function. What does it actually do? And it will return a value at some point of type return type as we have specified here. So again, reasonably important. Return type, which comes before the function name is the type of thing that gets returned by that function. And again, this can be void, as I said earlier, and void is a function, void is a return type that is specially used for nothing. Now there's a bunch of other old content here about like dynamic linking and LDD, and we just got rid of all that because it's just way too much. We're supposed to make life easy here. Um, so as you've seen so far, when I first got up here and ran step step one, um, before doing anything, I ran make. Now, as Cody said earlier, hopefully none of you have ever had to see a make file. There's like only a few of us that want to even look at them here, and we don't really even want to. But we do all the hard work for you, and that comes with your applications. Um, if you follow the process on the website to stork an application, as we call it, which generates an application of your own, we automate the majority of having to deal with compiling your application. And that is run through make and our extensive work that we've done in our make process. And this, like I said, is similar for all Moose applications, unless you really want to do things your own way, in which case we'll support you as best we can. OK. So C++ scope, memory, and overloading. There's some context in here, like I said, about pointers and references, which I'm going to glance over because I don't find it to be as important for what we're doing. Overloading is reasonably important for what we're going to do later. <clears throat> so as we said previously, we have curly braces, and they define some region of scope. So a scope anything that is declared within that scope that is a variable it has scope until it, it's alive until scope is exited so if you define a variable within a curly brace c++ will manage that memory for you and destruct it and free it once scope leaves global variables are variables that are declared outside of any scope whatsoever which in general, in Moose, we don't recommend you use. You shouldn't need to for the majority of things that you're doing, except for a few cases. <clears throat> like I alluded to, variables have a limited lifetime when they're in scope. So the way that C++ manages this is that every type, class, and so on, everything has a constructor and a destructor. And the constructor tells the compiler how to initialize all the memory on that object, and the destructor tells you how to destroy it. C++ manages all of this for you. Um, it's, generally speaking, just an important quality to know. Um, you'll get warnings from the compiler if you do things wrong here that are typically worth reading into. Um, we recommend turning on all of the warnings and errors that you possibly can, because 
someone who's a lot better at development than you wrote those errors and warnings for pretty good reason usually. Scope resolution operator. So as we said earlier when we were talking about STD POW and STD um, square root, the double colon refers to something inside of a scope. So for example, here where we have a function definition or a method called my method on the object, my object. So my object colon colon that enters you in the scope of that object. And this I believe is the part that I was going to skip. Yep. Sorry for running through everything. Yep, this is what we're skipping. Okay, so at this point we've talked about classes, um, scopes, different types, the importance of types in C++, function definitions, function declarations. We're almost at the point where we can look at a simple moose object and understand what we see in its source within a few lines, hopefully. As I said previously, um, C++ is a statically typed language. Uh, what do we get from this compared to languages like Python and MATLAB where typing is dynamic? Um, first of all, safety. Um, as I alluded to, our compilers that we use to compile your C++ code into machine code are really good at analyzing what you wrote, like really, really, really good at it. And usually if you try to trick the compiler, you're probably going to make things slower historically. So first, it it allows our compiler to understand and get the intent of what we're doing a lot better. And because of that, they can optimize really, really, really well. Um, more so, like I said, that if you're trying to trick the compiler or try to do something, the odds are that it, it might make it worse because you're confusing the compiler and the compiler doesn't know what you're doing. It can't learn your intent. Um, lastly, documentation. If I tell you, if I if I tell you you have an object and have some method on it that has a return type of void, I can tell that it's not returning anything. If I give you a function in Python that is just like def some method, you can't immediately tell if it's going to return anything or not unless you look through the whole meat of the function or if someone documented it and hopefully wrote the right document for it. This actually enforces quite a bit more. And this goes back to C++ and the compiler being really, really good. The more the information the compiler knows at compile time, the more it can help you. Now cons, casting is kind of difficult. Um, because you have to be so explicit, changing around types can be a bit of a pain. Now, the good news is that in Moose, we make this pretty easy for you. Um, and it's not a huge concern for the majority of people. Lastly, abstraction. Um, you can enable a ton of abstraction in Moose, but what you'll see in a little bit with some templated code that we explain. Um, abstraction is really, really good because it's super powerful, but it's also can be very painful to understand and read. Um, so there's a fine line between generalization and abstraction and more functional programming, which is where you just kind of write everything explicitly, don't really care about code reuse, and just get something that gets the job done. Now, of course, Moose is a framework, so our goal is to abstract things away for you, generalize things such that they work for things that we wouldn't anticipate that might work for something new in a year. And there's a cost to that. Um, there is some computational cost to that, and there is some developer cost to that. Um, so there's a very delicate balance between both of these things. And with that, I go through to one of the more complex abstractions to a lot of people that see C++ for the first time. So as we said, C++ is statically typed, which means that things must have explicit types whenever you define methods for them or functions to act on those types. Now, let's say 
you write code that has that uses unsigned integers, that is values that are cannot be negative, so all positive and zero, or and also integers, which is negative and positive. Now you want to write some function that gets the maximum between two of those values. So okay, you write a function called get max that takes two unsigned integers. And it works, but then you want to go do the same thing for two signed integers. Well, you can write two functions that do the same exact thing. They just have different types, or you can use a template. And that's what this is right here. Is we have this odd line at the very the first line that is template class T. Now that is saying I want a template for a function that takes an arbitrary class that we call T. So this function can be instantiated so defined for any class where that logic is valid. So if you were to replace T everywhere with integer or T everywhere with unsigned integer, this is valid code. For both those types, I can tell you if A is greater than B. So what templating allows you to do is, as the name would imply, make a template for a function or a method or doing something or a template for a class. This isn't necessarily only for functions. You can have a class that is templated, as we'll see in a little bit, as we do to simplify our lives for creating things that work with automatic differentiation and things that do not. So um, this can be a little bit daunting at first, but we will see an example of something like this in the framework pretty soon. <clears throat> So here's another example of that get max function that we just said. Can you actually see my cursor? Not oh, kind of. So we have the same get max function that we had here. This is the ternary operator, which means that in this case, we evaluate this function or this, this statement. If the statement returns true, we do the first thing. If the statement returns false, we do the second thing. Sorry, that's probably not that easy to see in here. So it's the same function, it's just shorter, so it can fit on one slide easily. So we have two different types here. We have integers and we have floats. We define some integers, we define some floats. Now we can call get max, that same function, for both the floats and the integers. The last case is an explicit call. So if you look at the first function call, that is k equals get max. The compiler will look at all of the different templates that you have and try to guess the best case for you if it's if it's not very implicit. Now the last case, get max with the brackets and integer means that I want to call that get max function explicitly with the class of integer, so it'll actually take. It'll, it'll use the specific function signature, the specific function that works with only integers. What can I do for you? Uh, if the types are different, yeah, it shouldn't compile. <laughs> yeah. The question what ha was what happens if you mix it up? Um, that is, if you mix up the types of things that you pass into the function, right? Um, that will actually work because the compiler knows how to cast a float to an integer. But if you do something like get max integer and pass in. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So some will work, some will not. And this is kind of one of the frustrating things, right? Is it's kind of hard to follow. It would work for a string, but the question is if you pass in like floats as strings, it wouldn't work. If you pass in git max stood string and then pass in floats, it'll die horribly, right? Because it can't cast a float to a string. So the, the big news here, the big thing here is that there's explicit and implicit nature in C++ where 
if the compiler thinks it has enough information to try to figure out what to call for you, it will. And if it doesn't, it'll error and usually give you a good error message. I know, I know, I know, I know. So template specialization. Um, so in the top case here, we want to be able to print a value to string or to, to the stream, so to your screen. Don't worry about what the double bracket bracket operator is or what std c out is. Basically, std c out bracket bracket value bracket bracket std end end l prints value to the screen. And we want a function that does that. We want it to work with multiple different values, right? So that is a generic template at the top that can work and instantiate it however you want. But below, we have what we call as a specialization, which means that for this specific type of bool, I don't want you to use the thing above it. I want you to use this instead. I'm not going to worry about that one. <clears throat> okay, templates. Yeah, what's up? Okay. Yeah. No, not a specific type of bool, for bool, right? So if the type is bool, do, you're going to do the second thing instead. For any other type that supports, that will compile valid C++ with, with this call, do this. Now, of course, if you try to put something in here that doesn't compile, it'll just die horribly and will also give you a compiler error. Yeah, I mean, it's we did, we like to use the question was, is it similar to overloading? We kind of like to use the name overload for like a method on a class. It's probably the most common way of doing that. The name template specialization means something very, very explicit. So I just prefer to say template specialization. You could kind of call it template overloading, but there's so much terminology here that I've learned that it's better to just stick to the words that you see all over the books and in and, and literature and on cppreference.com. What are you thinking, Cody? Yeah, just call it call it template specialization. <laughs> <clears throat> Lastly, the C++ standard library. Okay, so we talked about things like STD POW and all of that. Well, what's even more important with the standard library is a collection of containers for storing things. Um, if you look around at an object on the framework website and it takes a parameter of type STD vector float, uh, this is our most common container for creating a vector of anything is STD vector. So when you see STD vector of float, that is a vector of floating point values. That is a vector of values where we can store, you know. Yeah, yeah, correct. Array might be more common, yeah. Oh, geez. OK. So lastly, which is kind of the meat in how we develop Moose is classes and object oriented programming. <clears throat> So think of a class in C++ as a data type that just has more things to it. It can own other pieces of data. It can have methods on it that do things with data that it owns. Um, think of it as a blueprint, though, because you can create. Once you have a class, you can create as many instantiations of that class as you want. Now, we'll also refer to something as an interface, which Cody was talking about APIs earlier. But in general, an interface is the things that a class exposes of itself. That is, it can have a bunch of inner workings for doing complicated logic that it wants to abstract away from the user so you never have to see it. You don't see those as a developer. What we care about are the public available methods and members, the public functions that are available to a class. <clears throat> And we'll also refer to an instantiation of a class or an instance of a class as a variable of one of those classes or an object. 
So the kernels that you were thinking of earlier, if you have type equals for a kernel, that is one kernel object in Moose, which represents an actual object in C++. So kind of the big goal to Moose and how this all works is that instead of changing data around, you manipulate objects that have defined interfaces. You can think of this as how we had a Dirichlet boundary condition where we had changed the value of it. Well, the interface to that object is supported through the input syntax. <clears throat> Importantly as well is that is the concept of data encapsulation. Um, which means that your object should be able to be able for the most part to be black boxes as long as you follow the interface that we give you. Now, a black box example, if you were talking about earlier, is if you develop a kernel that needs to return a residual evaluation, that residual evaluation is a black box. But you define that residual evaluation through a method with a certain signature that returns a value that we define. <clears throat> with object oriented programming, you also get inheritance, which is you can take a class and create another class that is based on that class. And you could abstract out common things that need to happen for all objects of one type into a lower level class. Because more importantly, this enables code reuse by putting common code in locations that are accessible by all of those objects. So first we're going to talk about encaps encapsulation, which is kind of how to separate out, how to make things private. What do I mean by private? The private means private something that not other people know about, right? So in this case, we have a class. So think of it as a, a complex type called point. Now, everything that is after public, those are methods that other people can call if they create a point. They can get the X value, they can set the X value. They can construct or create a point with two values. But they cannot actually read or change the actual underlying data in the private section. That means that they can change the X value by calling set X, but they can't actually change underscore X. Important note here, underscore, why underscore? Um, in general, any variables that exist on a class that are member variables, as we call them, in Moose, our standard is to prefix them with an underscore to note them as member variables. That is, they are not temporary variables. They live on that class. They're owned by that class. So what's so important about encapsulation? So what I want you to remember here is that we have two floating point values, underscore X and under point, underscore Y. <clears throat> I'm not gonna go to that. So we showed the header file for our example point class. Now we're gonna go to the source file, or I think we also call it the body file. So ins and dot C. So this is how we actually do things with those methods, how we define what they do. <clears throat> so these methods are how the user interfaces with a point. So if I create a point, I can get its X value, I can get its Y value. Now the data is encapsulated. Again, because the, the user who uses a point cannot change the value of, of underscore X directly. They can change it to the method called set X. So why do we care about encapsulation? Well, let's say later down the road, we want to change internally how we define these two, the X value and the Y value, because we found a better, more optimal way to do it. But we don't want the code that you wrote six years ago to not work anymore. So what we're going to do instead is we have the same exact public interface. We have get X, get Y, set X, and set Y. But instead, the underlying thing where the coordinate is stored is in a vector instead. 
Now, from an optimization standpoint, this is a really bad thing to do, but it doesn't matter. It's besides the point here. So what matters is that we change the private interface or we change the private workings of this class, but your code that called on these methods still works because we change the public interfaces, but the public interfaces still have the same signature. That is, they still have the same names, they still return the same types, they, have the, they still take the same input parameters or function parameters. So what does this get us like at a larger scale at Moose? Or Moose? Well, if we define a really good interface for you to define a kernel, we can make Moose better and faster under the hood without it ever affecting your code. You just get that for free because you use the right public interface that hopefully we develop properly the first time, which usually isn't the case, but that's the hope, right? <clears throat> um, and this just kind of shows how you would use that point class. So P1, we're going to construct a point with values one with x value one, y value two. Point two is the same way, just with a different syntax. Point three uses a default constructor, which the compiler will give you if it's supported. Doesn't really matter here. And then the STDC out will show you how we interact with those classes. And again, these are those public interfaces that hopefully you never have to change. I'm not going to go into operator overloading. OK. So we're going to do a more exa advanced example of object-oriented programming that is more relevant to what we do in Moose. This is kind of like one of those standard examples that you see in OOP, object-oriented programming, right? So you see shapes. You see like an animal where you're, instead you have like, what is an animal? You have a cat or a dog. Get in that in a second. So what we have here is we have a new class called shape. It's public interface is what? Well, from a shape, what things do we care about? Um, we want to know the area of the shape. We want to know where the shape is because the shape has a, a defined centroid that we define as X and Y. Now, of course, you can have a triangle or a circle or a square. And the centroid is common to all of those shapes. And by common, I mean they all have a centroid. It makes sense to define a centroid for all of them. Same thing with an area. That's all valid for all of them. <clears throat> now, the destructor, I'm actually not even going to worry about here. It's not a big deal. We'll deal with that later. But what is important is we have a method called area. Everything good? <laughs> we have a method called area that returns a floating point value. But it says virtual in front of it. What does that mean? That is object-oriented programming in a nutshell. That means that that method can be overridden by a derived class of shape. Think about a circle. Well, the way that you define an area for a circle is different from how you just define it from a square or a triangle, right? But what's even more important is that if we create one of these derived types, like a triangle, we can actually present it as still just a shape meaning we can construct a triangle, but we can still act on it as if it was just a shape. And what that virtual method lets you do is that you can create a triangle, make it look like a shape, but still get the area of the triangle in its simplest form. Lastly, pure virtual. You might see this in Moose sum. You see virtual sum signature and equals zero. Pure virtual means that that function must be defined and overridden in any derived classes. Because if you think about it, it doesn't make sense to define a shape that doesn't have an area. That is, it is vital if you have a shape to be able to get its area. Something similar here is that if you define a kernel in Moose, it is vital for you to be able to describe how to compute the residual for that object. 
if you can't compute the residual, it doesn't make sense. So the pure virtual descriptor allows you to, to, to put more intent in your code to tell the developers that use this later on that you have to override this, otherwise it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to have a different shape. Now, one thing to note here, for a while we've been talking about header files and source files slash body files and like definitions and declarations. You can define things in headers, it's okay. We just typically don't in a lot of cases, but for the purposes of this training, all you need to know is that it works, because then you can kind of read some of the stuff that we do. <clears throat> so here, we have a class called rectangle, but then there's this weird thing that is colon public shape after it. Now what that means is that the class rectangle derives from the class shape. And the public means that all public methods that were on the shape, that is the area or print position, um, those functions are also public in the rectangle. So what changes with a rectangle? Well, we now have a width and a height. So the constructor, that is how you create a rectangle, has changed. It takes in a width and a height. And then optionally, also with default values of zero, a centroid. So what's up? Yeah. That's a great, so by default, anything that is derived as public, the protected methods on that class that you derive from become private in your class. Oh no, no, become protected in your class. So public, I'm sorry, public from parent class to public of derived class, protected from parent class to protected of of derived class, and you can never see the, the private members. And there's no way around that. Well, you can like super really, really badly like divert to like using C instead of C++ and like tear away all of like the wonderful guarantees that C++ gives you. But the good news is that if you make something private in a in a class, that's you, that's you declaring, hey, you shouldn't use this. And even better, if you go try to contribute code to Moose that uses something private of another class by doing some god awful hackery C casting awful stuff, it'll be really, really obvious to a code reviewer to say, hey, you definitely can't do that. Sorry. So that's kind of the whole point. Now you can also have a protected um, inheritance. So if this was class rectangle protected shape, um, the public methods of that class go to protected in your class which means that people can't access the public things from shape in your rectangle. So this paradigm is pretty well defined in, in this world. Yep, friend is dirty, but yes. We typically just don't tell people about that. We just hope they never learn about it. <clears throat> so also we kind of did something really bad here that I don't like. <clears throat> So in the constructor of rectangle, which is this code block up here, like I said, we now take a width and a height because we need to know those as well. Now, if you see here, there's there's this weird listing after the colon. Well, the first thing you list, and this is called the initializer list, is how to construct the things that you derive from. So rectangle derives from shape. So we need to know first how to construct the underlying shape. So we just pass our X and Y values to shape. And we now have a width and a height. We're also going to initialize those with the width and the height that we were given. And we have including protected members. Now, while they're protected and not private, I don't know. That's a whole different story. Um, this destructor, it's reasonably important. What I can tell you is that in order for object-oriented programming to work for these, they need to have a virtual destructor. But that doesn't matter. For the, for the purposes of what code we're showing you later, we're not going to focus on that. 
What is important is that we have a new area, so virtual float area. So of course we know we know how to compute the area of the rectangle because we have its width and its height, right? Now something that I don't like is that you'll see this around a moose is that typically we would have in between these two symbols in here, we would typically have a keyword called override. And what that override does is it says that to the compiler, I am writing this method to override something in my parent. That's not required, but why it's important is that for some reason, if the method in the parent later on gets renamed to something else, this is still valid C++ for your rectangle. The area, you're not overriding the shape's area anymore. You're just declaring a new method called area that other people can override from you. That override keyword tells the compiler, hey, if you don't see me overriding something in a parent, die horribly. And in most cases, if you have enough compiler warnings turned on, if you override something and don't declare it as override, the compiler will tell you to do it. Which is why in Moose, for all of our testing, we enforce all kinds of crazy warnings because we want these things to be as, as, as explicit as possible. Um, the best thing that you could do as a developer is describe as much of your intentions, as many of your intentions as you can in the code itself without comments. Not that comments aren't important, but Describing intent with code itself that the compiler is required to follow is really, really powerful. Okay, lastly, we, we have a circle now. So we have a rectangle and a circle. So a new constructor for the circle, it takes in a value of radius to be initialized, and it has an area that relies on pi r squared. Okay, so. How about we actually use these? So kind of one way that we describe these is that we describe derived classes as something is a blank. That is, usually um, BC is a boundary condition. It's derived from boundary condition. Derived classes are type compatible with their base class. Now what that means is on the first line here, we declare a rectangle with a width and height of three and four. But you can also look at that rectangle as a shape and you can call methods on it as if it was a shape. Now what this lets you do is that you can define your own shape as you want in your code. And you can use our code that acts on shapes without having to change anything. You can create a triangle. You can represent that triangle as a shape, and you can use all of our methods that work that take shapes as, um, as function parameters. Now again, don't focus too much on references and pointers here. Um, <clears throat> I would say what's, what's most important to note here is that this is a way of representing a rectangle as a shape without copying that rectangle. Do I have until 2.15? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you what? Oh, yes, yes, correct, yeah. Yeah, if if you didn't use this ampersand or this or this uh, this this star asterisk, it probably wouldn't work. Maybe for some reason you implemented something did, but yes, that is very important. In most cases, I'll I'll, I'll just say that the ampersand denotes a reference, which is more or less just a a view of something. Yeah, an, an alias of something, that's probably the cleanest way of saying it. Pointer, I don't even want to talk about because I don't want you to use them. You shouldn't really need to in most things that you do in Moose, unless you do other stuff. Um, but essentially, that represents your rectangle to shape. Um, this I don't worry about as much, nor the generic algorithm. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So, actually, there's one thing that I missed in our other shape. Which we never we never defined it, did we? So we also had a method on the shape that is print position. So of course that position is relevant to all shapes. It's a centroid. So we can define it in the shape object itself because we know all the information within the shape as long as we know it's a centroid, which we do because we have the X and Y coordinates. Okay, so writing a generic algorithm. So we define a rectangle called R with a width and height of three and four. And we define a circle with a radius of three at 10, 10 in, in space. Now, print information. Oh, we do do this here. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. So we have a function. I'm going to come down and skip past this. We have a function called print information that takes a shape. Now, what's important there is that we talked a while about like templating and like how those types are really, really, really important. Um, if something cannot be represented as something else, the compiler will fail. And that is like if you create a method that takes in an integer and you pass in a string, the compiler doesn't know how to compare that, how to, how to cast that is what we call it. <clears throat> However, the compiler does know that your rectangle and circle are both shapes. Which means that if you pass in your rectangle or your circle to this function called print information, the compiler knows that it can represent it as a shape. Which means that even though the print information method takes a type that's explicitly a shape, your objects can be represented as a shape without issue. And equivalently, we could call area on your rectangle and circle, or still area on the shape. Oh, no, we do print the area. Never mind. <laughs> so not only do we print the position, but we also print the area. Right? So even though your shape is a shape, even though, I'm sorry, even though your object is not a shape explicitly, it is actually a shape. And that area method, even though it's a pure virtual function, so it's not defined on the shape object itself, we still know through virtual methods to call the right area under the hood. Yeah. Yeah. So like you actually cannot create a shape object on its own. The compiler stops you from that. So the question was, if you pass it a shape, will it die? Well, you can't ever actually construct a shape. Because it has a pure virtual method, the compiler will tell you, I can't do that because you've not declared this method or not defined this method. So that's how I, that's how you get away from that. So what does this actually mean like from a bigger picture? Um, it means that if we create objects in Moose with well-defined interfaces that are easy for you to overload with a few lines of code, we can give you, as a modest developer, a lot of power without having to know a lot of C++. Um, and that's kind of the bread and butter of Moose, is having a ton of pluggable systems that, number one, are well documented. Number two, we just give you a lot of objects in those systems that you might just be able to use without having to develop anything. But in the event that you have to develop something, you can, and we want it to be easy for you. Now that's not an easy task, and there is overhead to that, of course. Like there's, you know, this is not free, um, but there's it's a delicate balance between computational costs, and if you can't even develop a model anyway, then you'd rather at least, you know, be able to get the job done. And I don't want to like discredit Moose at all, but. There's costs to everything. Abstractions are not always zero cost. So I actually don't care as much about this new C++ standard. I'll kind of quickly go through the things that we require. Um, but luckily, we have a lot of testing. Um, I'm going to go down to the summary because I think there's a summary at the bottom. Yeah, here we go. OK. Number
reference whenever possible. Um, if you know what I'm talking about, that's great. If you don't, there's a reason why I didn't want to talk about pointers. Um, it's because you shouldn't use them unless you really, really have to. <clears throat> um, number two, methods should return pointers to objects if returned objects are stored as pointers. I don't know if I even agree with that one that much, to be honest, but that's fine. Um, number three, when creating a new class, include dependent header files. We'll describe that in a little while as we show some code. Number four, as I said a while ago, avoid using global variables. That is, if you define variables, you should not define variables outside of classes when possible or in class methods. If you have to do that, you're probably using Moose wrong or you're using a method that was developed like 10 years ago that we haven't changed the API for yet. Um, yeah, I think that's a good start. Now, there's there's kind of one, one big thing that I wanted to get to that we actually didn't represent that much here. Um, I wanted to go to to show you an idea of how like exhaustive all of this is. I wanted to go to the Doxygen pages. So what Doxygen is, is that when you define things in header files, define methods, add comments, Doxygen creates a website that allows you to easily sort through a lot of that content. So we're gonna go to documentation. We're going to go to Think framework development. Yeah. I don't know why it doesn't just stay zoomed in. Is there a way to do that? Anyone know? <laughs> okay, Moose Doxygen. So Casey will talk about a specific object in a little while, but there's an object called a Moose object. And that is the basic kind of object that you would use for the most part in an input file. That is an object that you would use with type equals something. Now, to give you an idea of how many objects we have in Moose, this is just Moose, by the way. This isn't even the, the physics modules. We'll get to physics modules later, but this is the framework itself, which for the most part is reasonably physics agnostic, except for like a few things. So we're going to go to a Moose object. And at the top of this screen, you'll see inheritance tree, which I can't even, maybe I can zoom into, yeah. So this is like how, you know, how we had one class derived from another. This is the huge inheritance tree. So down here, way, way down here, we have moose object, right? And we have all these different things that derive from moose object. Now, the first level of deriving, that is like over to the right by one, those are the different systems objects. So the one that I wanted to pick on because I figured it would be like the easiest and probably wouldn't require me zooming in on um, is actually, first of all, I'm going to scroll down and show this. So public member functions. So if you scroll down, you can see all the different things that you can call of objects of those type. Now, really, really obvious ones are type and name. <clears throat> so a generic object in Moose has a type and it has a name. So these are all very, very, very generic things. Now, as we get more specific, you'll see more and more methods arrive because we add in more capability. So I'm going to go to time steppers because this is a little more easier to look at, right? So secondly, in addition to a moose object, time stepper also inherits from restartable and scalar coupleable. Now, those are what we call interfaces. Now, interface objects are objects used to share common functionality for some purpose without actually being an object themselves. So in this case, the restartable interface enables you to, with a time stepper, checkpoint things in Moose. What does that mean? Well, as your time, as your as your, your solve goes on, you can store the state of your problem. It's every so and so. Now, let's say the supercomputer goes down or you ran out of time with your job. Well, that checkpointing saves the state of your solution and allows you to kind of restart it at the state of which it died when it was last checkpointed. Well, that requires saving some stateful inter information. Well, the restartable interface gives time steppers the ability to save stateful information. Scalar coupleable. Um, 
that's if you want to couple to a scalar value, a single value, because it should be very valid to create a time stepper. I should, I should probably say what a time stepper is first. It's probably a better idea. What is a time stepper? Um, a time stepper defines how to compute a time step. Depending on your physics, you can have physics that go crazy unstable if the time step is too big. Um, you can be solving cheap physics for a while where the solution doesn't change much, so you have super huge time steps, but then after some point, you want to make your time step small. Time steppers let you do that. <clears throat> so, of course, it should be very, very valid to have a scalar value in your solution or your system to be able to influence your time step. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm trying to remember what else I wanted to say here. I think that's the majority of it. Any other recommendations for, for systems and objects? Um, the last thing that I kind of wanted to point at, actually, I'll, I'll let Casey get to that. <laughs> do you want me to talk about input parameters for a second? Or do you want to do it? Um, I think we're good. Any questions about systems and moose or where things get derived from? Um, I can't remember what other part of. Yeah. I said time steppers. Well, yeah, but it's a single object. It's a time stepper object. It's you have multiple time stepper that makes time steppers, right? We don't we don't this isn't called moose objects. Oh, let me talk about it. OK, yeah, sure. Why not? So for those of you that have used Moose for a little while, yeah, this will be a shameless plug for a new member on the team that just added cool functionality. That's a good idea. Um, so previously, our use of time steppers and how we define time steppers was not plural. And if you wanted to compose a beautiful symphony of different different time steps, depending on where you were in a problem, you would have to create one time stepper that did all of that together. Now that's not very pluggable, which is not the moose way. Um, it could be that you want the con you want the time stepper to be constant for a while, and then within some time region also depend on some other requirement, and that other requirement is defined by a completely different modular time stepper. So in moose, you can now define multiple time steppers and it will take the minimum of your collection of time steppers. Um, so you could have a time stepper that is constant so that by default you have a value to get. You could have a time stepper that depends on some physical quantity in your system that determines convergence um, and so on. So time stepper composition has gotten a lot easier in this TLDR. Questions? Yeah, what's up? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, here, I'll also that before you, yeah. So one important thing to note here is that our C++ fundamental slides are from a long time ago. Um, we haven't touched them in a while. Um, Moose is now C++ 17 dependent, and those slides were written back when Moose was C++ 03 dependent before any kind of like true smart memory management existed. Um, so take those with a grain of salt. A um, lot, lot that we restrict you from doing in Moose now that we have a newer C++ standard. Second question or comment. Mm, yeah, C++ 17. All right, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the next section. Um, since we've been talking about the nuts and bolts of Moose and C++, I wanted to go back for a quick second and remind ourselves of where we came from. So we're uh, performing, building a simulation piece by piece of this Darcy flow porous media problem. So we have this system containing two pressure vessels at different pressures and this porous media connecting the two. As far as the governing equations go, we have the conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and then Darcy's law. And so in step one, we built a diffusion problem. 
So this didn't require any Moose code and was you know, principally there to, to introduce you to Moose. So in this step, we're interested in taking, uh, going a step further. So we want to create a custom kernel that can handle the this ratio here of material properties, permeability tensor divided by the fluid viscosity. And so we want to implement a custom kernel to simulate that, um, that, that case. But first, we need to introduce a few things. So first, uh, we're, we're going to be working with a, the kernel class. And as Logan mentioned in the previous section, um, this all inherits from Moose object. So that's used to code the volume integrals in the PDE um, in the weak form that we talked about at the beginning of the day. Oop. That's all right. So all user facing objects in Moose derive from Moose object. So this allows for this common structure that we've been talking about. Everything's operating off of a central backbone. And then we, we the modular design of Moose allows us to create custom objects based on based on need and the, and the capabilities we have available. So if we look at a custom object, just a general header. So you saw some of this structure in the C++ section, but I'll reintroduce some of it. Um, so we have this pragma at the top. This essentially uh, keeps a, a header file from being is it included multiple times during the build. So it's only included once during build. Is that appropriate? Way to describe pragma once, Cody? Yeah, so if you have a complex series, like if you have two, two files that are in one file compilation and then the bulk included, yeah. you have two full copies. Of okay. So this prevents that. So it prevents multiple copies being in a single compilation unit during build. Um, so this um, is the include for your base uh, object class. Um, and this is, since we're inheriting from base object, this is required. Um, if you are using any other um, classes in the production of this object, then we suggest that you outline those um, either here or in the .c file. So we have the class named custom object, and it is a um, inheriting from base object with a public valid params method. So in Moose, uh, the valid params method is the connection between your input file and the operation of your object. And then we have the constructor here that you saw um, in the C++ section, and that takes in as an argument the parameters that you're going to build and take from your input file. Um, we have a few protected members here in this custom object. Once we, one, we have something called do something, and so that is a virtual function with a real output type and note the override here. So we are overriding the pure virtual that comes from base object or the virtual that comes from base object. There could be a, a, a definition of that that we can override. We're overriding that here. And then we have some, uh, some variable like a scaling parameter or something like that um, that, we are, uh, that we need to define. And we, pro we are uh, setting that as a, a go ahead. We haven't. So, yeah, it's a, so it's a real, it's a double, double number. Uh, okay. <laughs> I keep, yeah. So a real number is a is a lib mesh alias uh, for the the double type, as as Logan was saying. Um, so const means that once it's defined, um, you uh, that uh, you cannot go in and modify uh, that definition. Um, so, and then we have a, a reference here, which uh, Logan touched on references earlier. So we're saying that, that the scale here is a, is a reference to a value. Uh, okay. So switching gears to the C file, you see a lot more activity here. Um, again, we're including the uh, .h file, the header file that we just created or just, just saw. And then we have a, a register method that, that's important. So this connects your object class syntactually to your application. So in this case, we have an application called custom app. If you look inside of Moose, you might you will see Moose app here, 
referencing the, the, the core framework. Um, in an application that you create, you might see something different even still. So this ties custom object to the syntax for custom app. So this is, in, this is important for a, a few things. Um, it's important for documentation because it references you know, what, what a, an object is tied to when we're building documentation using Moose Docs. Um, but then it ties everything together in the syntax tree to its appropriate location. Um, so we're here, we're defining valid params. Next up, um, we start by initializing um, a params variable um, with the params from base object. So if you're creating a base object class, you'll create essentially an empty, an empty list of params. But here we're inheriting from base object, so we want to make sure we get at least the parameter list from base object. We have a few methods inside of the input parameters type that you can use. Um, one is a class description. So this is used in the documentation system um, to provide some clarity on what uh, an object does. So in this case, the custom object does something with a scale parameter. Um, this can be any string that you want it to be. And you can even include things like LaTeX, um, like inline math um, that the documentation system can translate for you. Um, you don't want to get too wild with that, but it's something that you can do in order to create um, a little bit more context for whatever you're, you're creating. Um, we also have, and we'll get to other methods that you can use to define input parameters, but we have an add param method. So you want to allow um, the user to specify in the input file the scale parameter that we'll be using in the calculation here. And we're giving it um, a type. So this is, a, again, a template, as Logan was talking about earlier. So we are saying that we want to use the add param method that's templated to a real type. And the name in the input file is scale. So that can be any name that you want it to be. In this case, this is like your human readable name, right? So scale. Um, the next field in this method um, allows you to define a default value. So in this case, we want to start, if you don't define it in the input file, leave scale out, but we want to at least have scale be equal to one. So that allows you to define, you know, maybe physically relevant default parameters for a particular piece of physics. It's like your, your base level might be, let's say you're, you're operating in a vacuum. So for your most basic version of your simulations. So maybe your parameter is uh, the permeability of free space or something like that. Right? In this case, we're saying the scale factor is one and we can give it a description here. This description is also relevant for documentation. So you'll look through uh, the Moose documentation pages and you'll notice a list of your parameters. Um, these descriptions feed into that. So it allows um, users of your code um, who are looking at your documentation um, to get an idea of what scale actually does. And finally, um, this method, we want to return a, a input parameters you know, type variable or value. So we return the params variable that we've been constructing in the method. So this will pass that back into, into Moose. So in our constructor, um, again, you know, it takes in the parameters uh, variable. Um, and we have this initialization list here. So this is the connection point between the parameters list and what's actually going into your calculation. So in this case, we're calling underscore scale here. And you know that you remember that from your the header file. And we're saying that scale underscore scale equals the value returned by the get param method. So we have the add param method to add a parameter. And we have the get param method to get the value of that parameter. This is a real value. So again, we have a, this is a templated method. So get, get param of type real. And then we're going to call the human readable name from the parameter list. So we're calling that we're putting in a string for scale. Finally, we need to define the, the do something object or do something method, excuse me, um, that we outlined in the header file. So we want to do some sort of import calculation here that needs a scale factor. Um, in this case, you know, we we're just going to return the scale factor that we uh, we defined above. So 
Are there any questions about the structure before I move on? And I'll go into the separate bits of it in a second, but but any general questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question Mm -hmm. um, so that means um, there has to be some dual variable somewhere else um, when you get that parameter. So does that mean the, that value is actually stored somewhere else? Well, so it's, I think the get param method returns a reference to where it stores that. Okay. But there is, it is, so this object doesn't, you know, it owns the reference called scale, but it, there's the values also somewhere. Yeah, I think okay. I think Cody wanted to jump so, in. Uh, sure. Sure, yes. Somebody else also. Input parameters are stored in the input parameter warehouse for all objects. Mm -hmm. That's a different place. Okay. okay. So um, to repeat what Cody was saying, um, the input parameters are stored in our input parameter warehouse, which owns that. So when you set the reference for scale equal to that, the reference inside of the input parameter warehouse, that's where that's located. Is that a good paraphrase? And that's for the control system. Okay. And we'll talk more about the control system, I think, tomorrow? If we... Okay, I can't remember the schedule. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay. I kind of went over this just a second ago, but um, we have the... Okay. Uh, we have the valid params uh, declaration, um, and you know another example of that is here in, in our in our if we're defining like a kernel that takes in a velocity and some coefficient, um, our velocity vector and a diffusion coefficient defined with a uh, an, a human readable name and a description. In this case, you're seeing a new method, so add required param. So this will throw an error if you do not put it in your input file. So that's the distinction between add param, which you don't need to put in your input file, and you can even give it uh, a default. Here, we actually don't give a default to coefficient, which could be dangerous, but we have an add param method and an add required param method. And we and notice that we can even put in a, a real vector value, so vector um, of reals, rather than just simply a real. So you can tailor those inputs um, based on what you expect a user to need to provide and how it will be used in the calculation. So I've gone over this, um, so I'm gonna skip this slide, but this is that class description that we talked about earlier. Um, optional parameters um, can be added to a param um, as the second, um, the second field in the method. Um, so in this case, we have a year and we wanna default that year uh, to 1980. Um, I think this is supposed to be some some rendered uh, code that's not rendering correctly. Um, but what this is saying is that it can be overridden um, if you provide year in the input file. So in this example, um, we have um, in our in our user objects block, um, we have a date object of type date. It's where we might have this parameter, and then we're defining a year for of 1990. That'll override the default um, for 1980. Um, can somebody, Peter, can you note really quickly um, to, to for us to fix this? <laughs> Where it's supposed to have the block uh, code snippet, but somehow that got broken. Uh, somebody just write it down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks. So, um, and then it's rendered fine on this one. Um, okay. So, you know, we have get params and we have a required a regular params and required params. Um, in this case, we're for this this date object that we're constructing. Uh, we have a month parameter, so provide the month you were born, maybe. Um, in this, we can uh, we don't have a default for this. This is intended to be provided by the user, so um, you'll provide a month equals six um, in the input file. If you don't provide that, then uh, when you try to run the input file, you'll get an error and hopefully a descriptive one of the of where it's what you need to fix in your input file. 
If you want to couple variables in, you can also do that through the input parameters, uh, uh, the valid param section of your of your source code. So various types of objects in Moose support that coupling, and we can uh, similarly to to add param and add required param, we have access to add coupled var for variable and add required coupled var for a required variable. Um, again, we can provide um, simple defaults for these. Um, we can even provide simple parse functions for these, and we'll get into that when we talk about functions. But for right now, it's like this pressure uh, parameter, can you can provide a, uh, a default for that that's numerical. So this allows you the flexibility to build an input file in stages. So for example, in this user object here, check temperature and pressure, um, we can provide a temperature here, and we can, for a variable T, and we can provide a pressure from variable P. Um, but if we haven't created the objects required for to compute variable P yet, then we might leave variable P out for now and let it uh, use the, the default that you've defined. So you can build a more complex simulation in stages as you have the capability developed. So that's another uh, cornerstone of, of Moose development. So within an input file, um, you can you can either use that variable name, um, or you can actually drop in um, simple uh, either numbers like constant value, or even uh, 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 do we do we allow uh, uh, parse functions for these yet? Okay, so maybe not that yet. Um, but simple, simple constant values for these. So again, if you don't want to have it be a requirement, um, but you want um, something to a placeholder, then you can put that in. We do, we do have range checking available for a parameter. So if you want to have, in this case, a growth factor be greater than or equal to one, and it'll throw an error if that condition is not met, um, you can use add range check param uh, to do that. Um, so in this case, it adds another field for you to set what that uh, range checking uh, the check needs to be. So um, this is actual a, re a real example from the framework. So you can find that at this location here, constant dt dot c. Um, and this uses uh, syntax, um, the same syntax as our function parser. Um, so we've got left a link to that syntax here, um, and I won't go into that, but uh, you can if you can. Um, type it out as a parse function um, that that makes a Boolean determination, then it can be used in the range check param. Okay, so this is kind of an aside. Like I've been talking about earlier, we've we've been uh, we want to make sure that you add class descriptions and add descriptions for your uh, parameters because this is important in documentation. So each application can generate some basic documentation from the valid params functions. So if you were to uh, use the command line argument dash dash dump, then it will literally spit out on the console um, everything that could be used in your input file based on that executable. Um, you can even search by providing a search string. Um, I'll show you what that, I'll first show you what that looks like. Maybe that'll be interesting. Um, so if we go into the tutorial section, I'll go to step one here, then I'll show you what that output is. This should pre-build, so it shouldn't take too long. Okay. So we built Darcy Thermomech. I want to dump everything that Darcy Thermomec has access to. Um, it'll take it a second. Um, this is one way to get some rudimentary documentation from the command line. And so this will show you not only every parameter that a given object might have, and, and when I mean given object, I mean all objects, um, its default value, and then a summary of its description. So if you had nothing else, you can at least get some idea of what's available in your in your executable via the command line. So we want to show that, um, but we also have a lot of resources available through the website as well. 
Um, the command line, uh, the command line option dash dash show input generates a tree based on the, the input file that you're giving it, um, or, or generates a tree showing you what's in your input file. Um, that'll that's like what what Moose will re, um, uh, what Moose will uh, see when it's pulling in your your input file, processing your input file. And then we also have a list um, of our syntax here on the website. So mooseframework.inl.gov/syntax. Uh, we'll get you there. So a few ways to get information about objects. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over some of this. Um, so we all of these methods can take in, you know, a templated type or a template. It's a templated method that can take in a type. You've seen real, um, but we also can use more standard C++ types like int, unsigned int, or standard vector int. Um, for different kinds of parameters that you need, whether it's a vector or a single single value. Um, we also have some some Moose specific parameter types like a point or uh, a real vector value, as you saw just a little bit ago, even a tensor value. Um, and the, the, op the options are really endless. Um, the, if, a, if, a, if a type is not um, cannot be used with a method, um, we try to be kind and give throw an error when, when that's the case. Um, but more information about what types you can use um, are, are listed, usually listed in the documentation or can be found in Doxygen and that sort of thing. Um, okay. So um, beyond those basic ones, we do have a large number of string types um, to make input parameters a little bit more context aware. Um, so you can, when we get into functions, functions in Moose can be uh, uh, selected based on their name. And so we'll have a function name type here, um, variable name, if we wanna put a variable name in for a parameter. If we wanna import data from a file, we might have a parameter that takes in a file name. Um, so again, the options are kind of endless. Um, you can, in the source code, you can find information about these um, in the framework, so framework slash include slash utils and moose types dot h. So uh, I recommend is you're if you're writing a new object and you want to know what's possible, uh, maybe take a glance at that um, as you're developing. All right. Um, so some of you might be familiar with C plus plus enums. Um, we have our own um, to try to overcome some deficiencies in the standard um, that is self-checked and can provide um, some more, um, I guess, error checking and that sort of thing. Um, so, the, so an example of this being used in a, in a, in a file, um, of course, you want to include Moosanoom if you're going to use it. So we're including that here. We're initializing an option in Noom that contains um, some string options. So we have first, second, and fourth. This equals one and equals four here. Um, you can consider that to be kind of an alias. So when you're calling that option enum, um, the first could also be thought of as one and fourth could also be thought of as four. Um, the second field here would be kind of a default value for that enum. So if you were to use that to help you um, like perform an, an if statement check. So we can use it in a string context. So if option enum equals equals first as a string, then we can say, all right, we want to do something in that case. Um, and we can also use it um, as an integer. So since we're saying first also equals one, so if option enum is one, then we can enter the different cases. So if we do not give it a value. So in this case, first equals one, fourth equals four, but what does second equal? So because it's a it's a list, so second is the second in that list. So it actually would be two here, if, you, if not if not defined as any other number. So that's why you see case equal, case one, case two, and case four. So this switching statement will allow you to switch between several different uh, calculations or actions in your code um, based on that that enum type or based on that enum uh, input. <clears throat> so if used inside of an input parameter, 
um, you can define uh, a, a Musa enum inside of your uh, parameter list here. Um, so we're defining a component list X, Y, or Z. And then when we actually add a required param in this case um, of type Musa enum, and we can provide a, a default value um, for component, and that'll tell Moose that the possible options for a component are contained within the component Moose and Noom. We don't have a, value, a default value here, um, so it's not going to accept uh, a, an actual default X, Y, or Z. So you will have to still define components. So, so component equals X, Y, or Z in your input. Um, but this is the way that you connect that component Noom to an actual parameter. So uh, we have multiple multiple ordered options here. Um, what is different in this example for multi moose and noon? Oh, that's true. Okay, you can. Okay, yeah. So you can you can pass in pass in more than one option at a time. So the last one. Um, is that you pass in either X or Y or Z. Um, in this case, you can pass in scale and rotate or scale by itself or all three or any combination thereof. Um, for the transfer in this case, a trans some transformation that you want to perform. OK. So we have looked at a Moose object. We've looked at uh, some standard um, input uh, or some standard uh, syntax for the source code. And we've looked at the valid parameter system and the, and the parameter system more broadly. Um, we're going to look at kernels now. So we're going to go up one level from Moose object and look at the kernel system. Um, if you're following along, um, a lot of these workshop slides have a direct link to a documentation page. So if you click on kernel system here, for example, it'll take you to the system documentation page for kernels if you want more information than what's in these slides. So in the kernel system, that's our system for computing a residual contribution from a volumetric integral term in our weak form. Um, so that's the that's the, the base level system. Um, we And here we say a PDE using the Glurkin finite element method. We do have FV kernels for the finite volume capability in Moose. So I just want to make sure to to separate those two out. Um, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to be talking about finite element kernels. So a kernel represents one or more of those terms in the PDE, and um, it's you know required to compute a residual at a quadrature at a given quadrature point. And so we do that um, in the source code by calling the compute QP residual method. Um, there are various members that you have access to um, if you inherit from kernel, and so that's the for example, the value and the gradient of the variable that this kernel is operating on, um, the value and the gradient of your test functions, uh, your trial functions, um, the coordinates of the quadrature point that you're currently operating on, if you need that for a calculation, indices for test and trial functions. This is important for your uh, hand-coded Jacobians, and then an index of your quadrature point in a given element. To calculate the residual, we do have a couple kind of helper methods above a compute QP residual. So if you know, for example, that your um, that your residual contribution has a test function that's multiplied uh, to it, um, then you can use the pre-compute QP residual method um, to perform that calculation, and then you don't need to supply the test function at the multiplied at the end of that. Um, you can also, if you have a grad test function at the end, um, you can use pre-compute uh, QP residual of type um, AD kernel grad um, to uh, uh, do the same thing. So now you don't have to provide the grad test at the end of that expression. You can leave that off, and Moose will supply that as the residual is being, as the, uh, as the matrix is being constructed. So it gets applied automatically. Uh, most of the time, you will just see compute QP residual, especially in custom application code. Um, but pre-computes have been trickling in since we added it, so we wanted to make sure that you've you've seen that at least once in the training. Go ahead, Patrick. What is the purpose of the pre-computes? Is it just the uh, grad and test function values to get multiplied? 
it's slightly more efficient. Um, do you have things that are constant across all the lot share points, or do you want to do them once? Really? That's true. Okay. Yeah, that's true. So it's not it's it's not more efficient when you know, like in diffusion problem when things will change, um, but it is a kind of a convenience function <laughs> more often than not. You you could say. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I guess what was Patrick was correct me if I if I misspeak of this. Um, it was what what's the point of having the pre-compute method? Yes. Um, and the answer is it can be useful in certain problems, um, but then you know not not useful in others is the broad strokes. Um, to, but it's do you have anything to add? Right? Yes. Yeah. So you can perform, it allows you to perform computations outside of the IJ loop, which can be helpful in certain circumstances. Um, but then it is, um, you know, do you do sacrifice some readability there if you don't know what that pre-compute is doing? Thanks, Cody. Thanks all. So for a second here, let's recall what, you know, a diffusion kernel might look like. So recall a steady state diffusion equation in 3D. And so we earlier we talked about how to translate that to its weak form. So here's the weak form presented again in inner product notation. So if you were to create this in Moose, we have an example in the framework ad diffusion.h. Um, we in this case we're going to use that pre-compute method. And so we want to include um, ad kernel grad instead of just regular ad kernel. Or again. Have we talked about we talked about automatic differentiation earlier? So AD is automatic differentiation, so we're wanting to use the AD system. Um, so AD kernel grad is what we're inheriting from for AD diffusion. Um, again, we have its valid params method here and its constructor. And the single protected member we have, since this is just a basic diffusion kernel, is this pre-compute QP residual that we're going to override because we're going to define it here. And in the .c file, we're including the AD diffusion header. We're going to register this Moose object to the Moose app uh, application under its name, AD diffusion. And then we want to define the valid params for this method, for this uh, class. So we're pulling in the parameters from AD kernel grad. We're giving it a class description. We're not taking in any parameters from the input file here. So really, we're, we're only adding a description here. And then we aren't um, in our initialization list for our constructor. We don't need to define any parameters. We're not taking any parameters in. And we have, we're actually defining our pre compute residual uh, method to return simply grad u. Because we're, uh, let me finish real quick. Because we're, we're, we're going to be multiplying, remember, grad test. The system will be multiplying grad test um, during the, the construction of the matrix. Um, so, Silly, what was your question? My question is where is how do you think the summation of the quadrature point element? How do you deal with the summation over quadrature point? Yes, you said that you know that the attribute goes to sum over quadrature points into sum over elements. Where does that happen? Basically, you don't need to know. Yeah, you it's abstracted away. <laughs> so uh I guess the 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 moments where you care about that, you would want to inherit from a lower level, I suppose. Um, you can go, you can just, override. just override those methods. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay I'll, I'll taste it. Just you can have your answer, but it's the purpose of moves. So you do not have to know. Yeah. But it's also the hardest part about C plus plus is figuring out where things get called. Right? Yeah. 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 So essentially, <laughs> moves can let you do a lot, but at least for something like that. Uh, we we would prefer that you don't care about it unless you absolutely need it, right? <laughs> Magic. Magic.
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So to get back to the steps, uh, we've talked about the kernel system. We want to create a custom kernel. So to implement this new kernel object, we're going to create create one. So in the step two, under the tutorial directory, tutorial Darcy flow mech, step two, we're going to be creating a kernel object called Darcy pressure. So this object is going to inherit from AD diffusion, and then we'll use input parameters for specifying those material properties that we cared about um, that we may need to make sure are expressed in our PDE. So you've seen this before. Um, so the, the real change here from say AD diffusion, for example, is that we have these references, these parameters uh, variables that are gonna be set from the input file. So we're gonna be uh, computing the residual and we're gonna be using the permeability and viscosity to compute those. We've registered this to, in this case, the Darcy Thermomec app application under the name Darcy Pressure. So when we call it in the input file, we'll say type equals Darcy Pressure. Um, we wanna add the parameters that we care about here um, to the parameter list. So we add a required parameter of permeability. Um, we're giving it a, a description, so the permeability of the fluid. And here's where you can use LaTeX to kind of illuminate more of what's going on. Um, so here we're giving it like a, a, a variable, like a mathematical variable um, name, K. Okay. Um, but that's not necessary. Um, it's you know contextual as you want it. Um, so permeability is a required parameter, so we you need to provide that in the input file. But we're giving, we're allowing viscosity to have a default. So add param uh, viscosity, giving it this value um, from the paper that we're referencing, and giving it a description. So in the constructor, we take those values in from the input file. So underscore permeability gets the value that we set for permeability in the input file, and the same for viscosity. And then finally, we use the uh, uh, the compute QP residual method to return the, the weak form expression that we want. So in this case, it's the ratio of permeability over viscosity multiplied by the gradient of the test function multiplied by the gradient of our variable value. So that's our custom uh, custom source code here. Does anybody have any questions about this before I move on again? Yeah, absolutely. What kind of brackets? Curly brackets, square brackets? Square brackets. Okay, so Vasily was saying that certain brackets don't get registered when rendered in the, in the, in the documentation page. So in this case, square brackets will not be rendered in the class description um, in the current configuration, but would be rendered um, in the parameter description. Um, so we might need to talk about that because I, I would prefer to have some consistency there. So maybe, maybe there's a way that we can fix that. Uh, but FYI, <laughs> that's a current limitation. Um, so thanks for pointing that out, Vasily. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So I'm actually going to move um, to uh, VS Code um, to look at this input file so I won't have to scroll quite as much um, and so that we can we can look at this. Um, the This is very similar to the input file that we saw in step one, um, but we now have, instead of a diffusion kernel, and we now have the Darcy pressure kernel here. And we are opting to use the, the default value for viscosity that we mentioned in the source code, um, but we're giving a definition for permeability. So um, for 0 0.8451 times 10 to the negative nine um, or one millimeter um, spheres from the paper. So uh, I don't think anything else has changed from step one here. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to run this, then you go to this location in Moose. So starting from the Moose directory, tutorials, Darcy Theromech, and step two, um, we're going to build this real quick. 
and then I'll show you again how to run it. So in this case, I go down into the problems directory because that's where the sample input file is stored. And I'm going to call back one level to get the Darcy Thermomec executable. So um, this might be a good opportunity to point out some things about our executables here. So in the workshop up to this point, you'll see a lot of um, application executables ending in dash OPT. You'll notice that I have dash devel here. So when you are working with Moose executables, you can, you can build them at different levels of optimization, which might be useful if you're trying to debug your code and run it through a debugger of some sort. So optimized or dash OPT is the most optimized version of the executable and one that you'll be using for a lot of your simulations. Um, it'll build the fastest and it'll run the fastest but it's not useful if you're trying to, to get inside of a simulation and really like, you know, look at individual variables and things inside that are they're changing as the code is running. So this is a slightly less optimized version. Um, and just that's for your own reference. If anybody had any questions about why they're seeing that on my screen. So here we're going to run the executable and we're going to supply the step two input. And that ran really quickly. Have we talked about what gets printed out? Did you talk about this morning? Well, let's get printed out on the screen. OK, good. Um, so this is this, the same stuff you've seen up to this point. And then we can uh, view that using ParaView. And I'm just going to go ahead and display that here. So we, again, we have a very similar, a similar situation from before. You're going to see this gradient from 4,000 down to zero. But how that gradient or how that, how that temperature changes is going to be altered by how uh, the, the ratio those two material properties that we provided. Okay. Something important to note that someone just said. Sure. That they asked if that kernel basically any method using. Yeah. You want to comment on that? I, I so 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 in the chat. Yes. Yeah, in the chat there was a question about whether this is like AD map diffusion, um, which is a, an object inside of the framework um, that you can use in your input files right now. And yes. Yes, you can. You, this is the exact same thing. Um, we're just showing you using this very simple example how to build you know, your own custom object. But you'll notice as you um, think about a problem that you want to simulate in Moose, you'll find that there's a lot of uh, objects that are, have already been done for you or could be adapted to do what you need without needing to modify any source code. Um, so for Matt Diffusion, um, you can you know, supply, a, supply a, a material or supply, I guess, even a, even a function. Right for mat diffusion, you can supply like a default function, parse function that represents, you know, the the ratio in this case that you want to supply for that term. So there there are some things you can do in Moose without even needing to touch any C C++ code. Um, so it's important when you're developing a simulation to kind of take a peek at what's available before you, you know, really get started um, writing up C++ because you might not need to. So that was good. The, the big difference here is we're actually adding two input parameters, the ability to saucy for is another you can just give the ratio. Ours are less general. Yeah, yeah. This is significantly less general than the other one. Um, so you, you really want to make a custom object when you really need um, a custom uh, custom calculation. So just keep that in mind. All right. So um, at this point, sometimes we'll do a hands-on exercise. We've scheduled that for tomorrow. So Jan's going to be doing that. Um, so we're going to skip over this, um, and this will be your opportunity to kind of exercise this. We're going to get through a little bit more today before we actually get to that. OK, how am I doing on time? Yes. So we got another hour and 15 minutes. Do we have a break in between this at all? No, I guess we're just going straight to the end of the day. No, there's no more breaks. OK, just checking. Just power through. You know, hey, if I if I provided you with a good nap, then maybe that's one one victory for the day. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to move on to talk about other aspects of the input file. So in this case, you've kind of taken 
uh, the mesh part of this is a given, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about how to define a mesh. Again, the link on this page, you can click on that and follow it straight to the system level documentation if you wanted to, to kind of get some more details. Um, but otherwise, we're going to just talk about creating a mesh. So for really complicated geometries, we'll sometimes use an external meshing tool. Um, in this case, we, we use Qubit a lot. So that's a Sandia National Labs product. Um, but other mesh generators can work as long as they output a file format that LibMesh can read. Um, we use Gmesh a lot around here as well, if you're any of you familiar with that. Um, and we also have a built-in mesh system called Mesh Generators. Um, mesh Generators is our newer mesh system. Um, we, have, we had an older one, um, but Mesh Generators allows you to build a mesh in stages. So as you, um, if you have a single mesh generator, that'll generate a simple mesh for you. But if you want to modify that mesh that you've created using a mesh generator, you can stack another one or, or multiples on top of that to make modifications. Go ahead. So there are mesh generators that can import multiple, like say from mesh file A and mesh file B, yeah. and then a, another mesh generator that can stitch those together. So it's possible. And that's what the, the mesh generator system allows you to do. And I'll show you some examples of like, it kind of sets things up as a tree, but then uh, and that, 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 that use that re the results of the previous step, essentially. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, if you wanted to use the Moose, gener the Moose mesh system, so let's say you have um, uh, an example of where you want to save a Moose mesh for use in another calculation. Um, but just want to save that, that file and import that file later, um, you can actually just generate the mesh into an Exodus file um, by passing dash dash mesh only on the command line. So something important to know if you ever decide you just want to export the mesh that you created. The, the, uh, if you wanted to use that Exodus file later, then you can use the file mesh generator. So type equals file mesh generator, and then file equals whatever Exodus file um, or more. And I think there's a chart in a second about the number that we, the, the, the breadth of formats that we support. But in this case, if we're providing square.e, so .e meaning an Exodus file. Um, there's a summary of all that we support. Um, the, the level of support is dependent on the mesh type. Uh, if anybody has any questions, um, Roy Stogner has been answering questions around. He would be the one most knowledgeable about the, the, the full capabilities of our mesh importing. Um, most of the time, we're going to be using an Exodus file um, or a uh, .msh file or a gmesh mesh file. You'll see that a lot in the framework. But here's a, a full list if you don't want to reference it later. So if you want to generate a mesh in Moose, um, this is using some old syntax. I want to make that clear. Um, but it's still syntax that we do support. Um, so if you just wanted to build a very simple um, line rectangle or rectangular prism, um, you can create that using the generated mesh um, generated mesh object. Um, you need to provide a few things, like the dimension of the mesh you want to create. In this case, we want to just create a square. The x min is your minimum, the minimum value for x in your uh, in your mesh. So that's normally zero. Um, so that's the default value. In this case, we are setting that to negative one here. So we want a rectangle that extends in the x direction from negative one to one. So x min and x max and y negative one to one, y min and y max. And then x and ny in this case are saying that we want this number of elements in the x direction, the so two elements in the x direction and two elements in the y direction, then it'll fill in um, quad in this case. So uh, quad uh, square mesh elements um, throughout the, the, the rectangle that we've created. So we can change the LM type. Um, this is, um, in this case, quad nine. So this would be, you could you might wanna change the element, element type if you're using higher order um, variable um, element families. Um, so, but we give you that capability to, to modify that um, directly inside of the, the, the mesh object. So the sides uh, are, are named in a logical way. So when you're referencing in boundary conditions and in um, you, 
we name them for you automatically. Um, for using the mesh generator system, you can give them other names. So for example, if an interface is corresponding to say water that is you know, out of the domain that you're simulating, but you wanna the, 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 the user to know that to, to have a human readable name to ascribe to a particular boundary, you can name those. But by default, many of our meshes um, give um, default names. So in 1D, left and right is given both a, a string name, left and right, as well as a number, zero and one. And you can refer to those interchangeably. Um, similarly for 2D and 3D, we have all these defaults. Um, so the, so just for, for your own reference, and they can be renamed. Um, again, we've mentioned this a few times, but named entity support, so we can give human readable names to blocks, side sets, meaning the, the, the element sides, and node sets, meaning the, the set of nodes um, on a boundary um, that can be used throughout the input file. So any parameter um, in your input file that requires an ID um, for a mesh um, will accept either a number or the string name. So that's important. So in earlier examples in this, in this uh, workshop, you've seen block equals zero. Um, if that block had a human readable name, like steel, you could provide block equals steel. And your, your moose will know what you're talking about there if you've named it that. Um, so names can be assigned to IDs, these numerical IDs, to ease maintenance down the line. So an example of this, um, if we, this is even more shorthand syntax. So if you simply want to import an Exodus file, we have some shorthand for that. You can simply say file equals Exodus file, the name of your Exodus file. And we can supply uh, block ID, block names on the fly. So as Moose imports this three block Exodus file, um, it has several block IDs, one, two, and three, that are already defined inside of the Exodus file. And we wanna make those a little bit more human readable so in this example, we're gonna set those to wood, steel, and copper, respectively. So that's tied to one, two, and three in that order. And then same for boundaries, um, left and right, we can set one and two to correspond to those as well. And when we define our uh, boundary conditions, um, then we can use those human readable names in those, in those instances. Well, yeah, but, but we can still use that shorthand syntax, though. But this is this is definitely this is definitely this is definitely the oldest version of this syntax. I know. Yeah, it's probably Yeah. So so moose moose is a moose is a long term project. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have gone through several different iterations of this. And we, and one thing that you'll notice about Moose as you develop in it is there are often multiple ways to do things for certain components of your input file. Um, so when you, when you see something like this, it's generally because we're trying to support a, a legacy way of, of doing an action. And because some of our, uh, some of our inputs, some of our applications, uh, some of our applications pref not prefer it this way, but would like to keep their previous functionality and in input files. I'm going to send a link to an example of that. Mentioning. Please, please do. So, so Logan's going to send a send out an example of, of how to do this in a, in, a, in a different way that is more in line with the current Moose standard. Um, so, let's uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, and if anybody has any questions about that, please bring it up in the chat, and either I can respond verbally or somebody can one of the Moose team members can respond there. Um, so when running in parallel, running your simulation in parallel, um, and the default mode is to use a replicated mesh so that complete, creates a complete copy of your mesh on each processor that you're running on. Um, in your mesh block, you can say parallel underscore type equals replicated, but if you don't provide that, that's the behavior that you're going to get. Um, if you want to distribute that mesh, break up the mesh and distribute it, over um, the, the processors that you're, you're simulating across. Um, so they, that, that mode, um, only a portion of the mesh owned by a processor is stored in that processor. So only the portion of the mesh that the processor needs in order to uh, help calculate your, your, um, 
help perform your simulation, sorry. Um, so if the mesh is too large to read in on a single processor, you can pre-split it yourself. Um, so you can copy the mesh over. So this, this would be, what's the largest, maybe Cody, what's the largest uh, mesh that we've ever had to break up like that? Do you know off the top of your head? Like gigs of? Uh, I mean, Derek was doing it with the 2,000 core splits. Okay, so yeah. splitting, splitting over 22,000 cores. Um, and though I don't think the mesh was big enough to necessitate that split, but you, if you want to tailor, if you want to tailor how the mesh is split rather than allowing Moose to kind of handle that for you. Um, 20 million elements. 120 million elements. Okay. Um, so you can do that splitting manually yourself, but I would consider that a kind of an advanced, advanced topic. Um, but we have the split mesh option that we provide to split it up into n number of pieces that you can specify. And then when you want to run an executable using that pre-split mesh, then you can use use split to use that. So some of our uh, systems um, use um, allow the, the mesh to be displaced or, or, or physically moved. Um, so calculations can either take place on the initial configuration um, or when requested the displaced configuration. So um, if you remember from the lunchtime talk, um, Stephanie uh, showed the that laser um, the, those the laser bed fusion problems where you had the surface being deformed. So that was using the displaced mesh system um, to be able to perform the calculation on that displaced or moved modified surface. So innate to enable those, um, you need to provide a vector of displacement variable names. So and you'll see a lot for problems that use displacement, disp underscore X and disp underscore Y. Um, so that's defining what those uh, variable names are for the displacement. And then those variables that can then be used in your input file um, in uh, objects that support calculations on displaced mesh. Um, so op objects can enforce the use of a displaced mesh within the valid params function. So um, on the input file, you might also see use underscore displaced underscore mesh being set to true or false. Um, you can set that inside of the object if you always want it to use the displaced mesh or not. Okay. So if you want to look at the output of your simulation, you're going to need to use the output system. So this is where we want to output the simulation data to the either to the screen, so the console, or to individual files, like an Exodus file. Um, the output system was designed to be modular, just like everything else. So uh, you can create multiple output objects for outputting at specific times or at specific intervals across multiple time steps, custom subsets of variables. So, so let's say there's a bunch of variables that you're using in your calculation, but that aren't necessarily important for the final, for the displaying the final result. So maybe you want to output only one or two variables out of the whole that you're simulating, um, or even to various output types um, like Exodus. Um, there exists some shortcut syntax, and I'll go over that in a second and then as common parameters that, that you'll see. Um, so the two methods for creating an output object um, either follow like a one line syntax or something that's more like block syntax like you've been seeing so far. So Exodus equals true is the shorthand for outputting an Exodus file as your output object or your output file. Um, but then this is equivalent to um, creating a sub block with the name out and setting it type equals Exodus. So these perform the exact same activity. If you want to customize that a little further, then you can um, add a little bit more information. There are more parameters that you can supply. So in this case, we're saying type equals Exodus, as we did on the last slide, but we're going to want to output material properties. So if we want to monitor the value of the material property, like let's say we've, we've made that viscosity material property a little bit more complicated, and it's not just this uh, a constant value, it changes over time and over space in our simulation. So we want to make sure we can see that, if that's something we're interested in. So output material properties equals true. And then we can also hide quantities from the output here. So let's say pressure var, we don't really care about that value. So we can hide it and keep it from being printed. There's a lot more than just this. So I'd recommend there's a link right here for the excess output like documentation page. So if you have qu more questions or or um, are curious, um, you can read more about what that output uh, object can do. You'll see uh, 
Interval equals is a common parameter that you'll see. So interval equals 10. Um, so this is over every 10 time steps. We want to output um, an exodus. Um, so this shows you the flexibility of the output system. So at the top level, we have that exodus shorthand. So we're going to output an exodus file at every 10 time steps. Now, let's say we want another exodus file output on every single time step. Um, we might have you know, different parameters here. We might be outputting different quantities. We want to monitor every single time step versus every 10 time steps. But we can use that block structure um, to set up different scenarios and really tailor the level of output that we're going to get from our simulation. Output names are important, um, and you can adjust that using that block structure. Um, so in, in for the single line syntax, exodus equals true. Um, the, the file you'll see corresponding to that would be simply the name of your input file. In this case, input.i is the name of our file for our example, and input underscore out dot e. If we use that block sent that full block syntax, um, the name that we give that sub block will make it to the, the output file name. So input underscore other here, because we gave that sub block the name other, and so on and so forth. Um, we can change the file base inside of to override what we name the sub block by using the file underscore base uh, name or, or parameter and give it a name. In this case, out, and that will override all other naming behavior and just create simply out.e in this case. Um, so does, well, okay, here's a summary of what we can output. So everything from console. So if we have some things that we want to make sure are written to the screen and optionally to a file. Um, Exodus you'll see quite a lot, and it is the most common um, output type. And another notable one is CSV. So if you want to output like post-processor data, for example, to a CSV file, that's the output type that you would use. And pair of you can read a lot of these, or like in the case of CSV, you can read them into like a Python script and do processing on them after the fact. Okay, before I move on to anything else, is there any questions about the output system? Any questions online about the output system? Okay, good stuff. Okay, so we've got about an hour um, to talk about to start step three. Um, we intended to go partway through step three and then finish step three in the morning, um, but we'll see see kind of how far we get because I think I'm a little bit I think I'm a little bit ahead on time. Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump in. So in the previous step, we created that custom kernel um, that took in constant parameters for viscosity and permeability. Um, we might want to allow those to change in space or time. And one way to do that is to use the material system to provide that value to your Darcy pressure kernel. So the material system in Moose, um, again, links available there, a system for defining material properties to be used by multiple systems. So this also allows you to couple in variables into your um, uh, into your material property calculations and just allows for a more flexible uh, separate system to perform those calculations and then provide that out to all the objects that need it. So this operates, like I said, on this pr producer consumer relationship. So material objects will calculate properties or produce properties for use or to be consumed by moose objects that need them, including other materials. So you could have one component of your material calculated in an object and then pass along to another material object that does another part of the calculation or more custom calculation that then finally passes that out to the objects in your simulation. So the, the sky is literally the limit with this. It's pretty, it's pretty general. So if we want to produce a property in our material object, we've got to declare them as available to be used by Moose. Um, so we use the declare property method to do this. And again, this is a template, so you can provide you know, a type um, as part of that. Um, so it returns a reference. 
that can be written to by the material object. Um, when we uh, we want to override the compute QP properties method uh, to perform those calculations. And so that'll calculate um, all declared properties at a single quadrature point, because then they're consumed by other objects at a given quadrature point. So within this method, the references obtained from declaring the property are then updated on every time step. Go ahead. Why do we use materials instead of putting the materials in kernel? Mm. So materials yeah, are important yeah. because they're portable as well, right? So instead of hard coding something in a kernel and having it duplicated everywhere, materials are modular as well, but you use the same material property like all across multiple things. This is true. For compartmentalization, right? This, this so is true. So so, so like so compartmentalization here is like was saying, well, why would you use a material property instead of calculating it in a kernel directly? Um, compartmentalization, code duplication is another thing. <laughs> if you need the same uh, property uh, across multiple kernels in your system. You know, this allows you to calculate it once and then pass it around. You know, you could also use a function to do some of this as well. Um, and we haven't gotten to function the function system yet, um, but you have there the, the, the are multiple tools to perform the job. Um, but material properties are an extremely flexible and general way to do it. Um, so yeah, thanks Logan for bringing that up. That's important. So when we on the on the kernel object, for example, side of this equation, um, we want to consume a material property, a given material property. So when I get that property from Moose from the and then um, use it, but first we need to retrieve it. So get material property is our template templated method um, to do that for any any object, any material object that doesn't use the AD system and um, get ad material property is how to get ad objects um, so we have a lot of material properties that have not been converted over to the ad system and so we provide methods to, to access either version again well, they're recomputed at quadrature points and they're recomputed on every time step um, multiple material objects could define the same property um, but these need to be done on separate subdomains. If you try to recompute the same property in the same subdomain, um, you should get an error um, for trying to, or I guess might, might overwrite. Um, <laughs> but hopefully you get an error if you try to do that. Um, and you can, but you can define the same named property across different subdomains because those are considered separate separate blocks um, in your simulation. So I said that material properties are recalculated on every time step. Um, they are calculated on a time step and they are consumed on the same time step. If you need um, material properties from an earlier time step in your simulation, then you need to make sure um, that you call um, the get material property old or older methods. Um, these, um, these make those properties stateful. Um, so old gets you the value from the, the most recent previous time step. And older gets it from the time step before that. Um, so we provide, we can we can go back as far as two time steps to get that information or cache that information and save it so you can use it. Um, so it can be helpful to have those values. Um, it gives an example here of solid mechanics models where you might want to see what the state was um, before you got to the current time step to perform a calculation. Um, so traditionally this is called a state variable, but in Moose we call them stateful material properties. Um, they do require more memory, as you can imagine, because you're literally saving more copies of that data. Um, so you know, use it only as you need it, um, but it is available if you do need it. Material properties in a given input can be given um, defaults, or a given, a given object can be given defaults, just like any other parameter. Um, so for this example, um, we want the user to input a material property name um, in their input block. We've given it the name combination property name, um, but if we haven't created that material yet, or we want to give it a same default, if we don't want to use uh, a defined material, then we can give it a default. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five. Um, only real values, material values can have defaults right now. And um, so when when this get material, when the get material property method is called, um, in the initialization list, 
So the default will be returned if that value is not being computed via some other declare property call inside of a material object. So if no material object is defined, then this will be used. Uh, we mentioned this in the, the, in the output system section where you can output material properties um, by setting the, the outputs parameter. Um, or we can set the outputs parameter to output material properties from the material property system. God, that's a mouthful. Um, so the following example um, creates uh, two uh, properties that we want to output. So um, here we, we have our materials, and, and within each one, we have an outputs parameter that we, we set to Exodus. So this corresponds to the output type that we are outputting in our in our input file, um, where we want to output real property and tensor property for our material one, and we want to output vector property and tensor property for the material two in block two. So all of these will be output to the to the Exodus output when the simulation is run. So we can tailor that um, in the materials block. Um, supported property types um, we support real values, vectors, and tensors. Um, so, you know, those um, can be, um, you can, they can have arbitrary type, but not all of them can be output. So, these are the three we support in our, in our output. Um, but you're not limited to those as far as using material properties throughout your simulation. Okay. Any questions about the material system before I move on to functions? Okay. Any questions online? So functions. So as we were talking about earlier, you if you want to define something in your problem that can be used by multiple objects, you have the, you have these two options. You have materials or you have functions. Um, if you have an analytic expression based on uh, position and time, um, that's when you would probably use the function system. Um, if your uh, if your uh, calculated value is more complex and requires coupling in um, other variables or coupling in even other materials, then that's when you would probably use the materials the material system instead. Um, but a function object is created by inheriting from a function base class and overriding the value method and optionally other methods. So, um, and we'll get into that in a second, I believe. Um, but principally, you're gonna be overriding the value method and you can access those um, in your uh, object by calling get function um, with the string name where that name is reflected in your input file. And we'll go into an example of that shortly. So a function can depend on other functions, but it can, but it cannot depend on other material properties um, or variables. So be aware of that. So functions are, are pretty limited. Um, if you need anything more special than this, then you should be using a material property instead. So many objects exist in uh, Moose that you can use a function, such as boundary conditions, um, so our initial conditions, and like a what we, what we call a body force, which is like a right-hand source term. Um, each one of those has a function parameter, and you'll see that in the documentation. And you set that function parameter to the name that you've given your function in your input file, and that can allow you to control which function you use. Um, so as an example of a function object that's built into Moose, uh, we have the parse function object. And that can allow functions to be defined by strings. Um, so in this case, we can define simple functions like sine and cosine um, by simply calling type equals parse function and expression equals sine x cosine x. Um, if we want to get a little bit more fancy, um, then we can uh, we can call up um, our given an expression. So this is where our um, our string that defines our function s underscore c um, we can have symbol names so we're telling moose the, the parse function object that s and c are important input variables and then we give those symbols a definition by calling the names of the sine and cosine functions that we've defined before so this is performing sine x divided by cosine x um, but we're using this syntax to do that definition using functions that we've already defined and doing it all in the input file. Go ahead. Did 
You can, you can. So you can do this and, and, and have the full expression, but this is showing you a circumstance where you've already got these functions sitting around and you're building a combined function based on those. You're not rewriting all of that again. Right. So do you have another, another question? Another? Okay, good. Um, so in that function definition that you see in, in the third block, um, you can include other functions like we show here, um, but you can also include variables and post processor values in that. Um, so you're not necessarily limited to only other functions. So that's important to make clear. Inside of a given object, um, you can, um, when you add a param of type function name, um, you can pass in a default. Um, this default could be a constant value. Like in this example, we're defaulting the pressure grad input parameter for a function to be 0 0.5. And we can also um, use a, another parsed function. Um, so if we have a power history here, we want it to default to this expression. And Moose on the back end will automatically construct what is necessary to provide that default, and it'll do that for you. Um, so that's how we that's how we enable that functionality. Um, and uh, so that gives you the ability to set defaults even for these um, for for uh, a given simulation that you're building. Yeah. Uh, this one. Set. set. It is. Okay. Good. Good question. So that we define that we let Moose know that using symbol underscore names and symbol underscore values. So we're giving it an expression s over c, and then we're saying for symbol names we're saying s and c are defined. By saying symbol values, we're defining S and C. So C or S corresponds to sine underscore FN here, and C corresponds to cosine underscore or cos underscore FN here. So that's the that's how you define like what those particular symbols will mean. And then Moose will apply those values to that expression when it interprets what you're what you've input. It'll, it'll use a number value as well. Yes. So, you, so you, yeah, it, it'll it'll um, it'll look for the function if you get function name. It'll use a constant if you provide a constant. So, what was the second part of your question? You had something that you were saying. So it doesn't. I know there's some programs that you can see on the top and bottom. You can find oh, something later. Sure. This is not this is not top to bottom. So. You do it in So, so, so this allows you to it'll 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 actually go evaluate those two things first and then plug them in. Yeah. So you could have this. You could have the fn subblock here. That could be the first one going into the function block, and it'll still work. And that is the case with a lot yeah. of most things in this. Like yeah. There's there's only a the there's only there's only a few instances where dependency matters, and occasionally there's. There have been instances in the past where dependency mattered and we didn't intend it to. Uh, but generally, um, the order of, of operations in your input file isn't, isn't important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, about 40 minutes ahead of schedule. So, do we want to jump in to packed column? the material that I was going to cover in the morning and that gets us a little ahead in the morning? Or do we want to allow ourselves some general Q&A to end the day? What do you guys think? Do you think that is, do you think you have enough time for everything? Is it beneficial to do something? Because I, I did simplify packed column here. So, you know, we're not, we're not doing that that jump that used to be in this section of the workshop. So I think I think if we got through, I think I could get through it. Let me. Uh, actually, it is a bit long, but it's not too it's not too bad. So if we if we went ahead and did this, we would start with the test system 
in the morning, first thing. Okay, okay, sounds good. So um, now that we've covered the material system, um, let's let's specialize um, or start the process of specializing that uh, diffusion, the Darcy pressure kernel that we created earlier. So we're going to do that using a custom material called packed column. And so we, we need two material properties to be produced um, to be used by the Darcy pressure object to so permeability and viscosity. So previously we defined those using constants, but we want to define them using a material property in the future. So we're going to create this material class and we're going to compute both of those uh, material properties with this single object called packed column. So from our reference, permeability varied with the size of the spheres. And so we're going to perform you know, a simplistic interpolation with the values that it gives us over the range of valid values. And so this, this is what we want to, to do in our materials uh, object. So if we start with the header file, I'm going to skip down here and look at these uh, new these variables. So for inputs for our material, we need to know the radius of the spheres that are in that column. We also need to know um, what the uh, an input viscosity. So the viscosity, we can change that based on the material. So we want to be able to allow the user to input that um, in an input file. Then we have two material properties that we're calculating, and these are AD material properties based on their type here, permeability and then viscosity. Um, you'll see uh, here, um, we've talked about comments in your, in your source code files. Um, I wanted to note real quick, since I couldn't remember if it had been said earlier, uh, these comments with the three slashes in front, that tells our Doxygen system that this is a comment related to this member. So if you look into the Moose Doxygen and you see the descriptions, that is where this comes from. So a lot of folks ask where, where these descriptions and where this extra information comes from. It comes from right here. So as you're creating custom objects in Moose or elsewhere, and let's say you use you want to use Doxygen as a documentation option, you know, it's important to, to know that that's where that comes from. So FYI. Yeah, Logan. No, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, well, so there's there's if you couple to anything in a material that gives derivatives, and it'll propagate through your kernels and everything. Well, it, yes, but I wanted to I wanted to clarify that before we had uh, AD derivative propagation, um, you'll see um, in some of the modules ways to produce material property derivatives and then propagate those through in a more manual sense. So AD does that derivative propagation through your to your Jacobian automatically, um, but you, you will see in some modules ways to set derivatives and um, um, retrieve those derivatives in a more manual sense. Um, but AD is the, the way to do it fully automatically. But yeah. Your material can depend on the variable. So as Logan was saying, so passing this this allows you to couple in AD, you know, it allows you to, to propagate through derivatives from coupled variables all the way through the calculation. Um, so that's it, it is a very important that's to note that. How complex, uh, right. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, th things get really complicated. So using the AD system um, could take some some uh, weight off your shoulders, as it were. So let's move to the .c file, source file, real quick. Um, so in this scenario, uh, we want to be able to take in radius either as a constant value or even a function. Since in the paper, we had a scenario where the, the porosity or the radius of the spheres changed as you propagated down the column. Um, so we want to make sure that we not only include the header file that we just went over for this, this object itself, we want to be explicit and include the function dot h header since we are going to be using uh, functions here. Um, again, we want to register our object and we want to set up our parameters for our input file. Um, we're going to be adding a parameter of type function name 
named radius. Um, when, when we don't provide it, we want it to just have a value of one. Um, that's the, the, the smallest radius used in the paper, one millimeter. So the radius of the sphere is going to default to one millimeter. And then we have a viscosity parameter that will also have a default. So you'll remember this default from the Darcy pressure object earlier in our discussion. Um, but since we are wanting to provide that viscosity through this material in the future, we're going to give it that same default value that we did earlier and the same default from the paper. Um, and this is um, this will be just passed through this material. Um, in our initialization list, we want to get the function associated with radius and uh, associate that with underscore radius for our calculation. Um, our input viscosity is going to be passed, our, our viscosity from our input file is going to be passed along to input viscosity. And then we're going to declare the two material properties that we want our objects in our simulation to use. So we're going to declare an AD property for permeability, and we're going to declare another AD property for viscosity. And those will take in, uh, yeah, so we're going to declare those for use. Um, so in our compute QP properties method, um, we want to, we have some data from the paper. And so here we're going to, we're just going to define two vectors that hold that data. So in, uh, we have sphere sizes um, at one millimeter and three millimeter, and then permeabilities associated with those sphere sizes. So we're just going to simply define these so that we can use them in our calculation. Um, because we don't have any data outside of one and three here, um, it might be smart to do a little bit of error checking. Um, so if the radius, if, if the user defines a radius that falls outside of the, our range of interest or our range of uh, applicability, um, then we can do that here. So um, we take in, we, we use the, the radius uh, function and call its value method at a particular uh, time t and a particular quadrature point. So this position of the quadrature point here, and then that gives us a value. And so if that value is outside of, is lower than one or greater than three, then we're going to throw this assertion and let the user know that, uh, that we've, we've, we've gone outside of our range of applicability here. Because we are only passing through a value that the user inputs for viscosity, um, we're simply going to set viscosity equal to input viscosity. We're not doing any calculations there. We're just passing through what the user gave in the input file. But because we do have this uh, range of data here, and because we are um, interested in what happens as you change the sphere sizes as you move down the column, then let's just do a simple linear interpolation of this. So I've defined what a linear interpolation is for two points here, but we're just going to perform that calculation based on the data that we have. And uh, that, that's just how we calculate permeability in this case based on, based on what we've input, based on what we have from the paper. And that's it. So now we have a calculated viscosity and, our, and a calculated permeability that we've declared and that is available um, to objects. So if we go back to the Darcy pressure kernel, um, we had general input parameters that we provided constants for, but now we can update that um, to use these new input material properties. So uh, before, um, we had real values, so const, um, const real references for permeability and viscosity, but we're replacing that here with AD material properties of type real for each of these. So it's not hard in this case to simply update that header to reflect what we what we now want um, to be input for these. Um, and then in this in the source code file, um, we're no longer going to allow a viscosity and permeability to be set via the input file as far as in the in the Darcy pressure block. Um, but we do want to get them from the material property system. So we're going to get an AD material property for permeability, and we're going to get an AD material property for, for viscosity. And so those will be defined from pack column. If they're not defined, um, then the, the input file will error as you've run it. And then QP residual is unchanged um, because uh, we're, we've defined these permeability uh, 
these permeability and viscosity variables from the material properties, but we've not changed the function um, of the kernel itself. So that expression will stay the same. Okay. Uh, the input file is pretty much the same from before outside of a couple things. One, we no longer have any parameters other than variable under the, the kernel's subblock. And we've added a new material here. Um, in this case, we're using defaults for packed column. And so we simply add a subblock of type packed column and the defaults defined in the, the source code will, will be provided along to the, the uh, Darcy pressure object. So I believe these are the same parameters used in step two. So this result is going to be exactly the same. Um, but this just now we have um, pulled the calculation of these uh, material properties of, or properties of interest up into the material property system rather than defining them locally like this. But right now our result is exactly the same as it was before. So now that we've defined it as a material property, uh, we can vary the sphere size. Um, we did that linear interpolation, um, hand calculated that linear interpolation from the data that we had. And so now we can vary the sphere size. Of interest here is remember that in our, in our uh, packed column class, radius could be a function. And so we can define that function using the function block and define you know, any kind of function that we want to, to, to apply there. In this case, we'll, we'll make it simple and we'll define a parsed function directly in the material subblock. So type equals packed column with a radius uh, equal to one plus two divided by 3.04 times X. So just that parse, that parse expression. And we're gonna output that to an Exodus file so we can look at it. Nothing else about this has changed. And so on the top, you'll have that pressure output that you've been seeing, um, but then now that gradient is slightly different um, than it was before because our permeability on the bottom is now changing um, based on our X position in the column. But nothing else about running this file or running the simulation has functionally changed. All right. Well, that is the packed column um, example for our materials. Um, and that's the end of kind of where we wanted to get to today. So we have a decent amount of time for questions or any discussion that maybe we want to undertake before we close. But does anybody have any questions about this before that? Okay, yeah, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Good morning, Th thanks, thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I hope you guys all had a great day yesterday. Uh, my name is Derek Gaston. Um, I started this whole Moose thing back in 2008. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here yesterday with you, um, but I'm going to kind of get things started this morning. And uh, I wanted to, first of all, ask everybody out there if you have any questions from yesterday or anything you thought of overnight, any clarifications you wanted from yesterday, that sort of thing. Everybody slept well, invigorated. Uh, OK, apparently we'll get the recording out pretty soon. Um, anything else from yesterday? So let's see what what did you guys talk about yesterday? Talked about numerics, finite element stuff, um, input file syntax, C++. We went over C++ stuff. That's good. That's great. All right. So what I kind of wanted to get started with this morning, if there's no questions, are there any online? I can't see them on here. So, okay. So. I wanted to kind of back up just a little bit, kind of start us and orient us this morning. Cody said he skipped this particular thing in the intro yesterday. And so I thought I would give it some time. Um, just to kind of get you thinking about what our purpose is here today.
So, um, you know, the whole point of Moose is to accelerate the development of high performance multi physics simulation tools. Okay. Uh, basically, as I'm sure you heard yesterday multiple times, we want scientists to be doing science and we want engineers to be doing engineering and a lot less computer science for both of those groups, hopefully. Okay. And the reality is that through the history of scientific simulation, scientists and engineers have had to write a lot of their own code if they wanted to use a computer to solve a problem, right? And so what this kind of goes through is kind of showing you how we've progressed over the years from writing everything yourself to using more and more and more libraries. And then a little bit of showing you into the future kind of how we're thinking of this idea we call application composition, which is the combination of multiple physics applications into one larger simulation capability to simulate really complex things. Okay. Um, so let's kind of start off here. So if you're trying to set out to make a simulator for nuclear fuel, what are all the things that you would need, right? So that's what's in the boxes up here. So um, at the very top, we have the things that you're probably thinking of as a scientist or an engineer, which are, you know, the actual heat generation rate itself from from fission, um, boundary conditions such as uh, what's going on in the flow channel on the outside. Let's say this is light water reactor fuel, and you have water flowing past your your fuel, and and you you want to simulate that boundary condition. And then you have things like material properties for the materials in your problem. Uh, in nuclear fuel, we have cladding, which is kind of the metal encasement around fuel. And we have the nuclear fuel itself, the like uranium dioxide, whatever it is, EO2 in uh, uh, light water reactor fuel, for instance. And so those are really the things you're thinking of whenever you want to solve your problem. But there's all these other things that you need to worry about if you wanted to be able to solve in 3D on a parallel machine um, and uh, take advantage of things like mesh additivity, things like that, right? And so if you were going to write all this from scratch, you would have to start really down here at the bottom. So this first box here is message passing. So that's just <laughs> how you would send messages back and forth in parallel on a cluster, for instance. And believe it or not, Back in the day, way back in the day, before I was born, uh, yeah, I'm not that old. Um, people would write their own message passing code, right? So the first step to writing a parallel scientific code was to sit down and figure out how to send messages back and forth <laughs> between the various cores on your cluster. Uh, but we figured out that it's not a very good idea for everybody to be doing that by themselves. And so we we started developing libraries. And one of the first ones that we would need is something called MPI, which is how we would pass messages. And MPI is what Moose ultimately uses still today for passing messages back and forth in a, a parallel computer. The next step of what you would need for building up your application that you used to have to write yourself would be your solvers, your linear solvers, um, your dense matrix solvers, et cetera. But over time, we realized that a lot of people do that. And so we don't need to um, keep reinventing that wheel over and over so we can make libraries out of that stuff. And that's where we got things like Petsy, Blas, the pack. Those are all libraries of linear solvers uh, and linear algebra. Uh, that we can just reuse over and over again. And then as time went on and people kept writing more and more finite element codes, uh, we realized that there was a lot in common between most finite element codes. And we got our finite element libraries. These are things like DL2, LibMesh, Petsy DM, um, OpenFoam on the finite volume side, uh, lots of different things like that, right? And so, they give you the finite element shape functions, reading and writing in mesh, evaluation of quadrature points, et cetera. And so now you don't have to write that yourself, right? So as we go along here, every step along the way, we're componentizing and creating libraries out of the things that are common across multiple applications and trying to keep scientists and engineers from having to write 
everything down below, right? Well, time went on a little bit further. And back in 2008, we realized that there's still a lot in common among nonlinear uh, multi-physics simulation tools, which is that they needed kind of an assembly engine. They needed hybrid parallelism, like the ability to run with threading and MPI. Um, modular interfaces so that you could reuse physics and uh, the ability, obviously, to couple physics together. And that's kind of where Moose comes from, right? Is adding another layer to this set of libraries. Again, trying to encapsulate things that people are doing often so that you don't have to write it yourself. And finally, uh, even more lately within Moose, uh, it was recognized that even with Moose, people were rewriting the same physics over and over again. Heat conduction, solid mechanics, chemistry, et cetera. And so we developed the, the physics modules capability within Moose, which is a set of free open source physics modules that you can use and turn on in your application so that you don't have to rewrite these different types of physics. So now if you look at the very top there, we're back to just the thing that you wanted to work on in the first place. We're back to just the physics that a scientist or an engineer really wants to study, right? Just the things that you want to plug in different models for, see how they act, you know, put them in different scenarios, see what happens. So we're back to allowing you to just focus on the science or engineering that you wanted to develop. And so, even so, these we take and package up into what we call moose based applications. And that's what you guys are here to learn about this week, which is how do you use all this stuff below that line to create a new multi physics simulation tool? All right. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going over over these few days. Now, this particular one that includes these kinds of physics at INL. This was going so well, and now I have a, what does that mean? How could that even be possible? Funny. Uh -huh. No, it's going to steal my punchline. Okay. Everything was going great. So at INL, we, we call that application Bison that simulates nuclear fuel. And then we're able to use the same system to create things like Relab 7, which is the systems analysis code. This is an older animation, so it still says Rattlesnake, which is now the, the Griffin um, uh, neutron transport application that's co-developed by Idaho and Argonne National Laboratory. And a whole suite of other tools to simulate pieces of nuclear reactors. And then people out in the community all around the world have been using Moose for the last 15 years to create many, many, many uh, multi-physics simulation tools that simulate everything. Uh, geothermal energy, bio-inspired vascular networks, batteries, everything. So that's been a really good model. But here at INL, we are actually trying to simulate whole nuclear reactors, not just pieces of them. So even though we have simulation tools like Bison that simulates nuclear fuel, we have Rattlesnake that's doing neutron transport, we have things like Relap7 and SAM that are doing systems analysis. We actually want to be able to tie those together and do a full simulation of a nuclear reactor. And so what we can do is, let's just think of these applications as another set of libraries themselves. Let's move that line one more time, okay? And see if we could just reuse these applications as another, li as another set of libraries and build on top of it. And so this particular animation calls that bigger thing mammoth. Which I keep this animation around because I love that little, little like crunch. It's great. Uh, I did it in Keynote. I was very proud of it. Um, and um, you know, this was eight years ago, so mammoth is no longer alive. That's where I need some drums. But um, we are actually doing this within the NEMS community. So uh, NEMS is the Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation Program that pays for a lot of what you're seeing here this week. And it's developing a 
a whole suite of Moose-based applications that we're then able to use as libraries to tie them back together to simulate whole nuclear reactors, uh, and especially to simulate advanced reactors. Question? No. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of kind of how we think about these things. We're trying to componentize, we're trying to modularize everything that there is about modeling and simulation so that you can write less code, you can, um, you can have your work accelerated, and ultimately we can get out better simulations, higher fidelity simulations, more predictive capabilities uh, than what you would have been able to do if you had to sit down and write all that stuff from scratch yourself. It's kind of kind of the plan here. I think that if we kind of drop down here, I'm sure Cody showed this yesterday, um, but this is ultimately what that looks like for Deems, for instance, where we have kind of the red, like light red boxes are applications. The green boxes are physics modules. And then these yellow boxes down here are what we call coupling applications that are tying together multiple multiple moose based applications in order to simulate whole nuclear reactors like micro reactors, um, heat, heat pipe, uh, heat pipe micro reactors, um, high temperature gas reactors, et cetera. Okay. Um, and you'll learn later on, probably tomorrow, maybe, that the way that we do that, the way that we combine these moose based applications together is a capability in moose called multi apps. And um, I think we'll take you through a, a small tutorial on how we use multi apps, but uh, I just kind of want to get that word out there that that's kind of our way of allowing us to combine multiple moose based applications. And the really interesting part is that there's no code that you have to write to be able to use that capability. You don't have to modify your moose based application at all. Uh, just by the very fact that it's a moose based application, it can be used in this uh, in these larger um, multi-physics, multi-scale simulations. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to start with today is kind of a motivating idea, uh, but let's get back on track here before they start throwing stuff at me up here because I'm taking too long. <laughs> All right, any questions then on, on this idea? Thoughts? Lively crowd, hopefully that coffee settles in pretty soon. Let's see. Standard. Where are we at? Colonel. Oh. That's nice. A little less like vomit inducing than seeds. Ah, I see. Where are we at then? Keep going. You guys made it through all this yesterday? Yeah. Nicely done. OK, testing. All right, so testing is really important. Um, after you build these really complex multi-physics applications, and especially after you're linking a whole bunch of them together, um, and they're all developed by different teams, uh, different sets of people, how do you make sure that any of this stays working, right? So Moose is a very lively project. We're merging, on average, like a couple of pull requests a day uh, last time I looked, there were 50,000 new lines of code that went into Moose in a 30-day span. Um, that was just a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, it's a very lively project. There's a lot going on. How do we make sure that we're not breaking everything? And we do that through the testing system. So you might have heard yesterday that we refer to Moose these days as a platform uh, that provides kind of an end-to-end -end solution for development of simulation tools all the way from the build system, the C++ framework, um, the documentation system that you'll learn more about as we go along, and uh, the testing system is part of that as well. So you get, as you start a new Moose-based application, you get a testing capability that's already built into it so that you can just start using it immediately. Uh, that test system is written in Python. Um, and the way that we like to work with it is that every logical set of capability within Moose or within your application should have a test that goes with it. Okay. Um, the test system is very flexible. Uh, 
uh, and it gives you a lot of options. You can test for to make sure you're getting the same solution you were getting yesterday. It's called a regression test. It's a really good idea. So if you like the solution you're getting today, make a test for it to make sure you're going to get that same solution tomorrow. Uh, but you can test for lots of other things too, like error conditions, um, test for convergence rates, uh, lots of different things. Um, and you can create your own tests as well. What's that? About Civit? Okay. Yeah. So the test setup looks something like this. Underneath every Moose-based application, there will be a directory called tests, and that's where your tests go. Um, and we like to separate out the tests for into individual directories underneath there for the type of object that that test is testing. So, uh, so far you've heard about kernels, boundary conditions, materials, uh, a few of the Moose systems. There's over 30 pluggable systems in Moose. Um, so we're, we're gonna try to get through as many of those over these three days as we can. And so separate out your tests, uh, keep them nice and organized because you end up with a lot of them. I don't know how many total test directories we have in Moose right now, but it's probably in the thousand-ish kind of range um, with seven, several thousand tests within those directories. Um, and then underneath each one of those uh, um, kind of subdirectories, you put a directory for the tests that you're trying to create. And in there, you'll typically have a few different things. You'll have an input file that is how to how to run your application. Um, you'll have probably an Exodus file, a dot, that dot .e file there that is your geometry, your mesh. Okay. And then you'll have this test file that's in there that we'll go over in just a moment. That's the test specification that tells Moose how to run your application and what to look for in the test. Uh, the gold directory will have a like gold standard results. So again, if you're trying to ensure that the solution you're getting today is the same solution you get tomorrow, the way you do that is you save off the solution you're getting today and you put it in that gold directory. Um, and then you might see some output files, uh, for instance. So here's what a test specification looks like in that test file. Uh, you'll have that outer level block, so it still looks like Moose input file syntax, even though this isn't actually read directly by Moose, it's read by the, the testing system, but we try to keep everything consistent. So you'll have that test outer block, and then underneath there you have sub blocks, and each one of those sub blocks represents a different test that you're going to run in this directory. So that top one, for instance, is called an exodif test. Um, our output format that we typically utilize for Moose is called exodus, and exodif is a way of taking a difference between two Exodus files. And this is that regression test that I've been talking about where you save off an Exodus file that you like, you run your code, you generate a new Exodus file, and then you use this tool called Exodif to basically compare them against each other and see if you have any changes in your solution. So that top test there is kind of our workhorse test. That's the, the vast majority of our tests probably use the, the Exodif capability. And then you just tell it where your input file is and what output file it is that you want to compare. And it'll automatically pick up that output file and compare it to the output file with the same name in the gold directory. And that test will pass if you continue to get the same result and it'll fail if, uh, if you don't. Now, one question I have for you, somebody's going to have to actually talk or I'm gonna do a Bueller kind of situation. Uh, but um, should you expect to get exactly the same result every time you run a simulation tool? I see a no, there's a hand here. Depends on if it has noise. Depends on the simulation. Yes? Maybe. It was 10 years ago, but it still works. <laughs> so it sounds like people are kind of expecting that you don't get exactly the same result. Well, in most cases, hopefully you actually do get exactly the same result, by the way, if you just run your code and then you run it again. If you're just running in serial, like on one processor on your computer, 
if you're running the same code twice, you should get exactly the same bits out twice. As long as if you're doing Monte Carlo, you're using like the same random seed, so you end up with the same set of random numbers, for instance. Okay. Um, so obviously, if you're changing your set of random numbers, you're going to end up with a different output result. Okay, so on one processor on your machine, you should be able to expect that you run the same code and get out the same bits. Um, I think we kind of think of computers as being so complex that that's not true most of the time. Um, but a computer really is a deterministic machine. Same inputs should equal the same outputs, right? Now, where does this go wrong? Um, because everybody in here obviously has some experience with not getting exactly the same output from a, a simulation tool. This goes wrong in parallel, okay? And when you're running in parallel, um, what's happening is that multiple instances of your code are running simultaneously. And we're doing that message passing thing I was talking about earlier, where you're sending messages back and forth between those different instances of your code um, in order to run in parallel. And it turns out that the ordering of what happens in parallel and the ordering of what order those messages come in is not deterministic. Um, it can depend on your operating system, like scheduling one process to run before another, et cetera, or you know, just happening to choose to deal with messages in a different order. And once those messages start coming in a different order, you're going to not end up with exactly the same bits that you got the last time you ran the code. Um, that has to do with floating point round off for the most part. Uh, in any computer, if you add up numbers, as long as you add them always in the same order, you're going to get exactly the same solution. It's a deterministic process. But if you swap the order of adding up any numbers, you're not, you're probably not going to get exactly bitwise the same result. Uh, due to how the processor truncates whenever it's doing floating point arithmetic. Um, and so that rears its ugly head here in our testing system, where um, if you're trying to run tests in parallel, every single time that you run that test, you're going to get a slightly different set of bits out in your result. Okay, And what that means is that the testing system has to deal with things using tolerances. All right, so there's default tolerances built into these tests. Um, you could think of them as just floating point tolerances, right? Where we have to allow for there to be some small difference between a result you ran yesterday and a result today, just because we can't guarantee that you get exactly the same bits in parallel. Yep. Dependencies. What libraries you do they change? <laughs> well, there's always that too. <laughs> Um, so again, well, even Moose, right? I, I mentioned that 50,000 new lines of code went into Moose in the last 30 days-ish. Um, did any of those 50,000 lines of code change the order that something happened, right? If it did, then it could affect your output as well. Um, and all those boxes that I showed just a moment ago of all those different libraries, Petsy, Libmesh, MPI, et cetera, those are all under development still as well. And changing all the time. And every time they change, they might change the order of operations that they're doing something, and that could also change your result slightly. Okay. And one of the more unfortunate bits is that sometimes even a small change in one of those libraries can actually cause a large change in one of your results. And you, you would like to think that that's not the case, but it, but it's true uh, for certain types of problems and certain changes, et cetera. Anyway, uh, that's just kind of a, a general statement that we have to use floating point tolerances in these tools. The second test up here is a run exception type test um, where you're actually going to run your code and see if you got the same error condition that you got yesterday. This is a really good idea because if you're going to put errors throughout your code, First of all, you need to make sure that if you do the thing that's supposed to invoke that error, that you actually get an error message. Like I've, <laughs> there's all kinds of cases where I've put error messages into codes and you could never get to that error message because I messed it up, right? 
So you want to make sure that even your error checking is working properly. Um, and so run exception is uh, is one way to do that. And here it's expecting this message to come out, the expect error there. OK, so these are just some of the types of test objects. And again, you can make your own as well. So if you have your own type of test that you want to do. But um, we've got run app and exodiff and CSV diff for diffing comma separated value files. Um, VTK diff uh, for diffing VTK files, which is another output format that we support. Run exception I just mentioned. Check files is kind of the simplest kind of test. You're going to run your simulation and verify that a file exists afterwards. That's usually not a sufficient type of test. <laughs> um, just verifying that, that a file exists is not a really great plan usually for a test because it could have absolutely nothing in it, for instance. Um, image def for comparing PNG files, which is really interesting. There are some capabilities in Moose that can output PNG files or you know ping files, uh, image files directly. Um, Python unit test for actually testing Python scripts that you have. So if you're using Python scripts for running your code, that sort of thing, you can use uh, the unit test capability. Um, Analyze Jacobian and Petsy Jacobian tester are actually testing that you've coded up your kernels correctly. Did we talk about automatic differentiation yesterday at all? Yeah. So automatic differentiation is a great idea. Um, something I, we haven't had the luxury of for a very long time, but it's uh, it's a really nice capability in Moose, and it keeps you from messing up uh, your Jacobian statements, your derivatives of your residuals. Uh, but these types of tests can also tell you if you have errors in those uh, Jacobian calculations as well. So if you're not using the automatic differentiation capability, um, it can help you out. Okay. To run tests, uh, you go into your Moose application and you do run tests. And that's now kind of making me realize that I should probably have the ability to run something here. Let's see. I'll get that going in the background. So you run tests. The dash J is really important. In general, J uh, means number of jobs um, for command line uh, scripts. And in this case, it's telling the run test script how many simultaneous tests you can run. Um, so you can usually put that number after dash J to be however many processors you have on your local machine. Um, 8, 10, 12, 32, 64. Some machines have 128 these days. So um, use all those processors in your machine. It'll make it'll directly make all the tests run faster. Let's see. Test object options. Not sure that there's a lot that's important there. If you do run test dash dash dump, it'll tell you all the input file syntax. Um, for controlling all those different test objects we were just looking at and uh, give you documentation on all of them. And you know, this is probably, these are some of the, the more important rules here. So pass should run relatively quickly is that first bullet. And it says the two second rule. That two second rule used to be that it should run in under two seconds on my workstation. Um, really what that means is that your test shouldn't take longer than a couple of seconds. So don't take like a full multi-physics simulation and toss it into your test directory. You're going to really hate yourself after a while because you want to be able to run these tests over and over and over again, run them really fast and make sure that your application is working. If you have to wait 30 minutes or an hour or something like that for your test to run, then a couple of things happen. One is that you're just not going to run your tests because you don't have time for that. And tests that aren't run are actually worse than just not having tests at all. Because the second thing that happens is that those tests rot, meaning that they start failing and you don't even know that they're failing because you're not running them. And then you have technical debt hanging around that eventually you have to go clean up. You have to go figure out why it's not working, et cetera. Ideally, if your tests are working really well, they should fail instantly whenever you mess something up and 
you should be able to correlate what you change to why your test is failing so that you can fix it really quickly one way or the other. Yeah. There's a question on statement of whether or not you know, the result that you give us correct. Probably we can talk about it being be hmm. what the difference between like well, we can accident the test. It doesn't mean the right result just means it didn't change. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a really it's a really good point. Um just checking that you have the same result is not uh, a sufficient <laughs> um, statement for saying that you have the correct result. Um, usually, along with this same rule of trying to make your test small, you really want to make your test targeted and something that you can know what the answer is or have a good idea of what the answer is, right? So um, if you can make your test small enough and targeted enough that you can either verify the answer by, by hand or you can check it against a benchmark, a published benchmark result or, or something else along those lines, um, then that will make for an even better test than just saying, well, this is the result I got today. Let me toss it in the goal directory and make sure I continue to get it. Still better. Which is still better than nothing. At least you're going to find out when that thing changes and you can make a decision on whether or not that change is a good or a bad thing in the future. But it's much better if you can base your tests on something um, verifiable, um, meaning that you can compare your result to, to something. Um, one of the ways that we make verification tests is looking at things like finite element convergence rates, for instance, comparing to analytic solutions when we can, uh, generating manufacturing solutions when we can, which we might do some of, I think, in this tutorial. Um, and then comparing to experimental results gets into validation. And if you have experimental results for the thing you're trying to simulate, that's all the better. Uh, make a simulation up, see how well you compare to your experimental results. If you think you're getting a good answer, put something uh, related to that as a test uh, so that you can make sure that you're always going to get that going forward. Um, yeah, I didn't really say the words verification and validation, so we'll say it more as we go along here. I think there's a few different places where, where we talk about this. In general, verification is the idea of making sure that your code is running correctly, um, meaning that your finite element method is working, you're, you've coded the equations properly, uh, your boundary conditions, kernels, materials, et cetera, are, are all working correctly. Um, whereas validation is making sure that the output of your code represents reality. Right? And those are two separate exercises. You can have a, a code that's running correctly, meaning there's no bugs in it, and generating horrible results that don't have anything to do with reality. Um, the, the converse doesn't happen too often. <laughs> it's not too often that you have bugs in your code and you still are able to generate results that match up well with reality or some experiment. Um, but just in general, uh, keep those ideas in mind. Ver verification and validation, we want to do both, um, ideally, in the testing system. OK, uh, let's see. Other outputs generated should not be checked into the repository. Outputs should generally, like output files, should generally only be checked into the goal directory in your test directory. Um, and this last bit is the most important bit. Your tests and your application are your defense against us. Okay? So we're changing Moose all the time. And the only way that we know that we haven't broken your application is by running your tests. So if you don't test something and we change something in Moose or the physics modules or any of those other libraries below your application and it breaks in your application and you didn't have a test for it, then there's no way for us to know that. And we'll just continue on because there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Like the Civit page or? Oh, right, right, right. So part of that is that on our, so I haven't really mentioned Civit yet, which is how we actually run all these tests in an automated way um, as we're developing all the different codes. 
Um, do we have notes on Civet anywhere in here? So if you go to civet.inl.gov, this will show you uh, kind of our public facing set of testing. We also have an internal version of this for our applications that are not public. And listed here are all the different applications that we're testing. Maybe I'll make this a little bit bigger. Listed here are all the applications that we're testing against Moose and against each other uh, sometimes. If you scroll down here, you can actually find Moose. And what all these red boxes are, <laughs> which you can see there's a whole bunch of them. These are pull requests for Moose. So if, you've, if you're not very familiar with a pull request, what a pull request is is a, a set of changes that someone is trying to get merged into the Moose repository. Okay, So you can see how much code there is that's sitting out there right now waiting to go into Moose. And those red boxes mean that they're not passing tests which is probably the reason why they're not in Moose yet. And the test that they have to run, let's just pick one here. Hmm. So they have to pass, every change to Moose has to pass a whole bunch of different tests. Not only like literally the tests in the, in the repository, but also, how they're run, like on multiple different operating systems, in parallel, uh, different types of parallel, different numbers of processors. And then also we test against all, a whole bunch of different external applications or, or not Moose itself, but all the applications that depend on Moose. Okay. So if you're developing a Moose-based application and you can put it somewhere where we can get access to it, it doesn't even have to be public necessarily, although that's kind of preferred. Um, then we can actually test against your application as part of our testing process, right? And there's a little bit of um, rules that you have to follow around how you develop your application to make that possible. Um, but as long as you're developing your application in a in kind of the normal Moose way, which I guess you'll kind of learn about as we go <laughs> here. Um, your your application can be part of the testing system. And then whenever we change Moose, it'll actually run your tests. So here, if I go look at the external app tests, you can see all these different applications that are non-INL Moose-based applications that we're testing Moose against. Okay, You can see that Mastodon here had some failures. String literal looking, well, that's... Here we go. Magpie. It's a nice little bird ASCII art there. Daniel Schwinn, I'm sure, did this. Um, so yeah, you can see some of the failures here um, because we this pull request is removing something from Moose, something that Magpie was depending on, and therefore Magpie is failing. So now we know we can't just go rip that out of Moose or else we're going to make Magpie not work anymore. And so we have to do something else other than just delete it, right? We need to go through probably a deprecation process or something like that to give the Magpie developers time to actually um, remove that from their code, right? So your tests are your defense against us breaking your application. So make tests. They're also your defense against yourself. Um, the number one person that's going to break your application is you. You're going to do it over and over again as you modify your physics, as you change your input files, as uh, you add new capability. Um, and it's really nice after a few hours of coding and adding new capability to be able to run your tests and verify that you didn't mess up your own application. <laughs> okay. Um, so tests are really, really, really handy. Okay. Just to recap on the problem since you've slept since then and then listen to me this morning. Um, so what we're trying to do here in this tutorial is we've got um, two tanks of water, or liquid in general, but water. Um, one filled with hot water, one filled with cold water. And we're, we're going to basically let um, the hot water flow into the cold tank. I think is kind of the, the main idea here. 
And in the tube in between them, we've got a whole bunch of ball bearings, steel ball bearings that are packed in there um, to kind of make it a porous flow kind of problem. And so we've got our governing equations here, uh, mass and energy, uh, which ultimately gives us Darcy's law uh, as our constitutive model here uh, due to the, the close packed bearings in that uh, in that tube. A uh, bunch of material properties. Anything else that needs to be said here? So we've got um, what equations have we solved so far? Just diffusion equations or? Yeah, just diffusion equations. OK, so yesterday you guys were solving this guy here, uh, this. Really? OK, yeah, we haven't done yet, OK, you haven't done heat. Right, right, right. right. OK, so you're solving this kind of uh, Laplacian equation here with these material properties. You started off just solving a, a simple Laplacian, and then you added in some material properties for this K and mu term here and to solve for the pressure in this tube, right? Um, so that's what you were working on yesterday. And now today, what we're going to start with is computing this U uh, guy here, which is our velocity, our Darcy velocity. Um, so we're going to use what's called the auxiliary system to be able to compute that uh, and view it. And that follows on from Darcy's law here. So this is kind of the expression that we're going to be trying to compute. And let's see, later on we'll be adding in the heat conduction to this problem and dealing with the fact that it's got multiple materials like the steel and the water packed together. And we have our material properties here. Okay. Go back. So the velocity is in this system is not something that we're actually solving for. It's something that we actually can directly compute using that Darcy um, correlation here. So we're solving for the pressure, and we have some pressure gradient from high to low uh, across our, our uh, we have some pressure drop across our tube here that we're simulating. And but one of the things we want to view as kind of a, an output as a as a post-processing value to look at is just the velocity. How quickly is the water moving through this tube? Okay. And so we can you do that by just computing u as k over mu, which is our, are the same material properties we already had, and multiplying by the gradient of pressure. All right. Uh, and in Moose, the way that you create a field like this that is kind of a secondary field that you're computing based on your primary fields that you're solving for. So we're solving for pressure, and then we're going to compute the velocity. The way that we do that is using the auxiliary system in Moose. Okay. Um, so the auxiliary system in general is just a way to directly create a field of values in your domain. Um, you can use it for post-processing, like just for visualizing something. Um, you can also take these values and couple them back into your kernels, which um, we could actually do here to help us solve the coupled heat conduction um, Darcy flow problem. Um, and you can also combine multiple auxiliary fields together and do calculations on them. It's a very, um, it's a very uh, flexible system. Um, some of these things are the kinds of things that you would do offline and in, in other codes. Um, you would just compute the pressure variable and then write that out to an output file and then read that into something like Paraview or something like that and then use Paraview to compute a velocity field if you wanted to visualize it. The problem with doing that is this K and mu, right? In order to really get this right, you need to have access to the material properties. Well, then you start like outputting that kind of stuff to the output file, but you can't output it at the resolution that you really need to be able to compute the right properties, et cetera. Point is, is that we can do this kind of post-processing step online in memory 
while the application is running. And it runs in parallel. Uh, so if you're running your code in parallel, it uses all your processors to do that computation. And you don't have to read and write anything to disk. And you get the full resolution, basically, of all your material properties um, and uh, nonlinear fields in your problem. Right, so this kind of goes over what I just said, that we have kind of our what we call our nonlinear variables. Those are our variables that we're solving for. I'll also call them like your primary variable. And then we have these secondary variables, which we call auxiliary variables, which are just these fields that you compute. You have some sort of a direct way to compute the values of them. And in order to compute them, you use an aux kernel, right? So yesterday we used a regular kernel and these boundary condition objects to compute residuals to solve for nonlinear variables. And for an auxiliary field, you use an aux kernel to compute that and put it in a field. So an auxiliary variable is dialed up in your input file using the auxiliary variables block. Um, and you need to specify what kind of storage you want to use basically on the mesh. Um, whether you want to store nodal values, like one value at every node. That it was the thing there, it popped up. No, anyway. Um, or whether you want to store values on every element in the mesh and have those values be discontinuous across the elements. And there's pluses and minuses to doing each one of these. Um, and so whenever you're doing the element kind, you use the finite element shape functions called the monomials uh, to basically support the value of your of your variable. And when you're using when you want to have a value per node, you use the Lagrange finite element family. We'll see this in just a moment. So first of all, elemental auxiliary variables, if you want one value on every element that you want to compute and be able to visualize, you can do that by dialing up the auxiliary variables field here, putting a sub block in. The name of that sub block is going to be the name of the field. So in this case, aux, AUX, is going to be the name of the field. And then order and family work together to specify that it's an elemental value. So a constant monomial will give you one floating point number on every single element that you can compute. And it's a the reason why it's a constant monomial is that it's constant across that element, right? It's one value that's constant everywhere on that element. Um, you can actually use higher order monomials as well, and then you'll get like a shape for your value across your element. But the important part here is that these are discontinuous. So you can have a completely different value from one element to the next and have a jump between them, all right? Um, another important thing to say is that Elemental auxiliary variables have access to different things from nodal auxiliary variables. So because of the way finite element shape functions typically work, we don't typically have the value of gradients, for instance, at our nodes. And so if we're trying to use the gradient of something in a calculation, we need to use an element auxiliary variable because uh, within an element is kind of only where uh, the gradient of most finite element shape functions are available. And that'll become important right here in our example where we're trying to get the gradient of pressure. Nodal auxiliary variables, get you can specify them by saying first order of Lagrange, and that'll give you one value per node that you're computing. Um, and you have a much more limited set of values that you can access because we don't typically compute uh, most of our things in Moose at, at the nodes. So the aux kernel objects uh, work somewhat similar to kernels um, and somewhat similar to everything in Moose. Yesterday, um, I'm sure they talked about inheriting from our base classes and then overriding virtual functions kind of specialized what that object does. And that's the way it works with aux kernels as well. So you inherit from one of the auxiliary um, kernel base classes, and there's actually several that you can choose from. Uh, and then you can override uh, things like compute value uh, to compute the value on the element or the value on the node, for instance. Um, when you're inside of an aux kernel, you have access to certain data automatically, including u and grad u, which are the value. And if you're doing an elemental auxiliary variable, the gradient of the auxiliary variable. Um, 
And then Q point are the X, Y, Z coordinates of the current quadrature point. Um, and for nodal auxiliary variables, the that'll just be the X, Y, Z coordinates of the, no, for nodal auxiliary variables, yeah, you, ha you have to use current node to get the X, Y, Z coordinate variables because we don't have quadrature points at the nodes. Um, underscore QP is the current uh, quadrature point, which is just always zero if you're doing nodal. And then you have access to the actual element and node objects themselves in case you need access to those things. Um, there is also support for vector aux kernels. So these are aux kernels that typically have like XYZ components or some sort of number of components to them, um, which are useful for doing things like velocity vectors, like what we're doing here today. Let's see. Okay, I don't know why that's on a separate section. So this Darcy velocity aux kernel that we're going to create, um, we're again solving for our pressure and then we're going to create an auxiliary field that has this uh, velocity in it. And um, we're going to need access to the gradient of the pressure. So we're going to be able to, we're going to have to create an elemental auxiliary field. So here's the actual code for the header file for our aux kernel that's going to do this velocity computation for us. We're calling it Darcy velocity. Um, it's inheriting from vector aux kernel. So it's actually going to create a vector field, which is good for our velocity. And um, here we just have our boilerplate input parameters and constructor. And then down here, we're saying we're going to override the compute value virtual function. And then we're going to couple to a few different variables, a few different things in our system. We're going to get out, we're going to ask Moose to give us the gradient of the pressure. Okay, so that's not something you have to compute. Moose can compute that for you and give it to you. And then we're also going to ask Moose for the material properties, the K and the mu in that, uh, in that uh, calculation, which are permeab permeability and viscosity. So here's what the .c file looks like. And so we pound include our .h file that we just made, our header file. Um, here we're also including something from metaphysical that I don't know why. Anybody know? Uh, because of on time, there are raw values. No, I don't see it. That's a typo. Okay, forget that. <laughs> yeah, there's no compute. Yeah, there's no compute here. Well, that's not helpful. I think it's just an issue with the well, with the documentation. We're missing the most important thing. Is there any way to jump to the full file? There's two boxes. Yeah, yeah. Try to put your finger in the box. Yeah. box. Oh. Raw value. Oh, and there's a raw value. Fascinating. Raw value. So nope, the go ahead. Just, you, so oh, I see. Better. Removes the derivatives. OK. There we go. See, I'm learning things here today, too. So we have our diversity velocity object here. Um, we're getting parameters from the input file, and we're coupling to the gradient of pressure. We have a couple. OK, we'll talk more about coupling here in a little while, I'd say. <laughs> uh, but this is how you can get the value of some other variable in your system in Moose. We're just asking Moose for the gradient of pressure here. That's what this is doing. And um, that pressure is specified up here in the input parameters, where we add a coupled variable named pressure. And we'll kind of see how all of that works out here in just a little while. We're also getting these material properties, and they are AD. So they're coming through as automatic differentiation object types. And that's why we have to kind of deal with this raw value thing, because um, they are carrying derivative calculations with them. 
Uh, but whenever we compute the value of our Darcy velocity down here, we don't need that derivative information. We just need the value of the permeability and viscosity. So we're using raw value here to basically remove the derivatives from um, the result of this computation here, permeability over viscosity. Personally, I probably would have put raw value around on each one of these um, to remove the derivative information first before I did the divide, um, because doing that division with the AD types means that it's going to compute the derivative of that division as well, which is slow, especially if you're just going to throw it away immediately. So you might as well strip the derivative information off first and then do the division. Um, and then we're just going to multiply by the pressure of the gradient. But you can see here we have negative K over mu times our pressure gradient here. So again, kind of like you saw yesterday with our weak forms, the code that you ultimately write here, there's a bunch of boilerplate junk, C++ stuff that you have to write. It's kind of the same stuff you write over and over again. But then at the very end of it, you get to write a statement that looks like the thing that you would write down on paper or what you want to compute, right? Negative K over mu times the gradient of pressure. So you write that once, and that's going to work in 1D, 2D, or 3D. It's going to work on one processor or 10,000 processors. It's going to work with threading and MPI on adapted meshes, on any type of element. So there's a ton of power here in these statements. Uh, we try to boil it down to the minimal amount of input that we can get from you and be able to do the computation in as many different ways as possible. Yeah. So it is for, so yes, for an elemental auxiliary variable, it's going to be, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, is it evaluated at quadrature points? And the answer is yes. And that's why you have this underscore QP in here. And um, the reason why is that what's happening here is that it's doing a projection into your basis um, that you chose for your elemental auxiliary variable. Now, for the case of a constant monomial, I think that we short circuit this and maybe do something simple, like evaluate at a one point quadrature rule in the middle or something. But in general, for the general case of any basis function, what we're doing is evaluating at all the quadrature points and integrating that against the, doing a projection into the finite element basis that you chose. Um, so that's why it's, a, the other reason why it's evaluated at quadrature points is that in general, everything in Moose is evaluated at quadrature points. Uh, Cause that's where we have all the information. Yeah. We have another question on the So yeah, so over the years, advice on this has probably changed and, you know, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, there was a question online about, um, whether you should use auxiliary variables or material properties and which one is more efficient. Well, efficiency is one thing. They're not really that much more efficient because we're still evaluating these on quadrature points in the same way that you would evaluate a material as well. So they're not really any more efficient. What's more interesting to think about is accuracy. Um, a material is evaluated at a quadrature point, and then the value that you compute at that quadrature point is immediately fed into your kernel for the value at that quadrature point, and nothing else is done to it. So you get exactly the value at the quadrature point that you computed in your material object. Versus here, I just mentioned that these values are projected into a finite element basis. So if you're, um, so what's going to happen is that whenever you couple to this field to get it back out, you're going to get not exactly the values that you compute here. You're going to get some projection of it. In the case of constant monomial, you're going to get the average value, actually, as it turns out, on the element. So what we're actually going to be computing here is the average gradient on every element. Um, and that's what's going to come out from this computation if we use constant monomials. 
If you use higher order monomials, though, you're just getting a projection of whatever you compute here into that basis. Well, that's always been the case. That's not really a new thing. That's what we do with materials. Right, right. So, so yeah, another another piece that's important for your nonlinear solve is the computation of the Jacobian. Whenever you're taking the derivative of your residual statement, you also need the derivative of your material properties. And we can compute that using automatic differentiation, as you saw yesterday. Um, <clears throat> Here, once you've done this computation, I mean, we're literally stripping the derivative information out right here, right? <laughs> Very explicitly stripping the derivative information out. And so there's no derivative information that comes out of an aux kernel. So if you're taking this value and trying to couple it back into your nonlinear solve, you've now lost a piece of your Jacobian. Um, so there's going to be a penalty for that uh, in either the ability for you to use like a pure Newton solve. For instance, you would have to maybe use something else like a Jacobian free Newton Krelov solve or something like that, or it's going to impact your nonlinear solve convergence because you don't have exactly the right Jacobian. Um, so, taking a round trip through the auxiliary system to feed kernels is usually not a good idea. It's usually much better to do computations that feed into kernel computations inside the material system because you're going to get full Jacobian information and because you get exactly the value at every quarter point going into your uh, kernel statements. So that all goes along with, let's see. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I want to see if I can see it. OK. So the question was, how often is this getting computed? The answer is, you choose. Okay. Um, so the default is all the time, like just as often as the materials are getting computed. But in reality, especially if you're doing this kind of post-processing where you're just kind of wanting to visualize a field, you don't need to do it that often. You only need to do it once per time step, right? Before you write your output file. And so you can see here in the input file, they're using this execute on option. Um, which works for a whole bunch of different Moose objects in order to restrict the execution of this aux kernel to only executing, in this case, on time step end. And time step end happens right before you output your output file. So in this case, this thing is only going to get computed once per time step, which means <clears throat> that it doesn't really matter how we code it. It could be as inefficient as we want it to be uh, because probably our nonlinear solve and evaluating our residual, our residuals and our Jacobians and everything like that is way more expensive than doing this anyway. It probably doesn't matter. But as long as you're trying to do something efficient with raw value, I would wrap both of these in raw value and make sure that you're strip away that derivative information quickly. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know if Alex or Roy have they said are they on today? <laughs> Sorry, I'm here, but I actually don't know the answer to the question off the top of my head. Why is raw value not a member variable? I guess is the question, Roy. Oh, sorry, that one. Uh, why is why is raw value not a member variable? Because it needs to be applicable to stuff that might not be a member object for the case of generic programming. Uh, we we want to be able to write code that takes the raw value. And that same code gets used whether it's getting an AD object or just a plain double as input. Okay, yeah, fair. Yeah, for templated code, sometimes the raw value real is totally applicable. Right, right, right. So for templated code, sometimes you might end up. Having a, having a real value there instead of a uh, instead of an AD type, and then you couldn't do dot raw value because it would just be a floating point number and you get a compile error. So that's a good reason. All right, anything else here? Thanks, Roy. All right, moving on. This is the input file. So in the input file, we have our normal mesh section. We're defining still our pressure variable here. 
uh, here. And then we have our auxiliary variables that we're defining here. In this case, just velocity. We're saying it's a monomial vec, which means it's going to be it's going to have x, y, z components, um, but it's still only constant. So we're going to have a constant value for x, a constant value for uh, a constant value for the x component, a constant value for the y component, and a constant value for the z component uh, on every element. And then our normal kernels, and now we have aux kernels where we're calling out that Darcy velocity object that we just created. We're telling it what aux variable to apply itself to here, the velocity. And again, when to execute it, so time step end. And again, I'll stress that the default is that this gets executed all the time, like all the time. Okay. So if you don't put an execute on, Keep in mind that you're getting this executing on every residual of, yeah. Did we change the default finally? Hmm, I don't know. Um, the, the default was always residual for the longest time. Okay. Um, and then pressure here is our coupling variable. This is saying, what variable in our system do we want to use as a pressure variable? Linear. That's what I thought, linear. So it really is all the time. Yeah. The cool thing is, if you put that out, we're going to look at documentation as it goes on. That's yeah. Funny. Okay. And that's it. Everything. So it does not compile without raw value, Cody says. Okay. To run it, you can go into this directory. Hopefully, all of you are following along at home. Build that uh, step. CD into the problems directory, and then run your input file like this. And what you'll get out ultimately, if you were to go look at the output, is something that looks like this, where you have your pressure, and then you have your velocity. Now, we have a, a constant gradient here, basically, from left to right in our pressure field. So what is going on with our velocity field? Anybody want to say? Why isn't this just a constant value? It is. That it is. It is pretty much. Is that ugly? It should be. Yeah, it's, it's numerics. I, I would say. I would call it numerics. You could call it floating point stuff, but yeah, it's it, it's, it really mostly has to do with convergence tolerance on our linear solver. Um, whenever we solve these systems, the linear and nonlinear systems, we only solve them down to a certain tolerance. Um, you can kind of see those tolerances in the input file sometimes, maybe? Let's see. Yeah. Uh, it's commented out here, but NL rel tall is kind of how tight of a tolerance we want to solve the system to. So 1E negative 12 would be very tight. 1E negative 8 is the default, which is still pretty tight for as a default. You know, a lot of commercial finite element codes are have defaults in like 20 negative five kind of range, by the way. They do that because it's easy to get to 20 negative five and a lot harder to get to 20 negative eight. And what we're talking about here is how well are you actually solving the linear and nonlinear systems? And what it means is that we never have exactly the perfect answer to that. Uh, nonlinear system that we're solving. We have the answer to within the floating point columns. And what that means is that there's effectively noise in the solution uh, where it's not perfect. Oh, and so what you're seeing here, if you look at the um, at the color bar here, uh, you can see that the value for the velocity is within a really tight Range, right? It's 1.3933 to 1.3937. So it's all the way down in the fourth decimal point. Now, if the default is 1e negative 8, why are we seeing differences in the fourth decimal point here in our velocity calculation? It's another interesting question. Maybe Roy will come on and actually school me here. But the reality is, in finite elements, whenever you compute a gradient of something, you drop. Uh, one order of convergence. Um, so 
we're solving with linear Lagrange elements here with our uh, um, for our pressure field. And whenever we take the gradient, the uh, linear Lagrange elements have second order convergence, meaning as you converge the mesh, the error in your finite element solution will go down quadratically. Um, but once we take the gradient of it, the gradient of it only has first order convergence. So we'll actually end up with more error in the gradient computation than we have in the value computation, basically. Roy, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. It's kind of an aside. So that is not the rule 100% of the time. And I once spent a month looking for a bug that didn't exist because I didn't realize I was in the case of one of the exceptions to the rule. But if you're solving like uh, a second order PDE, then yeah, that's pretty much the rule. Uh, fourth order PDE with quadratic approximation, uh, that's not quite the rule. <laughs> Right, yeah. And I know there are even special circumstances for Lagrange as well, uh, depending on your boundary conditions and things like that. OK, um, anyway, that's why we see this weird color bar. If you go rescale this color bar, like if I were going to show this at a conference or something like that, I just rescale the color bar to be like between one and two, and then it'll look like a nice constant value. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next slide. So I think that's there. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So here we go. Next slide shows exactly that. So here we're also showing another nice feature of Moose. You can pass any input file parameter on the command line as well, and it'll override whatever's in the input file. Um, override or add to whatever's in the input file. This is really handy for doing like parameter sweeps, parameter perturbations, those kinds of things. Uh, it's built right in right into Moose. So anybody that tells you that they wrote some sort of a crazy system for generating Moose input files so they could do a parameter sweep like with Dakota or something like that, they missed the part where they didn't need to do any of that. Okay, please don't go make an input file generator just to do a parameter sweep on something. We already built that capability in. All right, uh, so here we're passing NL rel tall of 1e negative 12, and you can see that we get out still something that is not constant, but it's a lot more constant. Now our bar here says 1.39345, and it still says 1.39345 here at the other end. So ish. constant ish, but there's more floating point decimals down after that, right? So um, there's still some variability in the solution, but now it's down below even the precision of what we're printing out for our color bar here, okay? Um, and again, the way to fix this for your slides is just make your color bar something that is meaningful for the, you know, for what you're trying to portray, basically. Okay, with that, I'll probably hand it over to somebody else to get us back on track, because if I keep going, we're going to get further and further behind. But it was really great to talk to all of you this morning, and thanks so much for being here. So I'll reiterate, uh, we're going to continue on to the, the heat conduction equation, and we're going to start, for the sake of simplicity, a step at a time, which is kind of how we do things in Moose, because the way that we have kernels in Moose, we have the ability to just kind of piece physics together slowly, which is also great for training. So first, we're going to start with steady state heat conduction. Um, we've built a material so far. We've built a few kernels. Now that we kind of have an idea what a moose object looks like, what a kernel looks like, we're actually just going to use built-ins in moose. Um, so while in this training, we do develop a lot of objects for the sake of understanding how moose works, um, the cool thing is that there's actually a lot of objects that have been written for you. So in reality, if you're trying to solve a problem, you should look around at the documentation website to see what, what we've done for you already. Um, and one of those things is the heat conduction module in Moose, which really needs to be renamed because it does all kinds of heat transfer now, but renaming things is really hard. So luckily we're doing heat conduction, so we're going to use the heat conduction module. So with that, we're going to use the 80 heat conduction object 
from within the framework. So I'm going to actually go to the website again. Because I like showing this process, so we're going to go to syntax. List and I'm just going to search for AD heat conduction. Oh boy, there's a lot of them. And if you look at the description, same as diffusion in terms of physics. Oh, though well, that's a really bad description. Never mind. I'm just going to find that description. <laughs> Okay, this description's better. <laughs> so if we look at the required parameters, of course we have variable because this is a kernel. Now in optional parameters, we have a thermal conductivity, which makes sense because we have a material property in there that needs to multiply through to everything. <clears throat> ah, jeez. So just to kind of go through it the way we've done things in the past here, we'll still show you this object just so you're kind of starting to get the idea of how we build these objects in Moose. So of course, the heat conduction kernel itself is really just a diffusion kernel with a material property that multiplies it. So naturally, AD heat conduction derives from AD diffusion. This kind of goes back to that whole idea of like building blocks with Moose. You kind of develop something that is general and you just slowly start adding more capability to it. So, of course, all this kernel does is it re implements pre compute QP residual, which, if you remember in the past, is an optimization on how we compute um, some of these very common kernels with AD. Now, what that's going to do in reality is just also add in the, the material property term. And additionally, we store off a material property of type real that we call thermal conductivity. So in the source file, of course, the only thing that we add in addition to the parameters that we get from the standard diffusion object is a name for a thermal conductivity. And it has a default of thermal conductivity, which means if you don't supply one, it will look for a material property called thermal conductivity. In the constructor of the object, we grab that thermal conductivity. And then pre-compute QP residual, with, which, like I said, is an optimization for a certain type of kernel. We're going to simply take the result from AD diffusion and multiply the material property. Again, this object is in Moose. So you don't have to develop this at all. If you build Moose with the heat conduction module, you get this natively. So this, in addition to a material which we call a generic constant material, is all that we need to perform a steady state heat conduction solve with the conditions that we've given. Yes, question. Neutron diffusion is different from heat conduction. <laughs> so that, that there's a part of it, but yes, you, you could if you wanted. Um, we have other generic kind of kernels, but if you think about it, so the question was if you could just do neutron diffusion with the heat conduction kernel. Kind of, that's one of the operators, but you have other operators as well. And from a user standpoint, it would be really confusing if you had a term in there that had a, a parameter called heat, or what is it, uh, thermal conductivity, and you were using that in neutron transport equation or neutron diffusion, right? That wouldn't be very intuitive to a user. So we have the heat conduction kernel itself, but it multiplies the material property. And we need to show, um, we need to show, or we need to actually get that material property in Moose somewhere. So with this, oh, list syntax, yeah, I'll describe that first, which we've shown before. Um, but if something takes a vector of values in Moose as a parameter, we define that using list syntax in your input file. So for example, the property names input parameter is most likely a standard vector of strings. And as a user, you input that like this, which we've done yesterday for functions, for like declaring symbols and functions, but just as a reminder. Okay, so what's different about our input file? I'll scroll down to the relevant content. So first of all, we have a material. Because the AD heat conduction kernel requires a thermal conductivity. So with that, we use an AD generic constant material. 
which is a material that defines a constant property in the range that you or in, in the in the subdomain that you specify. Which of course in this case we have no subdomain restriction, which means that we are declaring a material property called thermal conductivity with a value of 18 everywhere in the domain. Now if we go up to our kernels and our variables, instead of the pressure equation, we're now solving just the temperature equation. So we have a variable called temperature with with defaults, which means it's a linear Lagrange variable. And we have a kernel that we're calling heat conduction that uses an 80 heat conduction kernel object and operates on that temperature variable or that temperature equation. Now, something that I don't like that we do here um, is that we don't actually specify that thermal conductivity equals in the input file because it has a default. I think it's not incredibly clear because that's kind of confusing at first. Um, imposing defaults on users like that, in my opinion, isn't very expressive, but that's just my opinion. But what's important to note here is that this kernel takes a parameter called thermal conductivity whose default is thermal underscore conductivity. And that is the name of the material, which of course we defined here as the same thing that the default is conveniently. So if you were to specify thermal conductivity in that kernel, you just what would you be giving? Would you be giving the name of a material or just? Yeah, a... yeah. So in the AD heat conduction object itself, if we looked at, so the question was, what would we actually be specifying in that kernel if we specified something? If you look here at the thermal conductivity parameter, the C++ type is material property name. Now, as Casey described yesterday, there was a selection of, of specialized names and moose that reference things. A material property name C++ type is the name of a material property, as it would suggest. It would be thermal conductivity equals the name of the material property that you gave, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, keep in mind, too, that we also have um, a shortcut here where you can actually specify four real properties thermal conductivity equals five, and it will actually insert that for you everywhere if you want to have a convenient constant value. So running the input file, um, I would run this in person, but since we're actually a little behind, I'm just going to go ahead and show you the result. Oh, no, we're not. Okay, I'm going to go compile it then. <laughs> Oh, look, I made this ahead of time. Problem. So we're, of course, in step five heat conduction. Did I? Maybe I didn't make it. Make this bigger again, too. Oh, no, it's called Darcy Theron Mech. That's right. Darcy Theron Mech. Step five A steady.i. I'm going to open the output file. Hopefully there are views somewhere to be found. We're going to go to time step one and look at our temperature variable. So we would expect a linear solution. We see a linear solution. Um, the other important part that I think I skipped on is the boundary conditions, um, because I figured we were pretty familiar with boundary conditions. But just to go back and look at the input really quick as a sanity check, which if you impose things like this, you should look at your result and see if you you know, have the results that you expect. But we impose a temperature of 300 degrees on the right and 350 degrees on the left. So if we go to our result, 350 on the left, and 300 on the right. OK. So now transient heat conduction. So the big takeaway for this next part is how easy it is to go from a steady state to a transient problem in Moose. So what's the difference? Well, we have a capacity here multiplying a time derivative, which is our new term. So we would expect to see in Moose world to be have a new kernel for that object. Now, of course, the heat conduction equation is really, really common. It's solved everywhere. So naturally, we have a kernel that already does this for you in Moose that you don't have to build. All you have to do is compile Moose, and again, you get it natively. 
That's really longly named 80 heat conduction time derivative. Again, big takeaway here is that only an update to the input file is needed to, to make this change. But not just from the kernel. There's one other thing. So as we talked about earlier on, there is an executioner block in Moose, which I described way back in step one, and we had type equals steady, which is for steady state problems. The other common executioner naturally is type equals transient. <clears throat> So again, this is what we were using previously. And Peter also threw in um, a bunch of solver options here, because of course the executioner is also where you throw most of your solver options. But for the sake of simplicity, this is a steady state executioner. Transient executioners. So we have a few other, def or we have a few other convenient input parameters for transient executioners. If you have a really, really simple problem with a constant time step size um, or other parameters or no different ending criteria that can change in the, in the, throughout the solution, um, you can specify things like the start time, the end time, the time step size, and so on within the transient or within the executioner block with a transient executioner. We also have the ability to run a steady state um, detection run, which will actually run your problem with a few time steps until a tolerance is met. And that is the difference in your solution. I think the L2 norm and the difference of your solution is within this tolerance. Um, this is convenient for hitting a steady state with some problem. That way you don't have to know when the end time is. You just kind of run some false time steps until you hit a steady state. <laughs> Common executioner options which we've actually touched on quite a few of these so far. Um, things like linear tolerances, relative tolerances, absolute tolerances, and so on. Oh, that's a weird transition. OK. So, so far we've only discussed kernels. Now, we have a special subclass in Moose for kernels that include time derivatives. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, this isn't time integrators. That's later. Yeah, that's later on. Yeah. I mean, 1015 is our break time, I think, right? Well, let's go till 1015 then. So, like I said, um, right now we've only just, or for now, we've only discussed kernels. We have a special subclass for kernels that involve time derivatives called time kernels. And they give you all the functionality the normal kernel would, but you have two additional member variables that are very, very important, which is the time derivative of the variable you're acting on and the derivative of that with respect to just your variable. Just like we discussed yesterday with standard kernel-based classes, you have the normal compute QP residual, pre-compute QP residual, and um, why do we have two pre-compute computers? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Sorry, one moment. I need to remind myself what we're trying to actually get across here. <laughs> so as we discussed yesterday, um, pre-compute QP residual in its general sense is used as an optimization for doing some additional work before computing the residual. Now, there are special cases with AD where we make additional um, optimizations where we just put constants that multiply common things in the AD kernels. And this, for example, is why in the AD diffusion kernel like we had yesterday and earlier, how instead of overriding compute QP residual, we override pre-compute QP residual and add in additional factors that multiply through. And that is done in the same way with time kernels. If there's any questions on that, let me know. It's kind of a an odd topic. Um, the optimizations are reasonably important, and most of our base objects now in Moose for simple physics include these optimizations, so it's important to understand how they work. Let's see. Mm, let's see how long this is. Yeah, we can do this quickly then. Okay, 
So you're running a transient problem. Well, you need to also know how to integrate in time. And there's various different methods, which are very common, by which we integrate in time. So of course, in standard moose fashion, or fashion, we have a system for that. It's called the time integrator system. It's customizable, but we also implement the very common time integrators for you that are available in Moose. <clears throat> now, we have shortcut syntax within the executioner block where you can specify a scheme, and that is a time integration scheme. Now, we have the standard time integration schemes that you normally would see in Finite Element, plus the Euler, BDF2, Crank, Nicholson, Dirk, Numark Beta, all depending on what order of accuracy you're looking for in time. Um, the default is imp implicit Euler. Now, of course, if you need more time accuracy, feel free to change around the scheme as needed. The important note here is that we have these schemes available for you natively in Moose by simply changing the scheme equals parameter. Now, if you don't specify scheme equals, you can also customize your time integrator even more. If you have a custom integrator that requires additional parameters, additional factors, couples to things, and so on. So instead of specifying scheme equals, you could create a sub block called time integrator with an executioner, which will build the specific type of time integrator that you want, where you can insert the custom parameters for it. For example, this is a new mark beta time integrator with the parameters beta and gamma set to the given values. Um, yeah, I can show us a problem. So as a sanity check, we were talking earlier about how, how do we actually validate things instead of just comparing results? Well, all of those time integration schemes have expected convergence rates. So we're going to consider the simple test problem that we have listed here. We have an exact solution with, a, with time dependence in it. And with that, because we know the solution, we can actually inspect the convergence criteria for each of the time integration schemes. Implicit Euler is first order convergent, so on or second, and so on. I don't think there's anything much to say here, is there? <laughs> the important takeaway here, of course, is that you should test the schemes that are really well understood for convergence. And this is our proof to you that our schemes work. So as a reminder of where we are right now, as we started with steady state heat conduction, and now we're running a transient problem. Um, with a transient problem, you need a transient executioner to actually step in time. You need a time integrator to integrate in time. And you need a time stepper to tell you what kind of time steps to make. Um, now, as we described earlier, there is a shortcut syntax to the executioner block where you can provide simple things like DT equals or start time equals or end time equals. But in reality, most problems that are cool and fun don't have constant time stepping. Um, you could have some kind of really slow transient and then halfway through the problem, you do something crazy that requires that you decrease the time step size or you have some kind of physics that are super non-convergent with a large time step. Um, so with that, we need some flexibility to how we step forward in time for transient problems. And with that comes another Moose system, the time stepper system. So we have an example here, just like how we had a time integrator sub block within the executioner block, we can have a time stepper block or a time steppers block, which we'll describe in a second. <clears throat> now, in this case, we have what we call iteration adaptive DT as a time stepper. So what iteration adaptive DT does is it'll actually change around your time step to try to get you to have a certain number of iterations um, in your solve. So with, with this specific case, we're going to start with a time step size of one. Optimally, we want to make 10 iterations. Now, in standard Moose fashion, you can create your own time stepper objects. And all that you need to do to get them to work is override the method called compute DT, which given some state in the system will return a time step that size. 
we have a few built in time steppers and moose, um, and these are also composable, so you can use them together, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, constant DT, which is just a constant time step, which is the default time stepper that gets created for you if you just provide a DT equals. Solution time adaptive DT, which if I remember correctly, computes an error estimate. You guys remember? It you you provide an estimate to your solution error, and it will try to change the time step size to keep that at a reasonable. Or, or no, it'll compute the difference in solution. Yeah, right. Difference in solution, I think. It'll it'll. What, what yeah? What is? Oh, that's right. OK, yeah, I'm sorry. Solution time is physical time. Yeah, don't don't use that. We're going to take that off the slide. <laughs> iteration adaptive is the one that I described previously where you try to kind of hone in on a number of iterations. Function DT can take an arbitrary function in Moose. Uh, Casey described the function systems yesterday. Postprocessor DT can take the value from a postprocessor. And of course, we haven't talked about postprocessors yet, but they are discrete scalar values that are computed by some means and time sequence separ, which is a sequence of times. Um, like we said, or like I said earlier, iteration adaptive DT will grow or shrink the time step size based on the number of iterations you're making. Time sequence stepper, you can provide a series of time points um, and take take time points based on your sequence. And if you have failures, the time step is cut in half and an additional time step is added. This is a new feature that we've been working on that got implemented a few weeks ago. Um, instead of making one massive time stepper that contains all of your different criteria, criteria in it, um, you can compose time steppers together. So in this case, we are composing a constant time step of 0.2 and a time sequence step as listed. listed um, forget. Yeah, so as, as I described previously and immediately forgot, um, the way time sequence stepper works is that it's required to hit those steps. And if it fails in the middle of them, it'll just add an additional time step at the halfway point until you converge. So by composing time steppers together, at every time step by default, we will take the minimum of all of the time steps that are chosen by your time steppers. So with that, we'll have a simple question here. Um, what steps will be taken up until, yeah, starting at time equals zero? What's the first time step that'll be taken? 0 0.2, and then after that, Yep, and then after 0 0.4? Yep, exactly. And then what about between 0 0.5 and 1? Yes, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, 1. Those are the times that it will hit, not the time step sizes. Yes. <laughs> OK, so at this point now, we kind of have an idea of how to compose a transient problem. Time integration, time stepping, and then actually defining the transient problem that will push forward the problem in time. So now we return back to our, our original problem, now that we kind of understand all the pieces that you need to include in your Moose input file to produce a transient heat conduction problem. Now, as we said earlier, um, the time derivative term that's multiplied by C is already available to you in Moose as the 80 heat conduction time derivative object. <clears throat> So really quick, we'll go ahead and take a look at that object, even though you don't actually need to know how this works. It's a good practice, again, as to how we compose objects in Moose. So 80 heat conduction time derivative de derives from 80 time derivative. Similarly to how we overrode pre-compute QP residual in the AD heat conduction object, we do the same thing with 80 with, with the time derivative object. And now, of course, we need some material properties in there as well. 
So we're going to store an AD material property for the specific heat and one for the density to compute C. On to the source file. <clears throat> of course, we're going to take all of the parameters from AD time derivative, things like variable, block, and so on. And we're going to add in two parameters for material property names for the specific heat and the density. The constructor of the object. The only additional data that we need as member variables are the two material properties. And in the actual compute stage of the kernel, we're going to multiply by the two material properties that form C. Hopefully at this point, you have a general idea of how it gets easier and easier in time once you understand Moose to build on other objects and use the framework that we have available for you by simply overriding methods in C++. OK. Now for our input file. We have all the objects. At this point, we haven't written any code. We've looked at code for the sake of understanding, but we actually haven't written anything for this problem to work. We made one change to the variables block. Moose also has an initial condition system, which can provide initial conditions to your variables, because of course, with a time dependent problem, you need an initial state. Now, there's a shortcut syntax for variables, for transient variables, where you can specify initial condition equals to set a constant value for that variable as an initial condition. So we're going to start at 300. Um, arbitrary units, we're going to assume it's Kelvin. OK, for our kernels. So we had a heat conduction kernel previously. In order to make it this a transient problem, we need to add in the time derivative. And we're adding in the AD heat conduction time derivative object that we discussed previously. The boundary conditions have not changed. Mind you, this is a weirdly physical problem. It's not really physical, but um, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just trust in the state. <laughs> One more thing, we have two more material properties that we need. The AD heat conduction time derivative in order to use um, for the value of C, we now also need a specific heat and the density. And again, the one part that I don't like about how we do this is that we use the defaults for the material property names for this heat conduction time derivative kernel. But, we expect a material for the name with the name of specific heat and a material with the name of density for those material properties. So for our generic constant material, which again is the material with a constant value across the entire domain, we're going to set the specific heat and the density as prescribed in the material properties at the beginning of the problem statement. Lastly, we're not running this problem anymore, so we change the executioners per type to transient. And we're going to run 10 steps with the defaults, um, which I think the default time step is like the size of one or something, but you can see it if you go look, look in the transient executioner documentation. Okay, we're running the input file. I am going to go run this in real time and open it up. We're going to run Darcy Theromac up, dash I. We're going to run step 5B transient. OK, our outputs changed a little. I'm going to scroll up and then not bounce around so we don't do a whole lot here. So at time step 0, we start. Now we step forward in time with a time step of 1. We're now at time 1 and time index of 1. We make a solve. We continue on. It's the same time step of 1 because we're using a constant time step. We're now at time two at time index of two. And all the way on until we reach 10 time steps, which we got from num steps equals 10. Still DT of one because it's a constant time step and we're at time index of 10. Now I'm going to go ahead and open that output file in pair of you. Ah, hold on. I'm going to tell this. Open it fresh. <clears throat> All right. 
show our mesh too. So we prescribe an initial condition of 300. If you recall, we have a, um, oh yeah, that awful thing. <laughs> if you recall, we're doing something really, really, really weird where we prescribe a boundary condition of 350 on the left and of 300 on the right. So we're going from a constant 300 everywhere to immediately requiring, as soon as we solve anything, a value of 350 on the left. Which is OK, I guess. The good news is <laughs> that we see 350 on the left, and we see 300 on the right. I didn't mean to skip all the way. Let's go to time step one. Right, so. As we step forward in time, we're going to see this front move. And so on, right? Now it's a little more obvious probably if we do a, uh, if we do a line. Right, so. Now the oddity that I was talking about. We had a value of 300 and then right at time step one, it just shoots up. That's fine. Could be worse. So we see the value of 300 on the left and 300 and 300, 350 on the left and 300 on the right. And as we step forward in time, we'll see that front. As we slowly go to the steady state solution, which is the linear solution that we would expect. Any questions? Yes. The question was, what happens if you add a transient execution without transient physics? If you don't actually add a time kernel, Moose will tell you that we're not going to solve it because there's no time kernel. There's actually an error in that. So if you were to have, let me let me make sure that's the case as a sanity check. But the question again was, what if you don't have transient physics, but you have a transient executioner? I thought that we yelled at you. We don't. Oh, without a transient executioner. OK, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, because a lot of people actually hack away things with using fake time in order to iterate. I forget this. Yeah, so you can actually, I was wrong. As a reminder, what happens if you, the question was, what happens if you have a transient execution and no transient physics? Um, Moose will still work. It'll converge to steady state. Right? Yeah, but it'll converge to steady state, exactly. But you could have you could have things that are still, your solution could still be time dependent if you don't have it if you don't have the steady state criteria for material properties or other things in your problem, right? Yeah, or time dependent boundary condition or, yeah, exactly. So there's quite a bit that's in there. Um, and people will actually use this a lot for iterating to steady state for different things. Or you can use steady state time detection. Yes, and it might not converge because your initial condition could be so bad that it just doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're so converged in the previous time step that um, your criteria is no longer met for the next time step. Um, OK, so we're going to instead of that really awful like non physical condition we had, we're going to impose what we call the no BC boundary condition from the reference listed here on the exit of the pipe. So there's a boundary term that we're going to compute implicitly rather than being replaced with a known value. Okay, so no BC boundary condition. So we need to implement a new boundary condition in Moose. So you kind of have an idea of how boundary conditions work so far because we've used a lot of Dirichlet boundary conditions that prescribe values on a boundary. Now, in a lot of physics, prescribed conditions like that aren't don't make sense. You don't know what the value is. You have some other condition that you're trying to impose. So with that, we have two different boundary condition types. We have nodal boundary condition types and integrated boundary condition types. Nodal boundary condition types are Dirichlet like boundary conditions where values are prescribed at nodes. <laughs> Integrated boundary conditions are boundary conditions where you need to integrate across the surface. And this will also work on internal sides if you just describe side sets within a mesh. That's a little 
past the point of this training, but it is possible. Now, integrated boundary conditions, as their names would suggest, um, derive from the AD integrated BC and the integrated BC base classes in Moose. Now, similarly to kernels, to implement a boundary condition, you override the compute QP residual method. You have the standard member variables that you would expect for the most part, as you would see in a kernel, except your integration is now being performed on a surface. And with that, you need information like the outward normal vector on the surface. And you also have access to the side that you're on um, within an element, which can give you additional information as you need. Now, non-integrated boundary conditions, like the ones that we've used so far, like Dearsley boundary conditions, um, set the residual directly at a node. And in this case, you would derive from AD nodal BC or nodal BC. Now, there is one oddity here in that you still override compute QP residual, but instead of it being at a QP, you are actually acting at a node. And that is just for consistency, even though it's a little odd. Now, at nodes, you have a little bit less information by default. Um, you don't have things like gradients because in finite element world, things like gradients are typically not as well defined at nodes. The way that we specify a Dirichlet boundary condition is listed here on the surface at a node. That's right. Okay. So, how do we actually define these boundary conditions? Well, there's one additional base object in here that simplifies our life as API developers or the Dearsley boundary condition itself that you will drive for later on if you want to set a value in a in a special sense. Um, <clears throat> we have a method called compute QP value instead of compute QP residual. Because we are setting the residual for you, the residual for this. Is described here, so we just want the value G1 from you. And then we're going to set the residual for your result as negative G1. Which is why in Dearsley boundary conditions, you simply have a compute QP value method instead of compute QP residual. And the default Dearsley boundary condition simply returns the value that the user gives an input via the value parameter. Now, integrated boundary conditions are a little different because you because you actually have an integration to perform. On an external face or on an internal face, if. You want to and your physics make it appropriate to do so. Now, here's an example that I wanted to show yesterday back into some C++ templating madness. This is the first first class that we've shown you guys that is templated. So it's templated on a parameter of type bool that we call is AD. And as the name would suggest, that specifies whether or not this is an AD object. Because in Moose, we actually instantiate or create a, a Neumann BC and an AD Neumann BC. Now they're different in the fact that some of that they act on some of the things act on. I'm sorry, an AD object acts, acts on AD variables, and a non-AD object does not. Depending on how you have your problem set up, and whether or not your variable supports AD, will suggest or will require you to use an AD or a non-AD object that acts on said variable. Now, for the sake of code duplication, we template these classes which means that this is a template or a structure for generating a class. Now, how we can see where this template actually matters 
is if we go look for the variable is AD within the class. So what's different between an AD and a non-AD object? Well, AD objects return AD values and non-AD do not. So the compute QP residual method, the return type is dependent on whether or not it is AD. Which is why you see is underscore AD in the return type of compute QP residual. Now what generic real is, is it's a helper. Whether or not the value of is AD is true or false. If you do generic real true, which means yes, it is AD. This will actually become an AD real. If you do generic real false, you'll get just a real variable. And what this means is that we have the same general setup, but the return type of the residual evaluation is dependent on whether or not we create the class as AD. Now, using generic integrated BC members is something that is well beyond the scope of this training that you do not need to worry about. Now, what is important is the type def down here at the bottom. So what type def does in C++ is you have type def, and then after that, the name of some type, and then after that, what you want to alias that type as, which means that for Neumann BC temple false, which is instantiating this class not as AD, I want to create or alias it as Neumann BC. Now for the same case with is AD equals true, I want to alias that as AD Neumann BC. Any questions here? Nope, this templating still exists. The question was, I thought we did away with this. No, we didn't. <laughs> this is, we have, you'll actually see quite a few objects like this that are like the AD or the, the object name. So in this case, Norman BC and then temple. And that in Moose sense is typically an object that can be instantiated as true or false with or without AD. Question. So an AD real type is simply a real with a vector of derivatives on it. So the question was, what is the difference between an AD real and a real? Which we actually haven't talked about that much yet, but it really is a real value with a ton of derivative information on it. So based on how many different um, partial derivatives that you would have in your system, each one of those partial derivatives is an entry in the AD real type that carries derivative information so that when you multiply through, you propagate all of your derivatives. So it's a really fat real that contains a lot of information. And if you ever run into issues in Moose about AD running out of AD size, um, that corresponds directly to how big that derivative vector is. If you have a lot of different things that have partial derivatives, you could have a really, really big um, AD real. Any other questions on templating madness? Okay. <clears throat> so if we go to the source file, the source file is also templated. Um, the valid parameters object, um, depending on whether or not you have AD or not, the thing that we derive from, which is generic integrated BC, needs to also know whether or not it is AD. <clears throat> and even more interesting is the compute QP residual method, which again returns a type of generic real templated on is AD or not. Now, that value, I'm trying to remember, is it? <clears throat> That value is just a real value in all of these cases, which as the user input is just a real value as well. It does not contain any derivative information because that value doesn't have a derivative. 
Lastly, we have periodic boundary conditions, which are kind of a special case, but we do support them in Moose. They're useful for um, for representing somewhat fake infinite systems or infinite domain systems and also conserving specific quantities. What's important to note is that we have periodic boundary conditions. They do work in the general Moose realm of all the dimensions with mesh adaptivity on certain variables and so on. So at this point, we know what a boundary condition is. Um, we know the different types of boundary conditions in Moose, and we know how to implement them as a user if we need to specify our own boundary condition. So returning to our other problem of implementing the outflow boundary condition, or we call the no BC boundary condition from the reference that we have here, we need to implement this boundary term. Now, we probably haven't seen this before, but we have an interesting term here where we have a dot with a normal. Well, if you remember, we have an underscore normals uh, member variable and boundary conditions to which we can obtain that normal. Now, everything else is standard moose sense, and that is the temperature term, the material property. Those are all computed and obtained just as you would in a kernel. The big difference here is that we have this dot product with the normal. And those normals are available in, in integrated boundary conditions. So let's implement this. We're implementing an integrated boundary condition because we want to integrate along the boundary. We're going to do it with AD. So we're going to create a new object called heat conduction and outflow that derives from heat conduct from AD integrated BC. We have the standard public methods. We need a way to construct the object with the user's parameters, and we need a way to define the parameters. Just as we would override compute QP residual or pre-compute QP residual in a kernel, we're going to override compute QP residual in this kernel to add in our additional terms. And we need a thermal conductivity, so we're going to also store off a material property. Now in the source file, Oh no, this is wrong. Hmm. Can anyone spot the bug here? <laughs> We're missing information. We're getting a material property. <laughs> so all of the getters and moves, so like getting a variable or getting a user object or getting a material, the methods by which the methods that we call for that, it's usually get something. Now those get something methods, they take the thing that you provide, in this case, thermal conductivity, they take that as a parameter name, which means that in this case, we want to go query the parameter called thermal conductivity for a material property name. Do we not? Do we not have a get material property by name? Oh, that's really bad then. Okay. I'm gonna, we I'm do gonna have a get material property by name. So then what does that do? What does what do? What does get material property by name do? It assumes. It doesn't do the same it, thing? It assumes that you've already got the value of the parameter and yeah you... but that's the thing is that get this get call that we have here should be calling getting a parameter called thermal conductivity yeah. well then i don't know the difference between get 80 material property and get 80 material property by name the form the former takes the parameter name and the latter takes the parameter value yeah can someone just check that for me before i start digging myself into a hole <laughs> Yeah, so my concern here, of course, is that what I'm thinking is that get 80 material property queries an input parameter called thermal conductivity for a material property name and then gets you the material property with that name. 
which is why I'm a little confused here. I'm going to continue on until someone confirms well, or denies. What'll happen is that if there's no, so in this case, there is no parameter named thermal conductivity. So it will just search for oh, material gosh. properties named oh, thermal conductivity. Yay. Okay. So some behind the scenes tomfoolery is going on here. That's not what all works. Then why do we still have by name? Yeah, I guess that means so we have git by name, so it'll really error if that doesn't exist. Oh, great. People people shouldn't people generally just shouldn't be using by name. Yeah, yeah. Because this handles both cases. Yeah. Yeah, I confused everyone. So what I was trying to get at here is that a lot of the getters in Moose, if you call git something and then provide a name. It will query the input parameters for a parameter with that name to get what the user input that parameter as. Which means my thought here was we forgot to add a parameter called thermal conductivity to valid params. Now, while I don't agree with this behavior, that's hence my confusion and my confusing all of you. While I don't agree with that behavior, if in this case a parameter with the name of thermal conductivity is not found, that is, there is no thermal underscore conductivity equals for this object when you define an in input, it will just get a material property with that exact name of thermal underscore conductivity. Which, why I don't like that is because if this is not well documented, you can't tell from documentation what the parameter is that it's pulling. But that's for another day. I have disagreement with me in the crowd, but I'm just going to continue on. <laughs> so act. <laughs> OK, OK. OK, OK. Material property names are meant to be internal for the majority of cases. Yeah, yeah. It already has. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to continue on because I feel like I've stepped on toes and I've confused everyone as is. So <laughs> we still need to actually do the integration in our boundary condition, whether or not we have a valid thermal conductivity. So we're going to override compute QP residual. Um, if we looked at our term, we have a thermal conductivity, a gradient, test function, and a dot with a normal. So if we go down to our compute QP residual method, we have the terms we would expect, all evaluated at the quadrature points. Something important to note here is that normals can depend on quadrature points if you have curved elements. Now, if you have standard linear elements, you just have flat faces everywhere, and you sample quadrature points along a fat face, flat face, and the normal is the same everywhere. But if you have a curve, it's different. So all that we're changing now is that we're going to use a different boundary condition, which we've just built called heat conduction outflow. So our input file from the weird case of two Dirichlet boundary conditions will change by instead imposing that outflow condition on the right. Let's go run this. Hopefully it'll look a little bit less non-physical or a little bit more physical, sorry. Step 5C. Outflow.i. Yep, yep. Okay, same problem, same Tim sign steps, very different bounding condition. Question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, why would you use an 80 generic material? Um, the big thing is that you want to be able to support AD in the future. If you have AD everywhere on all of your objects, if you improve your materials, add extra content, add in derivatives, add in extra dependencies, if all of your objects are already using AD, the change required to add in properties that then depend on other things and will propagate derivatives is simply just using a different material property. So if your conductivity suddenly depends on something else, which is totally valid, can easily depend on temperature, which it will later on. Um, if 
if that's the case, the fact that you have objects, namely kernels that support AD, mean that by changing the thermal conductivity material properties somewhere else, you natively get all of the additional capabilities that come with AD. Which is why in general, we just tell people that they should start with AD. And if you have an issue with performance, we can address that later. Sorry, I probably it's awful sounds. Oh, Dotty. Oh. Actually, I might as well pop these together. Why not? Actually, no, I'm not going to pretend like I know how to use pair of you in front of everyone. We're going to not do that. I kind of can, but I'm going to look like a fool doing it. So we're just going to open up a new thing. OK. Temperature. Now we have the same 300 rupee initial condition. Jump to time step one. And as you can see, now that we're not prescribing something on the right side and we're using a natural outflow condition that more mimics reality, our front doesn't look as unrealistic. I'm going to go to the line plot. So now we see, if we're starting with a condition of 350 on the right, we see a little bit more of a natural conduction problem propagate in time. So again, natural outflow condition, prescribed condition on the left. Oh yeah, I mean, of course, have a nice video, but I prefer line plots for these. <laughs> 